Attack on Titan, the final season, part three, gets a one hour premiere. Chinese Dongwa could surpass Japanese anime in terms of popularity. Michael B. Jordan announces a Creed anime and gives his beginner anime recommendations. Oshinoko's theme song, Idol, is so fire. Hello and welcome to all my fellow weaves, otakus, imagination connoisseurs, and everyone a part of the post geek singularity. Good to see you. You look nice. Welcome to the Otaku Experience. I'm your host, Israel King. Did you do something new with your hair? Or as most people know me, King Tanik. I think it's safe to say that this is going to be the anime of the year. In 20 30 years, everybody's going to be indoctrinated in like the manga and anime agenda. I'm in love with Princess Peach. Marry me. <laughs> wow. What the heck, Studio Ghibli? Or uh, Ghibli, as I've been told, but I've been saying Ghibli my entire life. Here's how the Otago experience works if this is your first time watching movies, light novels, manga, video games. You don't want to hear about any of this. The current goings on in the anime and manga industry, anime like Wonder Egg Priority, Death Note, Naruto. I know it. You know it. Near Automata, Licorice Recoil, Bleed. Eminence in Shadow, Demon Slayer, I love it, you love it, Speak Shonen, things like Spy Family, things like Chainsaw Man, yeah? Yeah, that is a lot to cover. Now, let's go! Oh my god. The AI has risen among us! Ah, oh, Cupid's such a good song. That dude is ripped! Wow. Oh my gosh. I. Wowie, wow, what? What? I don't know if we can show this, bro. <laughs> dude! Oh, this is so bad. Cinema, bro. It's great. Typical weeps. Love it. I have focus pills here. And my throat hurts. What? Uh, I only take these when my ADHD is skyrocketing. Dude, could you imagine the fights? I'm not editing this out. Anime and Lord of the Rings. Sorry. Disney has a completed Alien vs. Predator anime. Ba ba ba. I think this sounds. Awesome. I really want to see this. Oh, dude, it's gonna be so awesome. Fun fact, guys, keep that in mind. If you don't know what that means, when an anime season airs, they air in what are called cores. And Sundere is like that girl in an anime who's like super mean to you, and in a lot of anime will like hit and abuse the protagonist, but it's because she likes him. And then she'll be like, yo, why aren't you into me? And it's like, gee, I wonder why. Maybe because you hit me. I love Sundere's, to be honest with you. I they're my favorite. What the heck? Fascinating. It's ridiculous. <gasps> that is such a cool name. Oh no! What is wrong with my name? What the heck? Oh no! How did they do this? Because we're weebs. We're all single. Oh my gosh. We're all single, okay? It, 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 it's, it's inherently in our DNA. Ah, the tears. This is just insanity. Let me calm down. Look at this. Let's go! Wow! <laughs> Shows fire. Oh yeah. I'm not calling you stupid. Woo. I'm calling us. Mmm. <laughs> Come on, dude. Okay. <laughs> I've never seen this anime that you're talking about. This turned into a rant. I said it wouldn't. This trounces the MCU, bro. It'll be interesting to see if they like reference that and then we could be the few people who were like, I get that reference. Whereas the rest of the theater is like, what are they talking about? And it's like, bro, we read that manga. We talked about it on the Otaku Experience. Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood Podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it? Especially if you love the movies. Observations with Robert Meyer I, I've heard it said before, like, it was a very smart man named uh, Robert Meyer Burnett who said, the currency of our current age is authenticity. And it's so true.
Imagination Connoisseurs, Incorporated and Unlimited, in association with Road to Perdition writer Max Allen Collins, presents True Noir, the Nathan Heller Casebooks, an audio drama coming soon, brought to you by this channel, starring Captain Liam Shaw from Picard Season 3, Todd Stashwick, as the titular detective Nathan Heller. Coming soon to a crowdfunding campaign near you. Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course, the yet undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right. Me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm Rob casting at you from the Rob Observatory. This is Rob Observations, episode 915. I know everyone's like, what's with the long intro, Rob? Well, I'll tell you what it was for. Uh, I played the trailer for the Otaku Experience as a thank you uh, to Israel King, King Tannic himself, who brings us great programming, uh, delving into the world of anime every week. And normally I don't play this intro because it's a trailer. You can see it on the channel. But as a thank you for this last episode of Rob Observations of 2023 i wanted to thank him for all the great work he does i wanted to thank everybody on this channel that is on this channel lael rockwell uh, i wanted to thank julian mushkin i wanted to thank darth plato uh the people that i'm very fortunate uh to know and who have streamed on this leanna leanna creole uh who've been on this channel this year uh heartfelt thanks to all of you bringing us great content and um we'll continue that excuse me, continue that into the new year. And it's wild that the year is over, but a profound thanks mostly to all of you who are still with me here on this channel through thick and thin. I very much appreciate that. New subscribers, new members. We try and have a lot of fun on this channel. I think this is one of the most fun channels on YouTube, quite frankly. And by the way, I know some of you might be wondering if I'm going to bring randos on tonight. I think we might have to. And for those of you who don't know what that is, stay tuned and find out. Um, but anyway, you know, I, I, it's been a weird year. Uh, obviously, we've had a lot of ups, ups and downs cinematically on TV and things. But I think for the most part, I was actually surprised at some of the great films we got this year, whether it was Oppenheimer, whether it was Barbie, whether it was Past Lives, whether it was Saltburn. Uh, there was a lot of really great stuff. Godzilla Minus One. There was a lot of, I mean, something for everybody, really. Maestro. A uh, lot of really interesting stuff. Great TV for all mankind continues. I, I still love it. Reacher season two, killing it. Every episode's been a banger. I loved episode five. I watched it last night. Um, just a lot of great TV. Who would have thought Squid Game the competition would have been a series that would have been worth watching? I quite enjoyed that. Uh, there's all different kinds of programming from around the world, movies from around the world that we're seeing, which is amazing. Um I love that. Uh, it's it's some terrific stuff. We're really getting. Uh, Eric Benson sends in a twenty dollars super sticker. Man, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, everyone's like randos. We're gonna bring in some randos tonight. I even have a little. You know, these were on sale. Um, I actually have to say these premixed cocktails. I'm not a premixed cocktail guy. You know, they always have too much sugar and not enough booze. These Knob Creek Old Fashions are pretty damn good, and they were on sale tonight, or actually yesterday. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Five bucks. That's pretty hearty for a drink. So I am having an alcoholic beverage. I've definitely cut down on the drunken ramblings at night on this channel. I was looking like a drunken buffoon a lot of the time, which, you know, sometimes I don't have to be drunk to look like a buffoon. Sometimes I am a drunken buffoon. But at least it's all part of the entertainment, and it's in the spirit of what this channel means. And hopefully we'll bring you fun and frolic uh, coming into the coming new year, which, believe it or not, it's going to be crazy. It's an election year. I'm optimistic about it. Mm. But that doesn't mean I'm still not going to think about Star Trek and comic book movies and Doctor Who and Marvel and Warner Brothers and all of our fucked franchises and all that stuff. And I'll tell you something. I... Um, I, uh, there was an article today published in Variety. You know how I love my articles, but I thought it was pretty great. Owen Gleiberman, who I've been reading since the Entertainment Weekly days, I think he's a really a pretty good critic, wrote an article. And look, 
I get it. It's another clickbait article. People want it. You know, he's he's a. It's about comic book movies. But now here's the thing, and I just before I've said this before on the show, I'm going to say it again. I would like to preface this by saying, look, when Martin Scorsese or Francis Coppola or any of these venerable filmmakers that we've had around Ridley Scott, it's not that they're attacking the fact that there are comic book movies being made. There's, I think there's some quite good comic book movies being made, and we all know what, what they are. The problem is that these guys, what, what they are railing against, it's almost metaphoric. Uh, you have to look at it as metaphor. Studio filmmaking has completely changed. I did a, a video piece on it. Uh, Jack, my editor, cut it. Uh, it's a great piece. You can see it right on the channel about IP and how studio filmmaking has changed. The film business over the last 25 years has become a global business. For the most part, before that, uh, studios were making movies mostly for the domestic market. As the movies went global, um, suddenly studios found themselves making movies for a global market because movies were increasingly making more money in foreign markets than they were domestically. Look at the James Bond franchise, for instance. Makes a lot more money around the world than it does domestically. A lot of franchises like the Fast and the Furious franchise make a lot more money overseas than they do here. So the business of Hollywood entirely shifted. Hollywood now, hey, you used to make a movie like, as I said in my article with a video, Hunt for Red October, a great literary adaptation of a very famous Tom Clancy book that was a huge bestseller. They make the adaptation for $30 million. John McTiernan coming off of Die Hard makes Hunt for Red October powerhouse movie great movie became a franchise planted its flag and then of course we have multiple jack ryan's we have jack ryan on tv we have jack ryan in the movies you had alec baldwin play jack ryan you had harrison ford play jack ryan you had uh, uh chris pine play jack ryan and john krasinski play jack ryan jack ryan all because of hunt for red october movie would never get made today uh, by studio wouldn't get made um even though i think it would travel globally, the studios have gotten out of the business of making uh, adult-oriented thrillers that are reasonably intelligent, and also the studios would release raunchy comedies, they would release dramas, they would release rom-coms, they would release comedies themselves. All of that has gone away. And now studios are making giant tentpole properties for the global marketplace. That is what the filmmakers of yore are complaining about. We used to have a very diverse, as Chris Gore calls it, a media diet. The studios in one year would produce all these different kinds of films, and a lot of them had success. It didn't matter what genre something was. You know, you could get a When Harry Met Sally, you know, or you could get a There's Something About Mary. Remember those days? There's Something About Mary where, you know, Cameron Diaz famously, he was in the ad campaign, ends up getting semen in her hair and uses it as hair gel. Those days are over, which is too bad. All of that's moved on to streaming or Netflix or Hallmark or wherever. <laughs> I'm not saying Hallmark would necessarily do that, but the world has changed. Uh, the economics have changed. The studios are now run by uh, multinational corporations, and corporations have their own baggage and their own ways of doing things. And Wall Street expects certain amounts of money and um, thing. It, it's the whole business is, is different. What our filmmakers are lamenting is the fact that we used to get a wide variety of films that allowed filmmakers of all kinds to work in different genres, to make passion projects, because the risk wasn't nearly as big as it is now. And, you know, it's hard when sometimes you'll get uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh will be allowed to make a Belfast, which is amazing. Or you'll get Alfonso Cuaron doing uh, Roma or something. And it, um, or Inaratu, you know, will do a, a Revenant or something like that. Um, he did the Revenant, right? I'm getting those right, aren't I? Uh, but, but nowadays, I mean, the really interesting movies are made by mini majors. Uh, A24 is always putting out bangers. Uh, one of my favorite movies this year was Past Lives. And I think that the problem is they're not making tons of money. Yeah, you can say A24 had a huge hit and everything everywhere all at once. And it made over a hundred million dollars, but it it wasn't a $100 million movie that made a billion dollars. Horror is still very vibrant. We had Talk to Me come out this year. Wonderful film. That was an example of 
you know, I've often said, I've gotten yelled at by people, audience members who got mad at me for asking, where are all the new filmmakers? We're carrying around 4K cameras in our pockets. Steven Soderbergh made Unsane and High Flying Bird on iPhones. Tangerine Dream, or Tangerine Dream, just Tangerine Dream was a movie that was made with iPhones. We have the technology to make, I mean, whether it's effects technology, whether it's uh, camera technology, problem is making feature films is still very, 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 very hard to do, especially do it well. And um, the filmmakers are lamenting the fact that the studios just aren't interested in making the kind of diverse films that used to, used to get made. And it's unfortunate. So when they're railing against comic book movies, that's kind of what it is that they're railing against. It's not that comic book movies are terrible or they're not cinema. I know. I'm not, I'm not trying to make excuses for Marty. But when he says that, what he's saying is that cinema itself, the art form of cinema has become, it used to be the confluence of business and art. That's where, that's where cinema uh, lived. Eh, maybe not so much anymore. Now it's all business all the time. And the problem is the people that are controlling the business don't know how to make the art. If, if you want, that in, in, a, in, a, in a very simple way, that's everything wrong with Hollywood. The business people know fuck all about the art and they're trying to conduct only business forgetting that the business is only made when the art is good and they don't know how to do that they don't know how to make the films i mean it's really weird i've often said there are different kinds of hollywoods and there is there is the side of hollywood where there's the deal makers and the power brokers whether it's big producers agents managers lawyers those people are all over there, and they live in a, their own world. Seldom do they ever wind up on a set. Very few of them know how an actual movie is made. Then you have, and, and part of that, adjacent to that world, is actually the studios, the people that are greenlighting projects, the people that are distributing projects, the people that are finding the money for the projects. It's all kind of this same weird ecosystem, and that's one part of Hollywood. Then there's the people that actually have to make everything. And the people that have to make everything and the people that are over here, these two worlds, one is much bigger. It's almost like the the deal makers, power brokers, that's the earth. And the people that are actually are making the movies is the moon. And uh, never the two shall meet. And it's funny because business has been encroaching more and more and more on the making of movies. And that's when we see the death of franchises. And we've been seeing it happening over the last decade. It's been a slow a slow descent, but we're really seeing it now, especially with the comic book film, which brings me to today's article. I did post the link in the description, uh, but I wanted to get into it. So first of all, uh, some old guy in Hawaii sends in a super chat and says, is Mr. Servation in the house? I, I don't know. I, I don't think I'm Mr. Servation. Uh, I I hope not. I I don't know. But uh, how are you doing, man? Some old guy in Hawaii. I hope all is good. Uh, but here's an article, again, written by Owen Gleiberman today in uh, Variety that I thought was really interesting, and I wanted to share it. It was published around noon today. Why the fall of comic book movie culture is inevitable. See? He knows what's up. He knows it's Thanos. It's not just bad sequels, it's far simpler. The fantasy heroes have been strip-mined. It's by Owen Gleiberman. Comic book movie culture didn't just stumble this year. It face-planted, giving us one movie after another that fans didn't much care about and that the corporations backing these films took a disquieting loss on. And that's not how it was supposed to go. According to the gospel of 21st century Hollywood, the words comic book film and box office disappointment are not supposed to appear in the same sentence. When they do, not just once, but over and over and over again, the tea leaves are telling us something ominous and maybe definitive. Why in 2023 did this happen? The analysis uh, that has mostly been offered is simple. The movie companies served up mediocre superhero product. That's why they and we suffered. 
If it had just been one or two duds, the situation might have been explained away. But when you think back on Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and Shazam! Fury of the Gods and the Flash, and the Marvels, and Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, the pattern is clear. It's not simply a Marvel thing or a DC thing. The primal thrill and popularity of the comic book movie culture took a major hit, and it may be fading away. And yet... In the very drubbing these movies received at the box office and in the drumbeat snark of critical reviews, you might say there's hope. Comic book movie culture is, after all, only as good as the movies it gives us. And this was the year that the corporations, let's name names, Disney and Warner Brothers, failed. They made bad movies. What if they'd made good movies? The temptation to point a finger at the producers and executives and vilify them for their shoddy product has always been there. But now it's part of the new couch potato rebel culture. Critics on their reflective high horse mostly hate comic book movies, and more and more they have used their reviews of them to chastise the man. The fans would seem to be on the other side of the fence, but they have their own collective resentments and rebel fire. This year, the critics on the Comic-Con horde stood shoulder to shoulder, joining forces to look at the suits in the eye and say, You did this to us. We're bored as hell, and we're not going to take it anymore. That's, by the way, a reference to the movie Network, written by Patty Chayefsky, and you guys should all watch it. It becomes more true year after year. All that said, there's a larger reality about comic book movie culture that we need to tend that we tend to ignore. So let's state it outright. This shit is starting to fail because it is spent. Because it's been used up. I'm not just talking about Ant-Man or the Flash. I'm talking about the characters who got us in the door in the first place. The iconic larger than life ones. Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, Captain America, Thor, the Hulk, Black Panther. They were the mythic engine of this thing, and for a good long stretch, we didn't just want to see them on screen, we craved it. We needed them to be our gods again. And they were. Until they weren't. Memo to James Gunn, gods have a way of losing power when you stick them in reruns. The former U.S. President George W. Bush has long been used to illustrate the maxim, he was born on third base but thinks he hit a triple. Comic book movie culture is sort of like that. In the old days, in the first 90 years of Hollywood, up to and including the Lucas Spielberg revolution, movies were made the old-fashioned way. They were imagined, usually out of whole cloth. Sure, there were sequels and remakes. There were literary adaptations, highbrow and low, and Star Wars in 1977 riffed on the pulp sci-fi serials of the 40s and 50s. Though the vast majority of the audience for George Lucas' film had never seen those serials. So yes, Hollywood has always been a great big recycling machine. But there's a difference between imitation and IP. In 1978, when Hollywood gave us Superman the movie, it was pinging off a magical comic book character who sprung deep from the well of the American pop identity. Who didn't love Superman? And 11 years later, when Tim Burton's Batman premiered, producing the real sea change in the industry, I'll never forget the franchise frenzy that blanketed theaters the day that movie opened. It was like a deliverance. Unlike Star Wars, the Batman pedigree already occupied a place deep in the hearts of moviegoers. It spoke to comic book fans, to everyone who'd grown up with the late 60s TV series. Still the greatest thing ever, by the way. Not to mention the Dark Knight and the Killing Joke graphic novel generation. You could certainly say that Burton delivered in the gothic Wagnerian sweep, the palm buzzard demonization of Jack Nicholson's performance. (coughs) But in another sense, you could say that the 1989 Batman was born on home plate and everyone in Hollywood thought it was a home run. I sound like I'm shortchanging the awesome craftsmanship that goes into a movie like Batman or that has gone into so many of the Marvel and DC films. I am not. I have great respect for that craft, sometimes a reverence for it to the point that I've given a passing grade to more than my share of the comic book movies, like 
Captain America, or, or pardon me, Captain Marvel, and The Expendables that critics weren't supposed to like. Actually, The Expendables was an original series, something like The Losers was based on a comic. But here's the real point. The mass attachment to comic book movie culture has always been steeped in our connection to its most legendary characters. They were the pure-cut cocaine of all IP, and for a while that created a fantasy movie-going high. Here and there, the films may continue to do that. I adore The Batman, though tellingly, even though it was a great movie that became a huge hit, it seemed to have no cultural impact. And Spider-Man No Way Home, as much as I hated it, demonstrated, that's not me, that's Owen Gleiberman talking, as much as I hated it, demonstrated the sheer power that the character, the more of them on screen, the better. This year, the darkly bedazzling aesthetic and commercial triumph of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse pointed toward what may be the future of the superhero movie form, the mutating majesty of animation. And though I've been talking here about the old school characters, there's no doubt that the Deadpool films with their transcendent naughtiness and ultraviolence, are a franchise phenomenon all their own. Like most industry watchers, I'm anticipating that the third Deadpool film, when it's released this coming July, will be a commercial monster. So no, comic book movie culture isn't on life support yet. Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, was certainly right when he acknowledged, in an act of damage control, that the MCU had spread itself too thin, diluting its appeal with spin-off TV shows and a general sense of the multiverse is something that was becoming homework even for fans. Yet what's the solution? There's no real way to put the genie of too much product overkill back in the bottle. There's no real way, uh, because the only way to solve that problem is with more product. James Gunn, in his role as the executive guru, along with Peter Safran of DC Studios, now ready to wipe the slate clean and launch a new universe of DC storytelling, wants to fix it all with quality control. He's basically saying, fuck those Zack Snyder movies, my Superman will be boss. Yes, except that his Superman is going to feel like it's about the 12th Superman. The executives sitting in their Death Star suites we're full of excuses this year. The movie got rushed into production. We overextended ourselves. And no one can blame them for the personal and legal implosion of Jonathan Majors. At the same time, the critical rebel establishment, seeking more than ever for fans, saw blood in the water. And with it, the opportunity to help kill off comic book movie culture it has come to regard as an existential threat to cinema. But if that culture is now entering the early stages of its death throes... It will actually be for an honorable reason. Comic book movies were never going to die because an Ant-Man or Captain Marvel sequel was bad. The only reason they were going to die is that they have served their purpose. They made us dream of men and women in capes who could fly and who seemed indestructible because all of that made us feel good. But then it stopped making us feel so good because we had already been there and dreamed that. And it was time, perhaps, to get back to reality. Uh, Owen Gleiberman, good on you, sir. I put a link to that article in the description. You can find it on Variety. Uh, I thought it was a really good piece, making some good points. Now, look, there has been a lot of... I, I, I see two... Two things are happening in our in our culture. Obviously, we are dealing with the desire, and I don't think it's a bad desire, to allow those who went voiceless for so long to be more included, to have more diversity in product. I have no problem with this. Um, to me, the more diverse the voices, the more interesting the stories become. I want to hear stories told to me that I haven't heard before. Let voices that have never said anything speak for the first time. Tell me tales I don't know. I'll be, ve I'll be there for them. The problem is, the way I see it, is that 
you still have to learn how to become a great filmmaker. Uh, just because you're allowing somebody who um, might not have had the opportunities that someone else had to tell stories, it doesn't make them any more or less talented. And as I've always said, I said this the other day, um, the director Robin Armstrong, who made a movie called Pastime, a minor league baseball film that starred William Russ um, and uh, Glenn Plummer um, and Noble Willingham, Noble Willingham played a coach, said one of my favorite things I ever heard in a movie. He's telling this over-the-hill baseball player, he says, listen, it doesn't matter how good someone else is. It doesn't make you any better or any worse. And so we've had skyrocketing costs to make these films. And in Hollywood's desire to be more equitable, there are people that are helming these movies that aren't ready. They're not ready. And they don't have the talent they need to get them made. And that's not to say that they're not going to have the talent, but people are getting, uh, having opportunities. And I think a lot of what we saw in Marvel's phase, phases four and five suffered. Here's the thing. When Kevin Feige taps someone like James Gunn to make a superhero movie like Guardians of the Galaxy, he knows that James Gunn worked his way up, worked for Troma on movies like Tromeo and Juliet. I mean, then he worked in the studio system writing things like Scooby-Doo or a draft of Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. Hell, I worked with James Gunn on a movie I was a producer on uh, called The Specials that he wrote, he actually was in as Minute Man, that Craig Mazin, who co-created the TV version of The Last of Us, directed. This was almost 25 years ago. So James Gunn is a man that has worked his way up in the industry. And if you look at his low-budget movies like Super and Slither, he's worked with effects. He's worked in superhero superheroics. James Gunn also is a novelist. And if you can find it, I recommend seeking out a novel he wrote called The Toy Collector. James Gunn's a storyteller. And he's certainly been around and has learned and honed his craft. So when Kevin Feige says, you know what, this guy knows how to tell stories and I need somebody to bring that sensibility, his kind of, his kind of punk, anarchy, whimsical sensibility to the Guardians of the Galaxy. And he did that. James Gunn understood that. But also James Gunn had decades of experience in the movie business before he was able to do Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, I would say to you that James Gunn is a huge fan. James Gunn is not going to make Suicide Squad, but with Superman. I think James Gunn more is going to lean into, and I haven't spoken to him about this, I, I don't know. I would assume that what James Gunn would be doing with Superman is going more classical. And if I had to point to one Superman story, and again, I've said this before, I would look to a Superman for all seasons as the kind of tone, not that he's going to adapt it directly, but the kind of tone that he's going for. Now, we live in a world where someone like Colin Trevorrow makes a movie like Safety Not Guaranteed for a million bucks. Spielberg likes it, and suddenly his next movie is Jurassic World. And I think the problem with that, not that there's a problem with Colin Trevorrow, but learning how to direct a film like a low-budget indie film, like Safety Not Guaranteed, then helming a giant tentpole as your next movie? There's a skill set involved in there that isn't getting developed. And I think a lot of these filmmakers, they get, they get chewed up and spit out the next big thing. I mean, we don't have a system where, I mean, I, I would point to, I think, one of the great studio success stories of the last 20 years or 25 years now is someone like Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan makes a movie like Following. Low-budget indie, really interesting. If you haven't seen it, seek it out. Then he goes and he makes Memento. Writing, directing, learning his craft. Memento becomes a big crossover hit. Breaks out of the indie realm. Then Warner Brothers sees it and doesn't ask him to direct Batman yet. They give him a movie they probably wouldn't make today, which is the remake of Insomnia. Where you... Get Christopher Nolan gets to work for a studio, make a movie with big stars, 
and can see can he work within the studio system now now he has three films under his belt but he's not he hasn't had to have the weight of a 200 million dollar franchise on his head so then the studio now having three movies to look at and realize that this is a man that is character 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 and story that's when warner brothers feels comfortable enough because hey working with two stars is a big deal feels comfortable enough to say hey man the batman franchise it's moribund i mean last time we had a batman movie it was batman and robin and we all saw how that went so in warner brothers case they really didn't have anything to lose they know they have a real filmmaker in christopher nolan they know that he can deliver the goods and they're not going to give him 200 million bucks either i mean they're going to give him a substantial budget of course but they're going to see they don't just go all in on this one and they allow him and collaborating with his brother jonathan they make batman begins now maybe it's not somebody's cup of tea but um, I think that when I saw Batman, I appreciated the verisimilitude in the film. I appreciated the direction he took. And it was something that was uniquely Christopher Nolan. And, well, it worked. People liked Christian Bale in the role. You know, you've got Liam Neeson playing Raja Ghul. You've got all kinds of interesting cast. Gary Oldman. I mean, that film had a lot going on. And then what does Christopher Nolan do? He doesn't just run right out and make The Dark Knight. You know, he truly he epitomized the idea of one for us, one for them. He goes out and between his Batman movies makes like The Prestige, which is based on a book, literary adaptation. Then he makes The Dark Knight. Don't have to explain what happened there. After The Dark Knight, he makes Inception, a movie that he'd earned, passion project of his that he'd basically come up with on his own. The studio, I don't think, really understood what he was making, but he'd earned enough street cred to take a gamble. And I'll tell you something. I know for a fact the studio was, they didn't think they had a smash hit. There was a lot of people at the studio that were like, what the heck is this? What is going on here? The Warner Brothers marketing department was taking all the credit for the success of that movie for a while. But we all know that Inception made almost $900 million worldwide. It was a banger. It, it, up until this year, it was my favorite Christopher Nolan movie. But that's how the business used to work. The problem is there are very few filmmakers that are as talented as Christopher Nolan that are working. I'm not saying that there aren't, but he had the opportunity to work his way up through the ranks and show that he was talented and he earned his way. And, you know, I think the most telling films of his are not his franchise properties. Now, people don't, I don't think, give him enough credit, but when he was passionate about making Dunkirk at Warner Brothers, can you imagine? I mean, Dunkirk? They let him make that after The Dark Knight Rises, which I think also made a billion dollars. So at Warner Brothers, Christopher Nolan, I want to say that Prestige is Warner Brothers, so it's, he made Insomnia, he made Bat, the three Batman movies, he made um, The Prestige, he made uh, um, um, Inception, and then I is I think in, he left. He made did he make uh, because Spielberg was going to do Interstellar. I don't know if Interstellar is a Warner Brothers movie or not, but anyway, and then he comes back and, and makes Dunkirk at Warner Brothers, basically a World War II art film about a story that was really a British story of World War II. But because he made he took that incident and turned it into something, not only is it a great anti-war movie. But it's just a fascinating film. And the way he told the story and the way he played with time, it leapt beyond what it was, just a World War II story. And it became, I think, one of the great uh, films ever made about war, to be quite honest, in a very interesting fashion. And the studio, when they greenlit that movie, they're like, well, we hope it makes money. Even that movie made almost half a billion dollars. Dunkirk. I think it actually might have made more than $500 million, to be honest. This is how careers were used to be built in Hollywood. They don't do that anymore. Because the pressure, we got to make more money, the Wall Street way of doing business does not work in Hollywood. It is an unsustainable business model that is looking for growth. I mean, 
with streaming, there's only so many houses on planet Earth that can be streaming homes. And of those, how many get good internet all around the world? It is not an endless growth market. It's a market that will be eventually saturated fairly quickly too, by the way. And then what the streaming services should be looked upon as a, a sustainable business that gives you a bedrock with which to stabilize your ability to make great entertainment. You know you're getting so much money. It was a great thing for the studios. Wow, we're, we're getting a guaranteed income that we never used to get before because we know that every month we're going to make this much from our streaming service. But everybody expected that the streaming services were going to like... Brrr, but it didn't work out that way. And then there was this idea that, oh, we're going to go straight to streaming so we don't have to deal with these theater owners anymore and all those marketing dollars. The problem is... A great theatrical run adds value to your movie. So when it eventually goes on your streaming service, it already has cachet. Can you imagine if Warner Brothers just said, yeah, we're just going to put Disney or Disney. We're just going to put Barbie out on uh, uh, Max. Can you imagine? Barbie became their most successful movie ever. Now, and, and, and I'll tell you something. Who is Barbie made by? Yes, a woman director. But Greta Gerwig is a an auteur. And Noah Baumbach, who they wrote it together, they are consummate filmmakers. You know, and they jumped... The, the people that have learned their craft, they jump on board and make a franchise IP. But here's the thing. That, that movie could have gone any number of ways. Mostly a studio-bound film. So probably wasn't as expensive as a lot of franchise properties could be. A lot of really cool theatrical ways that Greta Gerwig used to tell that story. But by shooting probably mostly on the lot, I think they, I don't know if they shot on the Warner Brothers lot, but hey man, stage 16 on the Warner, on the Warner back lot, you go, that's where they built the, the double decker mall for Gremlins 2. That's where the storm sequence in Joe versus the volcano was. That's where they built the Gotham where the, in Batman Returns where the Christmas tree was. Stage 16, baby. The, the building that uh, that was half uh, um, invisible in Memoirs of Invisible Man was built on stage or in stage 16. So you have a much more controlled environment. And you can keep those costs down even at the studio level. But that's what, you know, Hollywood is not doing. And maybe there'll be more of a course correction, but they have to develop their talent. They can't just throw their talent from one indie movie. Sometimes it might work. Um, the director of RoboCop, I want to say Jose, I forget his name, um, the, the RoboCop remake, made made the elite, elite squad movies in his native Brazil, I think. Those are terrific films. He made two of them. And then he comes to America and makes RoboCop. I mean, what a thankless thing. You've made, you as an indie filmmaker in a foreign country have shown that you kick ass. And what ends up happening? They give you a RoboCop remake to do. That was never going to work. It was never going to work for him. Uh, and here was a vibrant voice that that needed something that, something unique that he could put his own imprintur on. And sure he did. Hey, my man Joe Kinnaman was RoboCop, so it was all good. But did it work well? I don't know. Not really. But again, it's because people are... are Hollywood needs to take risks again. Hollywood needs to develop. What are you going to do? Recycle IP again and again and again and again and again. No one ever made money following a trend in Hollywood. People make money when they take risks, when they hire Greta Gerwig to direct Barbie. And they keep that price down. They don't spend $200 million, although somebody's going to correct me and go, Rob, they did spend $200 million on Barbie. I don't think they did. But what they did was they allowed Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach, two indie filmmakers, to come and work and make an... I mean, what... I, Barbie's an interesting film. And then we also saw Christopher Nolan. Christopher Nolan's not like, oh, well, I need $250 million to make my Oppenheimer biopic. No, $100 million bucks. You know, that's what they reported it as. I mean, I haven't I haven't been so riveted about, uh, about a movie with dudes in, in rooms talking since my dinner with Andre. <laughs> I'm kidding. But uh, Oppenheimer was a masterpiece. I thought it was a masterpiece. It's absolutely riveting. Uh, and and he deserves all the success he gets, and the whole Barbenheimer thing, amazing. It's too bad that 
his relationship with Warner Brothers went sour over Tenet being day and date on <laughs> Max, HBO Max. Um, but, um, you know, the thing is, I think the studio would agree with me in the sense that they hired the right people to make Barbie. They hired people with a vision. They kept those costs down by controlling the environment. They weren't, there wasn't all this profligate spending. And the problem is, um, what movies need, I, I'm an auteurist. I believe that the director of a movie, and we were talking about this about Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings was able to work because Peter Jackson is a guy that started out when he was making Bad Taste and he was making Meet the Feebles and he was making Brain Dead. He started out cooking his own latex in his uh, home, in his, in his kitchen, in his mom's kitchen. He learned his craft, made Heavenly Creatures, which was actually a movie about a, a, a true crime incident where I first saw my, my beloved Kate Winslet, Winslet and Melanie Linsky. What a cast. And he was making, I mean, the fantasy sequences in Heavenly Creatures are amazing. A great precursor to what we eventually saw in Lord of the Rings. Same with the Frighteners. You know, these all these filmmakers knew and learned their craft. They understood how to manage everything, how to design effect sequences. They knew, they know, they understand that. And the filmmakers that we have today, not so much. Even I'm an Eternals fan. I like the Eternals. Chloe Zhao, you know, here you you know, she makes Nomad Land and, and wins the Academy Award. Now I understand. She was able to make the Eternals before she won the Academy Award, but still. And Kevin Feige was not wrong to tap Chloe Zhao to do the Eternals. And who is she to say no after making Nomad Land with Francis McDormand? Somebody comes along and wants to give you a big payday. But I'll bet you a million dollars Chloe Zhao wasn't allowed to do everything she wanted to do on Eternals because it still had to fit in that paradigm. And what's Chloe Zhao doing? I can't wait to see her next movie. I don't know what it is. And that's a problem. Why don't I know what it is? And I think that that we, um, well, the business. Will the film business survive? I don't know. Do I want to see Wolverine? Do I want to see Deadpool 3? Yes. Do I think Deadpool 3 is going to be great? Yes, because it's going to be different. It's not part of the MCU, and you have Sean Ryan, or, yeah, Sean Ryan, and you have, um, is it Sean Ryan? And you have, you have Hugh Jackman, and you have Ryan Reynolds controlling this kind of thing, mostly Ryan Reynolds, who's going to make sure that it doesn't suck and is going to bring the violence and is going to bring the fun, is going to do everything. It's going to be an atypical Marvel movie. It's the only movie that Marvel has coming out. Um, the things I've heard about it are bananas. And um, I heard some recent things that make it make me think it's even going to be more bananas. And I'll tell you, I'm really excited to see it. I love the first two Deadpool movies. I love Ryan Reynolds. Um it's Sean Levy. It's not Sean Ryan. Why am I thinking Sean Ryan? I was thinking TV. Sean Levy. And they've worked together on Free Guy, on The Atom Project. Sean Levy did like Real Steel um, and um, producer of Stranger Things. So I think it's, it's going to uh, really, I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be great. And uh, why not? But that's where we're at. And if the business is going to survive... I think that this idea, it'll be interesting to see maybe if Hollywood pulls back a little. And instead of chasing IP, there's one thing, hopefully they won't think of Oppenheimer and Barbie's success as being anomalous. And I would say, unfortunately, even it still kind of is everything everywhere all at once. But you know what? Hey, look at Smile. Less than $20 million made 20, 200 million worldwide. Let's, let's look at that. You know, let the studios make their tentpole properties, but why aren't they trying to make, I mean, Paramount was, but why don't the studios, why doesn't every studio have an A24 division? I mean, I know it's hard. It's hard to find great projects. Why aren't they doing what uh, Blumhouse and Atomic Monster are doing over at Universal? Why, why can't, why do the studios, why are they so adverse to trying, if you could make a movie for 15 or 20 million bucks, or look at Lee Wannell's Invisible Man. Eight million dollars spend that movie made a hundred million dollars on eight million bucks. Even with marketing, that's still gonna that's a win win. Then you have a guy like Lee Wanell. I don't know what he's doing now, but you know one of the architects of the Saw franchise. He does up or upgrade does Invisible Man. There's a guy who's making some vibrant.
profitable movies. Why not go do that? Every studio needs a couple of conjuring level franchises. That's what we need. So anyway, that's kind of, uh, what, uh, what I think needs to happen. And the, the truth too, is that remember, you cannot put your universe, you cannot put your political agenda, you cannot put your diversity, equity, and inclusion before your characters and your stories. And no one cares. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what color a character is. It doesn't matter what their sexuality is. It doesn't matter what their religious or political beliefs are. They just have to be great characters. People will watch characters that are truly loathsome if the character is great and it's in a great movie. I mean, I think of French Connection that ran into some problems this year. Popeye Doyle's a fucking racist cop, but he's Gene Hackman. And the story was interesting. William Friedkin was on the streets for the first time and he made a banger movie and people loved it. You know, this, this idea, and I mean, people watch Moonlight. If you describe Moonlight to a studio executive, they're like, ah, you know, it has some diversity in it, but we're not going to make that movie. Probably would make it now. One best picture. It was good. People will watch anything. They'll watch any story as long as the story is good. That's all. And it's true to itself. And we're still dealing with, you know, everybody's tr- getting on their high horse and trying to, let me show you, let me let me explain to you what you don't know, audience. Let me tell you, audience, what, what, what I know that you don't. And I'm going to tell you what you need to do to be better people. When did that ever happen? I mean, it's happening today and it's tiresome. And, um, If these people were telling great stories, I wouldn't care that they're being so didactic and preachy to us, but they're not. And, and it's not working. (laughs) It's just not working. I mean, I hate to say it, but I don't know how you go from Ant-Man, a movie I really liked. Actually, I might've loved it. And then Ant-Man and the Wasp, which I liked a lot, not as much as Ant-Man to quantum mania. I mean, the great thing about Ant Man, the first Ant Man, is is Paul Rudd, the likable Paul Rudd's a guy who just wants to get back together with his family, and be a father to his daughter. And then you've got a superhero caper movie in it with Michael Pena being funny. Where was Michael Pena in Quantum Mania? That was a mistake. For whatever reason, maybe it was his politics. I don't know. Who knows? But how do you make an Ant Man movie without Michael Pena? I was looking forward to his recap of a post Thanos world. I didn't get it, but they should have done that anyway. Somebody should have made one of those Marvel shorts with Michael Pena explaining the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe post-snap. They didn't do that. Um, I don't know. (laughs) What are you going to do? Anyway, there's a lot of you firing uh, firing in some questions and super chats and... um, Let's let's see what you guys have to say. What do you have to say toward this the end of the year? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Uh, Sujith says Patrick H. H. Williams YouTube video essay "Who Killed Cinema: A Murder Mystery" is a good watch on the topic. Um, I've heard about that, and uh, I think I watched some of it. But you're probably right. Retro Days, who also sent in a super chat the other day, and I haven't done a show, Retro Days, since then, but I want to thank you for sending that in. I have not forgotten you. Retro Days sends in a $20 super chat and says, the lack of creative freedom that ruined comics is now ruining the movies based on comics. Not all comics, only the comics in the United States. I mean, I I can't believe, I have listened, um, I love authors, I'm surrounded by tens of thousands of pages of comics bound in hardcovers. The stuff I've heard come out of a lot of comic books, uh, comic book uh, creators' mouths over the last couple of years is astonishing to me. I'm like, and you know that one of my favorite things was the controversy that erupted with that guy, the comic book uh, store owner. He was right. He was 100% right. Like, if you're hired to write a character like Steve Rogers, write Steve Rogers. Don't write you know, the Steve Rogers that you want to know. You're now a custodian of a character that was created before you were born and will outlive you. And give us a great comic book run. That's what you're supposed to do. 
don't give us a great comic book run that you want to insert all of your personal politics into because that isn't the character. Now, and the thing is, here's a funny thing. I love comic books that have one of my favorite comic books of all time is Howard Chaykin's American Flag. That comic is full of Howard Chaykin's politics. Full of it. Now, it's but it's germane to the story that he's telling. And that's why it works. But when you're trying to incorporate certain kinds of politics into a comic book story about Captain America, by the way, Captain America, the name alone, you can go political. Winter Soldier is a political movie, which coming comes out of Ed Brubaker's run. Nothing wrong with that, but it has to be the story that you're telling about the character. Don't try and tell a story about yourself inside a Captain America wrapping. And if you're going to do it, you got to be damn skilled and a great writer, and most people aren't that. So that's another problem. And I'll tell you something. The rest of the world doesn't quite... They're not doing this. I mean, you read graphic novels from France. You read graphic novels from Asia. Those places are all... Why do people love... Why did One Piece become a hit? You had the creator of the, the, the show, the I mean, the manga, the anime, part of the show, and was able to keep it real. And people liked it. Andrew Christie says another reason to factor in is that younger, less experienced filmmakers are easier for the powers that be to influence, replace, and control. The more powerful the artist, the less the higher-ups like it. Very true, Andrew. The problem is the higher-ups don't know how to make movies. <laughs> they think they do. Movie making might be the one profession in all of time and space where everybody thinks they can do it. Everybody thinks they've got to... Uh, great story. Oh, I've got a great story for a movie. But everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks they know how to make movies. And you know what? Movies are really hard to make. And I'll tell you one thing. Uh, there is, you know what the fastest way to bore an executive is? Bring them to a movie set. Or her. Or they. Bring them to a movie set. Bring any executive to a movie set. And they and watch them. If you ever get an opportunity, if you get to make a movie and you're, you're dealing with executives or something, bring them to set. Bring them to set, and and start a top a stopwatch and time them and see how long they'll last. Let's try it. Trust me. And and you know what? Tell the crew, and have everybody and and have like pick your department head to run the clock, and make it a make it a. You know, normally in uh, on, on a lot of the bigger productions, they'll have something like a swear jar or something. And by the end of the week, you know, they'll raffle it off or do some kind of a game, <laughs> you know, executive survival or whatever, and see how long the executive and everybody pays like five or ten bucks into the kitty. You know, and on a big film set, let's say 100 people, that can get pretty lucrative. And you, you bet on how long the executive will stay on set. And, you know, you pick an apartment, pick an apartment that's reliable. <laughs> All the departments are reliable, but to run that, to run, you know, grip and electric, they'll make sure that that, that they'll make sure it's running <laughs> and do it and try it. It's funny. It, it, it's, I mean, I've never done it before, but it, I'm sure it would be funny. But you're right. You're right, Andrew. I mean, and that's the problem. The people that are controlling the executives, the problem is, and it's, it's, it's a simple math problem. The executives now, when one movie is costing you $250 million, it's your entire career. It could be the rest of your life is 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 um, reliant on whether this movie is successful or not. I mean, Kevin Feige, people might say, oh, is Kevin Feige in trouble? He's not in trouble because he's made a ton of money for the studio and he's the empresario and he knows what's up. You know, he didn't ask to have Disney Plus reliant upon their I can't even imagine I can't even imagine the kind of pressure and the kind of I mean the guy's got to focus making two or three or four movies a year is insane enough but when you have to make like six tv shows at the same time an animated series this that and the other thing one shots I, I I can't even imagine and he should never have had the studio was ridiculous for anybody to put that kind of pressure on him. Literally the most successful producer in the history of Hollywood, really, if you go by box office and the amount of movies produced, he is. 
And and to do that to him, I mean, what you did was you basically took your triple crown winner. Um, Kentucky Derby was at Belmont and the Preakness or something, whatever that is. I don't remember. Triple crown winner. That's Kevin Feige. And then you 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 saddle him with a bunch of to keep that metaphor. God, you know where it's going. But you you why would you do that to him? I mean, I understand everybody wants to make more and more and more and more money. That's the Wall Street way of thinking. It does not work. It does not work. Uh, let's see, Shane. It's either Roxas or Rojas. I guess it's Roxas. What a cool last name. Cheers from New Jersey. Never get to watch live, so I just wanted to chime in. Thanks for all the content. Um, long live the DCEU, and most importantly, stay fucking metal, my friend. Fucking metal. Yeah. Uh, I know it's not midnight, but still, stay fucking metal. I, we did Midnight Metal last week. It was a lot of fun. That was a $20 super chat. Thank you for that, Shane. I will stay. Actually, you know, what is it? Um, if you do the devil horns with the thing, right? You come in here and you're like, yeah. Something like that. Uh, I guess you have to do it longer. Oh, there we go. It works. What a crazy thing that they built into this new. new it's so weird, <laughs> but fun. Um. So let me see. Where was I? Oh, Tom Jr. Jackson, our own Tom Jr. Jackson, who came up with the phrase "We are all goof people." Says, "Happy New Year's, Robin Elizabeth, and good luck with your double feature if they call her one eye and the apple dumpling." <laughs> I'll drink to that, sir. <laughs> mm. But I want to correct you. It wouldn't be they call her one eye because that is the version from America that has has the hardcore pornography excise from it. You got to go for the hardcore Swedish original version, Thriller, a cruel picture. And then we will follow it up with the Apple Dumpling Gang. That is the most, perhaps the most demented double feature ever. We should do a... That's actually a Tom. We should do a show on this channel, the most demented double features, and ask people to write in, and then we'll watch the movies and then comment on them. You know, like Martyrs and the way we were, <laughs> or or <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to do that, but or or uh, uh, what would be or, or it's a Wonderful Life in a Serbian film. I actually could could do that right now. <laughs> and it's a wonderful life in 4K. I think it'd be bad though. Uh, some old guy in Hollywood says I watched Fast Charlie twice. Great, and only 16 mil. See, that's the thing. Fast Charlie is the movie with um the with uh, Pierce Brosnan, right? That that trailer looks great. I didn't know it was available. Uh, Scott Bartholomew, who he and I park our shuttle crafts in the same shuttle bay, especially when it comes to Star Trek. Scott says. Verisimilitude is devoid in today's movies. Um, it's true. Uh, Anonymous sends in a tip and says, Hey, Rob, sorry to be a broken record. Asking again if there's some way to reach you to arrange sending you a copy of my novel and some promo merch based on it. Uh, thanks, man. Tony Great at Yahoo.com. Yeah, um, you can. Um, you, the best way... Uh, the best way to do that would be through, just write to me at postgeeksingularity.com. That's the best way, on the website. Uh, Freeman Film says, can the Schumacher cut of Batman Forever ever come out? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I guess it could, you know, if they wanted to spend the money and do it. I don't know if anyone would actually do it. It's, it, it is a real question. Um... I don't know. I mean, I know that it exists as a videotape. The, see, the the problem is putting together these director's cuts. Is here here's here's a, a big problem. So say say Warner Brothers did said okay, we we have the videotape. We are going to spend the money to recreate the Schumacher director's cut. Uh, if they wanted to do it in say 4K, because Batman Forever does exist in 4K. So the thing is, they'd have to find the money to do it. And there isn't any. Like, it, unless you could find... The studio would have to be like, okay, where are we going to get the money from? People would say, well, Rob, they'll they'll just get it... They'll just get it and do it as a restoration. They can't do that. Uh, the way a studio works is that every division has, like, for instance, uh, you have to get the money from somewhere, and there has to be a way it's going to get paid back. 
So what you would normally do with something like a Batman Forever restoration is if they could find marketing money uh, so they could get it and they could have a marketing budget and it would fall under the marketing division. They did that sometimes with restorations with home video. Home video itself might pay for it. Um, there's different ways. And then they would have to, you know, uh, run the numbers and have a revenue stream. Because to recut a director's cut, if they wanted to do it in 4K, they'd have to find the negative, you know, and, and go in and restore it that way. Speaking of which, how, shout out to Arrow uh, for putting out Michael Mann's director's cut of Black Hat. I liked Black Hat, but man, I loved the director's cut of Black Hat. It felt like a it finally felt like a Michael Mann movie. Elizabeth and I watched it last night. Arrow put it out. There's the 4K version of Black Hat uh, that came out. There's the theat American theatrical version. There's the international version. I had no idea the whole inciting incident in that movie was gone in the version I saw. The new version feels so much bigger and so much more expansive and so much better it felt like i really enjoyed black hat when i watched the director's version and i know people are saying well we need an amalgamation version i'm like i don't know if i buy that because i went back in and watched i thought the director's cut was a banger so if you're interested it's pretty dope um i really liked it so check that out uh scott bartholomew said i don't even, I, I don't even think i got back to that but he said verisimilitude is devoid in today's movies it's true it is kind of devoid in today's movies, which is a bummer. Um, well, so so now here, listen, guys, girls, gentle beings, kind souls. Uh, Jay Bling said Schumacher helped Seal find success by featuring Kiss from a Rose on the Batman Forever soundtrack. That is true, but I would say that I loved Seal's first album on ZTT that had the song Crazy. I mean, Crazy um, was a big success and a big hit for Seal before Kiss from a Rose. Um, I'm just a huge fan of ZTT. So so anyway, so for those of you who don't know, if you want to come on this show, like come on live right now, you can. So you can get your, if you have a good camera and a good microphone and some good lighting, uh, I'm going to put a link in this show to people that might want to come on. Now I'm not saying everybody's going to come on, because it's hard to do this by myself. Um, it is, because I have to do it by myself. But it's fun. And if you've ever wanted to come on Raw Observations, and by the way, hopefully you have something interesting to say. If um, if you want to, you know, call me a dick, <laughs> you can. Um, I mean, you can't go too far, because I can 86 you. But, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link in the, uh, in the chat. And when I say randos, what it means is random people. I don't mean it as a slur of any kind, but we'll see what happens. You know, this this uh, last night of the year, the last episode of season six of Rob's Observations. When we come back, it'll be season seven, episode 916. But for tonight, we'll see who shows up and uh, what'll happen. So it's been a long staple of this. It's Saturday night. So there you go. It's in the live chat. Let's see who decides to come on this show. What randos? Who is going to come on? I don't know. But it'll be fun to see. Uh, it's always fun to see the audience and see you. Oh, we got our first some old guy in Hawaii. Number one with a bullet. Although I don't see him. Um, hang on. Who else we got? We've got Daniel... You're gonna to have to pronounce that one for me, Daniel. Um, I'll put you in. I'll put you in, Coach. People are coming in. There you are, Daniel. I got you. You're gonna to have to. I can't hear you though. Oh, I can hear you. I can hear you. Never mind. You're there. Hang on. I need. What I need is. Uh, I've got to uh, take a minute. I'm gonna put people in the show. It's gonna take me a moment to do this, but I'm gonna put you in, everybody. This is gonna be fun. And Daniel, how do you pronounce your last name? Oh, Wynn. Like, like, well, okay, that's Wynn. That's not that's not that hard. Um, oh, <laughs> it's 
true. <laughs> hey, well, hang on. Hold on, because I don't have you in the show yet. Wait. Hang on a second. I'm putting you... This is Daniel. Daniel, you're in the show. You are live right now. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just a regular fan. Um, as you can see, I like nerdy stuff, too. You know, I got Generosol, Iron Man. Um, I, I, I just I just want to say that, Rob, even though I haven't been on, like, the past hour, I just want to say the fall of comic book movies is not inevitable. inevitable. I think it's just going through a rough patch. Think of uh, when uh, think of it when Pixar released Toy Story three back in twenty ten. All right, that's, kind of through, I like that. Went through a couple movies where like Cars two, Brave didn't really hit, but eventually they came out with stuff like Inside Out, and Pixar has been okay up until the pan pandemic. So it's it's, it's not, a good point. It's it's not the end of the world. Um, you got to remember though, Kevin. What is Kevin Feige? What did Kevin Feige start with? He's a fanboy of the X-Men. Yes. And and he, yes. Yes. That stuff has still yet to be untapped. We're just, we're in this middle chapter right now. It's, I could, I think this is going to end up like a lot of MCU movies. It starts well in the beginning, you know, Infinity Saga, the middle chapter, it kind of goes, just slows down. But the last phase is seven, eight, and nine, which is the, which is going to be the X-Men stuff. It's going to go out with a bang. So I just, I think everyone's overreacting. And I think the, be patient, everyone. Let this course correct itself. All right. Well, that's stick around. So we've got coming into this stream, I have uh, Bix and then some old guy in Hollywood. Bix, can you hear me? Yes, but I, I okay, I, I can see you. We got a still frame for you, but that's fine. And then some old guy in Hollywood. So, uh, or some old guy. Yeah, I can hear you. You're good. good. So we got we got Bix down next to me, and we got some old guy in Hawaii. Close uh, enough. Close enough. So <laughs> welcome, and Daniel up top on the left. And, of course, I'm going to add Jeff Bingham to the stream as well when he's here. I'm going to put Jeff in. So now that's pretty good. No, that's pretty good. This is a good crowd uh, we have here. It's wild to, uh, to, uh, to have all these people in and put them in like this. Well, gentlemen... Welcome to the stream, and uh, <laughs> I would I would say the floor is yours. What does uh, what does any of you want to discuss tonight? Uh, there's uh, Jeff. So here we go. I just, I just want to follow up really quickly on 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 about cost and the fact that I mentioned that uh, Fast Charlie only cost sixteen million. Yep. Uh, and then last week I saw Rebel Moon, which was very disappointing. That cost 166. The next day, I finally saw the creator, which some people have mixed feelings about. I really liked, and that was only 80 billion. And that shows you because Gareth Edwards has been doing that kind of effects heavy stuff. That's like his fourth film, so you yep. can do it stuff inexpensively, or at yep. least you know, relatively also practical quickly. Practical sets, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So it let me felt ask. Real. So Hawaii and Jeff, I know you, Daniel. Where are you coming to us from? Lakewood, California. Which All is right, down you're in, in, right by Long Beach. Yeah, you're kind of in the neighborhood. And then I would ask you, Bix, where 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 do you hail from, sir? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Where are you from? Okay. Uh, well, I'm originally from the U.S., but I've been living for just a bit over twenty years uh, in southern Italy, in the Naples province. Wow, are, are, is that where you're coming to us now? You're in Naples? Yes. That's amazing. Uh, the I'm in the province of Naples in a city called Gragnano. I'm on the uh, sloping hills of uh, Mount Vesuvius. Oh, that's amazing. Well, welcome to the show. We can hear you fine. Uh, I don't know. The, the camera uh, looks like we got a still frame, but you were moving there for a while. So welcome to the show. And um, Oh, thank you for having me. It's really cool to be here. Yeah, so... Well, now let me ask. Let me start with you. I'm going to go around the circle. So I'll start with you, uh, Daniel. We, we I thought that was a great impassioned defense. If you could see any kind of a comic book movie, if it was up to you to make a comic book film now, what would be the movie you'd make? What would you want to see made? Right now. Yeah, you could. You could do anything you wanted right now if you wanted to make any comic um, book film. 
Well, I'm going to say it this way. If I was in Kevin Feige's shoes, with what material I have right now, I would start development right away on a solo Wolverine movie or like or maybe even a, maybe even a Cyclops. Do what you did with the with the first phase of the MCU, but do it totally with agree. X-Men characters and build it up to a culminative X-Men movie. Um, I think Wolverine, like Marvel is in desperate need of a hit. And I think Wolverine could be one of those like films you can like, you know, use that as a as a linchpin as like, okay, the MCU is back. If you can do Wolverine right, I think the MCU is back on its on its feet, practically. Yeah. Uh, now, some old guy in Hawaii, I would ask you the same question. If you, if you could, if if you were in charge uh, and you could make any, any kind of a, a superhero movie, what, what would you like to see? I'm the wrong person to ask that question because I'm not, I'm not really that well versed in comics. I know a little bit, but most of what I know is from friends and whatnot, and I react to what I see. That's you know, fair. If, if it's a okay. good story, well told, that's fine. So. I'll take whatever as long as it's, it's it's well done, and anybody can look at the stuff that's been coming out at least recently and go, eh, it's, it's not working. Now, uh, Duke Dev Brad Burnett, I'm going to add to this stream. Uh, uh, I don't know if we're brothers from another mother because his last name is Burnett, <laughs> but uh, maybe. Although I I, I don't know, so I'm going to add. He's got a Captain America shield in the background, so I think. Uh, He's gonna be. He's gonna have some things to say. I'm gonna put him down in the corner. So everybody, welcome, uh, welcome to him. Uh, so there we go. Welcome. Yeah. Are you? Can you hear us? Are you okay there, Brad? Can yeah, you? I can hear you guys. Oh, good. Can okay. you hear me? Yep, you sound great. Um, okay, great. Cool. Well, now let me ask Bix. Bix, are you being in Naples and in Italy? Are 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 you somebody that frequents? Do you go see all the superhero movies? Uh, I kind of wait to see them online because I like to see them for the first time in the original language. Uh, oh, audio. right, because they dub everything there. Oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you could make, did you grow up, were you a comic book fan as a kid or, or uh, uh, anything like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was. And uh, back in the suburbs of Boston, there are probably some long boxes in my mother's attic still. <laughs> nice. <laughs> now, who, who, what, what hero? Who was your jam when you were when you were younger? Uh oh, we lost. Uh... When I was uh, when I was into comics uh, back in the eighties, uh, the X Men were my thing. Me too. I'm I'm still a huge X Men fan. Now, okay, being that the X-Men were your thing, what did you think of the, the Fox X-Men movies? Uh, I kind of enjoyed them. I yeah, really I did. I did liked too. X2. I was kind of disappointed with uh, X United, but overall I, I was I was glad I was happy with the with the result. Nice. All right. Now I come over to Brad. Um I'll ask you the same question. Given a choice, you know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is put in your hands. What do you do? I don't know. Oh, maybe. He has connection problems. Oh. I think he might be frozen. Yeah, he's frozen. Well, I can't ask him that yet, but uh, <laughs> I would be curious to hear what he, he would say, um, being that he's clearly a comic book fan. If he, maybe if you jump out and jump. Oh, you know what? Use Google Chrome as your browser if you're not. Sometimes this software that I use has a problem with Google Chrome. Well, now let me ask you, I'll ask the panel, starting with you, Daniel. Other than comic book movies, what are some of the things that you're watching now that you really like? They could be anything. Uh, I just want to say, uh, yeah, me, and, uh, me and you are in the same boat, Rob. Uh, I'm a big sci-fi guy, so... Uh, I've been watching uh, for all mankind as of late. It's it's been killer this season. It's, it's so good. And by the way, I've seen I'm, the whole I'm season. Always... I've seen oh. that. Oh. <laughs> I've seen the whole season. Uh, I can't, uh, you know, I can't wait for the whole asteroid, uh, this whole asteroid uh, heist thing to, to to fully flesh out. But yes, no spoilers, um, please. I'm not gonna I say. I, okay. I won't say <laughs> shit. 
But I, 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 I've, I've really, you know, it's funny because the season started slow, and I still liked it. I still, but the way they've built up everything, and again, they do such a good job because they leave no stone. Have you uh, unturned? And um, I, I got to tell you, they, you know, what's funny? The show is it is a melodrama with mixed with science fiction, but man. I am so wrapped up in all those characters, and they've done a really good job with the. They've played the interactions between the characters really well this season. What about you, Bix? What do you? I mean, in Italy, um, what do you watch over there on the on the uh, slopes of Mount Vesuvius? Are you like like I don't I don't I don't have much. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Italian movies, but I don't have much of a sense of Italian pop culture. Like, what's big in Italy? Um. Uh, now, w- like, what are some of the things people are watching? And I mean, if I lived in Italy, I don't know if I'd watch TV. I'd, I just drink wine and eat good food and walk around the countryside all the time. But what's it like there? Well, I, I do a bit of uh, the things that you just described. Uh, pop culture mostly concentrated on uh, Italian pop culture. Right, sure. Italian comedies, and uh, the truth is, I'm a bit of, I'm on a bit of a time delay. Like when things come out, I don't see them right away. Uh, kind of catch up to things. Right, and, sure. Uh, but that's understandable. I'm big on the YouTube. I don't really care about spoilers, so I like knowing things even before I see them. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. Um, but but do you have something that that uh, that you, what are you following now? Like what are what are some of the things that you you uh, uh, that you like besides the Marvel movies? Like any TV shows that we would know? Uh, not more action problems. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, let me bring Brad back in. Brad, you're back. Uh, yeah. You, you sound good, though. <laughs> you sound good. Yeah. A deep VPN problems. Sorry. Oh. Uh, no, no. Don't don't apologize. I mean, hey, this. The, I can't believe I can even do this. I can't believe I can bring people in from around the world. It's, uh, you know, we take... Hmm. See if we can get everybody back. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, are you guys back? <laughs> um. Uh, so what happened was the entire system crashed. <laughs> so yes, uh, it did. It, it totally crashed. Let's see. Let me get back here. Hey, everyone's like, why are you looking at? So the entire everybody crashed. No one's no one's back. I got to put you all back in the show. <laughs> Could be. Well, you know what? I just I I'm pushing. I'm pushing the system. The system further, you know, normally I wouldn't have so many people in, um, but it's, it's, uh, let me, let me bring Bix back and uh, let me put you guys back into the stream. I'll get everyone, you know what it was when you, when you put frames around everybody and do all the work, it's, uh, it's rough. It is, it is completely taxing on the system, but I'm going to put you all in, um, Uh, I understand. <laughs> Here, wait, wait. Let me get everybody. So I got Bix. Bix, you're back in the show. And this is part of the live stream when I got people from all over the world, you know, you, you're doing this doing this on the fly. Normally I'd have, you know, if I was like Nerd Roddick, if I was Gary, I would have somebody doing this for me. <laughs> but <laughs> they are. <laughs> so Bix, you're back in the show. And um, I'm going to put Brad. Let me get you, Brad. 
Oh, let me get you in here, Brad. We're back. Brad, now let me ask you, now that I've got mm-hmm. you back, what is your jam? I mean, obviously you're a Marvel fan. You got a Captain America shield back there. If you were given a choice. Oh. Oh, you want to know my jam? I do. Oh, I'll, I will show you in one second. Give me one second. Okay. I'm giving you one second. I'm bringing and back Daniel's back. This is because I did not get to see you at the Vegas meetup. Oh, you mean when I went to Gary's meetup in Vegas? Yes. I oh. missed you at the Vegas meetup. Oh. So what this is, this is a Star Trek The Next Generation RPG that I made oh, in 1994. Oh, my God. That's now, amazing. Unfortunately, I miss seeing you, but um, I got everyone else to sign it. That's incredible. So my choice is I, I actually brought with me also my free Enterprise DVD. Oh, no. In case I would meet you, meet with you. To get you to sign that, although I really wouldn't just sign this. I would love to um, sign. Well, we, we will. We will make this happen. The great thing about Gary is he always puts. On, by the way, that how much fun was that? Oh, the the the, the meetup. Yeah, the meetups are why I'm doing this now. Really? So I went to an Orlando meetup. Uh, so we should say we should say this. Um, so Gary Beekler, who aka Nerdrotic. Who, who, by the way, uh, I consider a good friend. I really like him a great deal. I love his wife. He is so generous to his fan base, and he throws these oh, meetups. Totally. He throws these meetups. He invites hundreds of people. He buys people tacos and drinks, and he himself is sober. Um, yes. I had more fun. It was during CinemaCon. Yes. I had more fun at that, and all the people were great. Everybody was so nice. Um, it was a really cool experience, and uh, you know, it's funny because a lot of people don't understand that about Gary. But I mean, he really um, goes above and beyond for uh, the fan base. So I, I've I've been to um, two meetups now. Um, I went to the Orlando meetup, which is where I met some people who basically talked me into doing streaming. Oh, wow. So, so everybody's like, back. I want to make sure I got everybody back. I got Daniel. Yeah. I got Jeff. I got Bix. I got some old guy. And I got you. Okay, we're all back. Okay. That's pretty good considering this stream just went... It, it, and if it happens again, uh, you know what happened. <laughs> so, yeah. so, by the way, uh, I want to ask... Hold that thought. Um, gotcha. Uh, Tony Washburn sends in a tip. Tony, by the way, how's how are, how are things with uh, your health? Uh, but Tony says, "Destiny Captain here, I'd make I'd make Rom Space Knight. All right, license it from Hasbro. Do it as a 1950s style horror or science fiction film, a cross between Body Snatchers and Day the Earth Stood Still, and I'd set it now. Uh, by the way, that I love this. I love. By the way, they're putting out. They're finally putting out Rom in an omnibus." And Rom was a toy, hmm. and of course they made a comic book that Bill Mantlo wrote, and they had the Dire Wraiths, and the, the X Men were in Rom. Bill Sinkevich did Rom covers. I'm a huge Rom fan. That's a great idea, Tony. Um, I don't know if they can get the rights, and if they did get the rights, I don't know. It's it's weird because the rights situation is difficult for that. Uh, by the way, Mark Spector's avatar says, "Sup, Daniel? You are demand." And then where is RM? RM, this is not a Midnight Musings, but she can't work. Uh, she can't do Midnight Musings on Saturdays. So in the new year, we're going to do it on, we're going to stick to Fridays. Anyway, so I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, no so, it's your show, dude. I, I just roll. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm glad that, so so tell me about that. So you got into streaming. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. I mean, I did mean no, to interrupt you. No, no, it's you, fine. But, no, but, it's no. So, I went to the Orlando meetup, um, and let me say right now that if you have a chance to go to a meetup, go do it. And it's not just meeting like you know Gary and, and Ryan and and Jeremy and Quarter Black. It's meeting the people who 
love this. This this is what got me into it. So I'm hanging this is around. This my quarter black guys. hat, by the way. Yeah, I got mine somewhere up in the corner there. Next, it's uh, next to uh, Jean Luc and Ben Cisco. I can't. Um, I can't agree with you more. I mean, it was. You know what it is? It's like you're me. You're meeting all of our people. Yeah. You know, you're meeting fans. Dude, I met a dude. You're meeting that, family. Yeah, I met a dude who rode his motorcycle down from um, Edmonton, Canada, to Vegas Jesus. to go to this meetup. Jesus, it was awesome. So, so when I met when I was in Orlando, this was the first meetup I went to. And I knew nobody. I am just walk in and all I went to was like, get a picture with Gary, get a picture with Jeremy, get a picture with Ryan, which I did. But then I started talking to everyone else. And then the next thing I know, I'm, I'm like talking to these guys and we're at Universal Studios. So we did the meetup and then Universal Studios meetup was like the post game meetup, which is so much better than a normal meetup because it was just everyone hanging out. Right, that's what the Vegas just, was like too. Yeah, yeah, and we're just hanging out. We're nerding out. We're talking, like, arguing about old Indiana Jones. We're talking about old Buck Rogers. We're talking about all this stuff. Uber and nerds. We were er yes, uber nerding out. It, it was like you know, it's like the stuff I missed from when I was back in college, and <laughs> and someone goes to me, "Well, what's your channel?" And I go, well, "I don't have a channel." And they're like, "Why don't you have a freaking channel, dude?" So. I made a channel in February. Congratulations. And then after that, I started streaming with people. And, like, I'm I'm on every week with people. And, like, people that I see who I have never knew before, I'm, like, you know, streaming friends with. So every week yeah. I do a show on Thursday with my buddies. Um, I know, like, everyone who I see on Nerdrotic, I know them all now. So, like, the next meetup, it's not just going to meet with you know, the, the Nerdrotic, the the FNT, those guys, I'm going to meet with my friends. Yeah. And that's the best part of it. Yeah. Because we get to connect again with that part of, like, our soul that we're missing. Which, well, for, well, for me, I've been missing because I haven't been able to nerd out with anyone. Now, where, so where like, can I ask you, where, where are you at now? I didn't ask you where you... I'm in Florida. You're in Florida, okay. Yes, um, I'm in Florida. I think you've you've really hit the nail on like when I started this channel you know I started because of John Schnepp and um oh uh, god you know John Schnepp and I had known each other for years we were on Collider Heroes for three and a half yeah. years yeah and, and he was always like you should start your own channel I'm like bro what am I gonna I don't wh I, I, what do I have to say <laughs> you know I didn't because when he asked me to go on it was so funny my experience with YouTube other than watching trailers and stuff I watched YouTube and um when he, he calls me up one day, he goes, yeah, you know, hey, man, I'm I'm doing the show. It's called AMC Heroes, and we're going to do the sixth episode. And could you come down to this studio and and do this thing? And I'm like, okay. I Like, I didn't know what it, it was. Like, I'm like, do what thing? Like, I, like he's, we, we do a live show about comic books and comic book movies. And I'm like, okay. Because John Schnepp's the kind of guy that when he would call me up, I would just go do it. You know, like, I the way we... John, this I've told this story before, but like I was in in the I want to say maybe it was 2006 or later. I was at a wedding with my old girlfriend Mary Forrest, and we were just in New York, and we went into this Russian bar that's kind of right off Times Square, just randomly, and of course John Schnepp's in it. <laughs> He's just in this random bar. He's in a random bar in in New York City, and of course I look at him I'm like. Bro, you know, dude, what are you doing here? And we hung out for a couple of days, and but to me that was that was uh, that was like Schnepp, and so it, I didn't know what to do. And then after he passed away, Elizabeth bought me this microphone for the holidays, and she said uh -huh. that yeah, I mean, and I bought, I, I mean, one day I'm going to bring these Sure microphones and use them because I bought them a year ago and haven't used them, but. Um, and then, we, then I same thing. I started this channel, and, and the great thing has been like with you guys right now, Bix, on the on the uh, slope of Vesuvius, or some old guy in Hawaii, or you know Daniel and and Jeff, and um, you know all the other people. Hey, we can add Scott Bartholomew to this conversation too. Part of the great thing about YouTube that I think is not understood 
a lot as people get mad. You, all of you grifters on YouTube, and you know, uh, is the fact that it you 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 develop these communities, and that mm -hmm. was that was a byproduct exactly. that I had no idea that that was going to happen when I started doing this, and it's it's a great thing. It's never been. I mean, sure, there have been people that have been, you know, prickly. But for the most part, it's a great thing, and as, as you can attest to. You, you know, Rob, um, I've watched you enough to know the type of person you are. Um, and I can honestly say that you and I, if we were just talk politically, we'd have a lot of differences. Come on now. But <laughs> that's fine. But, John, that's fine. I, I know what I am. I'm a right. I'm a conservative libertarian type of guy yeah but at the same time i could sit down right now and we could just say screw all that shit let's well, talk about part season three but i it, we and could that's what matters for this community by the way i but i also think that uh we could have look i believe that oh, inte I can, oh, intelligent yes, people can have your, yes we can't even i mean i grew up believing by the way welcome scott bartholomew he and i park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay um welcome to the show so it's good to have you I, there's something i wanted to show you but i can't i don't know where i put it but i'll have to see if i can but but that's another thing i think that that you know jeremy from geeks and gamers reached out to me and i went on his show and jeremy and i are diametrically opposed politically yeah we we, yeah. we had we had a great time he was so nice to me, and I caught hell. People were like, how can you, how dare you go on his show? I'm like, oh, that okay, first of all, I was like, I'll talk to anybody, you mm -hmm. know, and I think that we should have, why are we so afraid of opening a dialogue with people that think that's, America is built on that, and I, and I think that we, I mean, I don't, I'd, I'd be curious to hear what all you guys think. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. there, I, it's like I, I have serious disagreements with, with, with certain viewpoints by, from like Nerd Rock and, and Critical Drinker and whatnot. And I, but I watched it, but I, I, I know I could sit I down and actually talk to them and we could talk about it, you know, and we could agree or yes, disagree. Yes, exactly. You keep the lines of communication open, which is something you don't see enough of today. Everything is very polarized and I don't want to talk to you and I don't want to talk to you. No, you have to be able to be willing to discuss it and maybe change your mind if, or maybe change their mind or maybe not but. or or just have a good conversation yeah, about yeah, it yeah. just say look this is my opinion you may disagree with me that's fine but i'm going to tell you my opinion i'm going to listen to your opinion and yeah. and that's what's missing today and and i kind of think like in this nerd space we've kind of we can connect that way so we can like talk about these things and just like i've had political conversations with people on streams who are, who are like completely the opposite of me but right. we're completely civil and respectful i miss that we don't have that now well, i mean you, you know i'm, I'm a middle aged man I'm, 50, I'm gonna be 51 years old in two weeks um and i don't get the kids today who's just like i just shut my ears and say that's it i don't want to talk i will talk with anyone I will argue with anyone, and because I'm a lawyer, I will vehemently defend my position, but I respect yours as well. Well, you're, I think you're two, you're a two hour difference from me ahead of me. You're 13 years older than me, and I'm more ready to fall asleep than you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, okay. Let me ask. Let me ask Bix because he's in a, he's an expat living in a different country which by the way I, I'd love to spend some time living in Italy it's been a dream of mine to live there um, what is it like for you politically how how is how is it like in on on social media or just with people that you know are are people fairly civil in their discourse in Italy uh, I think so uh, the thing that I find a bit disheartening uh, watching what's happening in the United States is what the gentleman was talking about. It seems a, an air of intolerance has grown in the United States where yeah. people are not willing to listen to each other oh, anymore. It's, it's really or bad. And accept <sighs> opposing views and yeah. be civil. 
Yeah, yeah. It, it really is. And, uh, and it's... Actually... Uh... Well, go ahead. Yes. Well, as a, as a Gen Z elder, uh, I kind of have an old school opinion about uh, the things I don't like to talk about. Uh, don't ask me about religion, politics, or how much money I've got in the bank. <laughs> right, exactly. But, I mean, the, here's the thing. I see it, it, what, I, uh, what scares me a, a little bit is when I was a kid, like when I was going to college, I went to college expecting to be challenged. I went to college mm -hmm. ex expecting to encounter ideas that were uh, not things I didn't know, things I hadn't thought about, things that I might not have liked. Uh, that was why I went to college. <laughs> you know, I went to college, and before I went to USC, I went to a school called the Evergreen State College. It was a very crunchy, chewy granola founded in 1967. And it famously had this student uprising back in 2017. And people like Brett Weinstein, who was a 15-year tenured professor there, who has the Dark Horse podcast. I mean, it was crazy. And, and I was no, we're no stranger to campus uh, uh, unrest. But the idea that now that students talk back to professors and think that if a professor says something they don't like, They'll try and get the professor fired. And I, I find that shocking, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, wh why are you going to a college if you don't want to listen? If a professor says something you don't like, why would you want to turn around and try and fire that person? That person's, that, that's the reason you're at the school, is to hear from your professors. And if you can't participate in a dialogue, and the thing is, those people... What scares me also about these people is if they don't like you enough, I'm not sure what they might do to you. Uh, yeah. and, and it's 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 quite terrifying. And I don't trust people. They used to say, never trust anyone over 30. It's even in Plan of the Apes. Ouch. Keep the fires of revolution burning. Yeah. Never trust anyone over 30. I don't trust anyone under 30. Yeah. They're the dangerous. Is the least of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's a generational paradigm shift in uh, uh, as far as a, like. But it's a, a pole. It's the pole. Back. The North Pole became the South Pole. I mean, it's such yeah. a shift. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I love you. Put your hand up. That's good. I'll trust you, though, if you're under 30. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he he sounds muted. Oh, we you might be are, muted. Are, are you muted? Yeah, you might be muted. Right, we can't hear you. You uh, did you mute to Daniel? May be muted. Yeah. Did you mute yourself so that you would not interrupt anybody? Do you think? We, we oh, just... he's he's working on it. He's a little yeah. Choppy too. Um, but like Scott, let me ask you. You know, you and I are both classic Star Trek fans. Oh wait, Daniel, are you back? Can we hear you? We we can't. We still can't. Voices. Is... Yeah, I can't hear. But Scott, uh, you know, one of the things I think that I learned as a lifelong Trek fan. So. It... Oh, now I'm, we got. You. I'm. Let's. I am. Uh, oh, we, we I'm got you. Go, years go ahead. Old, so I'm on the cast. So I'll, I'll trust you. You're close enough. <laughs> Don't let me down. <laughs> Give him a pass. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. You're 28. You're on the cusp. Audio is still choppy. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah, we can. Yeah, his audio's messed. Uh, um. But let me, okay, Daniel, you're, I don't know why we had you so, we had you, uh, you know what, this software, it's, this is rough. I mean, it's have P -P all this, but let me, Scott, let me ask you, we're old school Trek fans, you and I are pretty simpatico when it comes to Star Trek. One of the things about Star Trek, I think, that we loved growing up was, I don't think you can be a classic Star Trek fan and not like people mm -hmm. in general. Would mm -hmm. you say right. that that's, would you say that that was true? Yes, very true. Very true. 
Like, no matter where you go, you'll find somebody you like, somebody to talk to. Like, you're never going to – like, to me, I, I, I really do believe, I always say at the end of Rob's Observations, uh, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. I really believe that's true because I found that out in my life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, 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 you know, you mentioned that, and it just brings back memories of when I went to my first Star Trek convention back in uh, 77, 78. Wow. Um, and uh, went, wow. went and Roddenberry was there. He had the blooper reel. And, yeah. You know, it was just awesome. And there were like a, there was like a thousand people in the arena. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, and that's the thing. I mean, uh, it's such a weird, and, and now how Star Trek, it, it's, it's completely changed, especially Discovery, when it's, there's so much identity politics in Star Trek and that show, it's insulting. I'm like, yeah. you, you, you've taken a show that I grew up with since I was a five-year-old kid that made me want to go meet people in the world, and you've populated it with a bunch of people that are going to lecture me. Right, uh, and, right. and yeah, it's Discovery, Discovery is just a shit show. But so, it, it's it's very odd. So go ahead. <laughs> can can I share a little bit of what Wait. just happened to me recently? Please. Um. So yeah, Shatner's doing the Wrath of Contour, mm-hmm. and uh, he came to Tampa because I live in the Tampa Bay area, and I saw. It. I'm like, well, f- hell yeah, I'm going to see that. And um, so, so I saw Wrath of Khan when it came out. Um, again, I'm 50 yeah. years old now. I've been a I've been a Trek fan since 1980. I like recorded everything that I could find on WPIX out of New York because that's course. how I was on VHS. Yeah, because that's I'm an original Trek fan. So I'm going to, and this is like the second time I've seen Shatter. So I, I've, I've been to, I've seen every original cast member at a convention. Because um, in, in New England, I grew up, went to Creation Con. So there had all the Creation Cons. I went to Boston, I went to New Haven, I went to Hartford. Sure. Wherever I could go, I would go see them all. Um, so, like, I got to see Shatner. And, oh, my God, that dude's 92 years old. I don't know how that man has that energy. Holy crap. Oh, yeah. Wow. Dude is like a dynamo. Um, well, I think so. He he's understood. I think that there's a there's a whole contingent of people, whether it's Ridley Scott or Clint Eastwood's directing movies yeah. at ninety three. You know what I found interesting is that they're not going to stop living their lives. No, I mean they're they're I, I just mean, not going to that stop. Man is a living legend, and we will be the lesser for when he's gone. Oh yeah, not just because. The captain is gone, but because someone of that energy, that passion has left the planet. That's and he's, he's reinvented himself so many times. I mean, oh, it, my God, it, you know, it's it's is funny. Denny Crane and, and also T.J. Hooker and the host of Rescue yeah, 911. And Denny, and, it's like, I'm sorry. He's uh, we can joke about the oh, my God, the blah, blah. Bill Shatner is a freaking our tour. He knows what he's doing. He is. He's amazing. Bottom line. Oh, um, I mean, um, I mean, you, here since it's my show, you yes. want me? To, you want me to interrupt you for a while? Let me, let me, let me show you. You can go off, Rob. Okay, no, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be a little oh. self-serving and see if this works and show you how awesome William Shatner is. Okay, you guys ready? Listen, when I'm with a woman, I know that I'm going to climax. I mean, it's not even an issue. You know, all guys come. I'm more interested in participating in my partner's orgasm. You know, women become very, very spiritual before orgasms. Oh, my God. Besides, as I was led to believe, ladies first. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Right, that's exactly what they say. I don't believe it. It's Bill. Okay, just be cool. Don't stare. He'll go blind. And he's perusing porno. All right. I got to go over there and talk to him, man. What, what do you, you know? All around the world, from as far off as the Caspian Sea, people have been running up to Bill and acting like idiots. Why must you be one of them? Because now it's my turn. 
I mean, don't you want to go over there and talk to him and see what he's like? I mean, William Shatner made us who we are today. But do you want to insult the man? Just respect his space. I do respect his space. It's the final frontier. Well, just, just be dignified, you know? Don't do anything stupid. All right. Calm, cool, and collected. Don't make a big scene. Oh, good. I've been looking for Mein Kampf. Uh, uh, sir, I just... Uh, Mr. Shatner, I would like to say that I think you are the greatest American actor ever. I'm a Canadian. Well, then, may I just say that you are the greatest Canadian actor ever. It was ad-libbed. There aren't that many of them. Well, if I may, sir, just say that I have a tremendous amount of respect for your work as a writer, a director, a thespian, and an entrepreneur. Uh, listen, um... I, 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 we don't want an autograph or anything like that. I, I was just wondering, um, what brings you here? I'm um, trying to find something to read. You, you, you buy books? Otherwise, it'd be shoplifting. <laughs> Listen, I'm sorry. We, we, we don't want. We're, we're not. We, we were just wondering if we could maybe we could buy you a drink That's right. or something. I mean, we're really we're not the usual kooky fans. No. All right. We can. Oh, no, it's just, okay. We couldn't help but sense that there's something wrong. Are you, uh, you perturbed about something? Uh, yes, I am. If it'll, uh, stop you from following me around, uh, I'm having uh, trouble with the story <laughs> I'm writing, okay? I sense that. It's, that's the worst. I get the same thing myself. Are you a writer? Yes, actually. No, are oh, you yeah. really? Is that yeah. block the worst thing? Absolutely. Just can't, oh, we discuss yeah. it all just the can't time. Do anything. We're you actually both the industry it. professionals. Uh, yeah, I work over really? at, uh, at uh, Fully Clips. Really? Yeah. Are you, uh, are you uh, a higher up? A big muckety muck? Uh, well, I mean, I, I just uh, directed um, a little thing that's called Beach Babe Bimbo. Uh, no, I, you know, it's funny. I was over there this morning pitching my latest opus, Brady Killer, and. Uh, Looks like it's going to be a go, probably. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's great. I've got an idea, you know. So there you go. So for the anyone who's so watching this that doesn't know what that is, because <laughs> a lot of people don't, uh, most people don't, uh, that was a movie I directed in 2024. It will be the 25th anniversary of this movie being theatrically oh, released. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, so that is a scene where the main characters, Eric McCormack, actually two Emmy Award winners in that scene, Shatner and mm -hmm. Eric McCormack, and that's when they meet Shatner in the bookstore. It's, it's from 1999's Free Enterprise that was, I directed it's the film, I edited the film, and I co-wrote the movie, so with Mark it, Altman. Isn't Rob Weigel a newscaster now? Yeah, Rafer, yeah, he is. He actually, Rafer, yeah. actually his father, Tim Weigel, was a sportscaster in the Chicago area for years and years and years. And Rafer, yeah. Rafer had a, um, he was an actor, you know, I cast him in that. But mm -hmm. afterwards, um, he went he went into news, and now he's on the nightly news in San Diego. He wow. was on CNN for a while, he went back to Chicago, but now he's back in San Diego. So... So legitimately, Rob, I, I, I really have to ask, and, and like, I know who you are as a Trek fan. I appreciate that. I've seen all your stuff. I've seen the TNG stuff. How the hell did you get Shatner in this? Uh, it, it's a very, okay. I was working, so I, I, here, I'll tell you the whole story, if, since you guys want to hear this. This is, a, this is actually a very interesting story. So I was a freelance film editor, and I was editing trailers and low-budget films, and I worked out of a place called Midtown Edit a lot here in L.A. And uh, on my answering machine, or at the time, yeah, I was on my answering machine at the time, I, I always used to say, uh, and as always, have a better day. And, <laughs> and so I get a phone call once, and there's a producer going, huh, 
What does that mean, have a better day? I don't know what that means. Uh, why don't you call me back? I'm interested in having you cut a trailer for a movie. So I called him back, and he had me cut this trailer for a movie called The Asphalt Quartet, a.k.a. Heist. It was truly god-awful. <laughs> it, was, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible film. And so I cut the trailer, which they really liked. And the producer of the movie, um, this guy named Mort Salkind, uh, came in and um, he was kind of like the Tony Soprano of movie producers. <laughs> and he said to me, he goes, well, what do you think of my movie? And I, I don't lie. I said, it's really bad. And I, 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 I said, I said, I said, I said, not only is it really bad, but they, the, the way I cut the trailer was they, they gave me their edit bay. So all of the, the avid system that they cut the movie on. So I looked through all the footage. So I'd seen the whole movie. I said, not only is the movie really bad, but it could be much better than it is because there's all this footage that wasn't used in the cut. And he looks at me and, and like, what do I care? I mean, I already cut the trailer. He already paid me to cut the trailer. I'm just telling the truth. And um, he goes, I'll tell you what. What if I paid you for two weeks to, and at the time, I'm like, I, 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 I quote for me. I said I would need five thousand dollars for that, which was a lot more money than I usually get paid. So th this was like ninety seven, and um, uh, uh, I told him that um, that I uh, he wanted me to recut the movie for five grand. So I basically moved in and lived there. I went home like every third day to take a shower and change my clothes. I stayed up as late as I could, slept as little as I could. I recut the entire movie. And he said, if we like your cut of the movie, we'll go with your cut of the movie. And I was like, okay. So I recut the movie, comes in, I show it to him. And he goes, oh, we're going with your cut of the movie. And then he looks at me, he goes, there's just one thing wrong with this cut. I, I really like what you've done, but is there any way you can put an action scene at the beginning of the movie? And I'm looking at him like... I can't just conjure an action scene out of thin air, but I, I don't want to. Like, if you didn't shoot something, I can't. Yeah. I can't. Like, I can't make it up. And he goes, "Yeah, but 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 if you can, I mean, if you can find a way." So I'm looking through all this footage, and like, I find a blown take where a guy's Glenn Plummer, who's in the movies, running down the, who was also in Pastime, running down the and Showgirls is running down this alleyway and trips over a garbage can. That was about it. So what I did was I, I built this sound effects cacophony with this police and the helicopters. And, and I was like, oh, get him. He's right over there. And I added gunshots. And then the guy trips. you know. And, and then the, the opening title sequence, I put the title going, the Asphalt Quartet, when gunshots went. And I used Photoshop. And I used, no, I used Photoshop and, and uh, the, the, at the time, graphic, you know, having the lens flare. It was just. This is and, the fun part. Yeah, and he looks at it. He goes, "That's great, that's great." Oh my God. And so he goes, "Kid, I love you. Describe oh, great. What What do you want to do? And you want to direct? What do you want to do?" And I said, "Yes, I want to direct." And and I said to him, "He goes, well, what, pitch me a movie." And I said, "Well, I've always wanted to make a Jewish supernatural thriller, and I always want. I wanted to use. I'm like, I want to use Judaism." The same way that, that Catholicism informs vampire mythology. Because there's all this great these great Yiddish folktales. We've got the golem, you know, the undead man, man of clay. We've got all this shit. I want to delve into that. And I, I didn't realize this, but he was, he was Jewish. He goes, that sounds great. I said, I want to deal with the roots of anti-Semitism and all this stuff. And I want to call it Day of Atonement. And then I said, it's too late to be forgiven. And, and he, he, you know, and he goes, that sounds, wow, sounds more like an action movie than a horror movie. <laughs> oh, well, it's like, like, and, forgiven. and, and immediately, immediately he goes, that sounds great. We're going to do that. And so I called up Mark Altman, you know, who I made free enterprise with. And he yeah. was, he was yeah. editing sci-fi universe magazine that I was the critic at large for at the time. So I said, uh, dude, we're, we're making a movie, bro. I, I sold this movie. We're going to do this thing. So Mark and I start writing this script, and I had all these ideas. I was reading all these Yiddish folktales, and 
we are dealing with the mirror realm and Osmodius and Lilith and concentration camps and I wanted Leonard Nimoy to play a rabbi and minions and a bar. I mean it was it was all this crazy stuff. But it was going to be like The Exorcist. So we wrote this script. It was god awful. It was just terrible. And we were going to have to we were going to have to turn this script in. And by that time, as we were writing the script, I got the job working on the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas. Mm. And I got I got the job cutting all of the material um, that was all the video things that you saw, like through the museum. And if you ever went to that experience, I was so yes. I got that job. So I was working on this. Yeah, I was working on this thing. And and I would stay there all night and I had to digitize all the Star Trek episodes before I could cut them. And one night, Mark, Mark and I are talking and I'm like. Dude, we can't turn this script in. It's like 300 pages, and it's terrible. A screenplay is supposed to be between 90 and 120 pages, and we've written all this stuff. It's like god-awful. He's like, you're right, you're right. What are we going to do? I go, I don't know. We have to turn it in like two days. We're, we're going to torpedo our chances of making a movie. The next day, Mark calls me, and he reads me a scene of me, a story I told him when I went to see Star Trek The Motion Picture and how I got the shit kicked out of me. Uh, by this guy because I wore a Star Trek uniform to school. But it, instead of that happening, when I get knocked out, William Shatner appears to me in limbo and says, you know, you're a geek. You shouldn't dress in gold. And uh, and and Mark had written down, like, uh, this character. And I tell William Shatner this fight started because the, the, car- the guy said, the kid said to me, Han Solo is cooler than Captain Kirk. And the end of the scene was Shatner saying, well, kick the little fucker's ass. Which is in the movie. And I read yes. this and I'm like, this is amazing. What is this? He goes, well, what if we made a movie about ourselves? You know, living in L.A., you have all your crazy stories about all these girls and all this stuff. And, and I'll talk about trying to be an agent. And, and we'll make it like Swingers. Or we'll make it like uh, Clerks. You know, we'll do this indie film. And, and we'll write this whole thing. And William Shatner is going to be our friend. And he'll be our imaginary <laughs> friend. And, and, and he'll do it because we love him. And I'm like... Okay, so <laughs> so we, we, we wrote this script, and it was originally called Trekkers. The original script was called Trekkers. So we wrote this script, and everybody loved it. And for like six months, we took all these meetings, and the whole movie, Shatner was an imaginary character, and it was, it was, um, it was a play it against Sam, the Woody Allen movie. That's, that was our template. Yeah. So then we met a producer who wanted to fund it, Gave us the money to make the movie. And we're like, great. Now we just have to get William Shatner. We started casting the movie. Eric McCormack was the first person I saw. And I cast him immediately when I saw him. We're casting the movie. No Shatner. No Shatner. Wouldn't do it. Tried to get in touch with him. We're like, who do we know that knows William Shatner? It's one of these things. where, And we, we tried. Everybody we knew in the Star Trek community, people were giving him scripts. We were sending things to him. So it was December of 1997, right before Christmas. We had a production office. We're making this movie. We just don't have William Shatner. The production secretary calls me and says, William Shatner's on the phone. I've never spoken to William Shatner. I've written a movie where I'm his best friend, and I don't know him. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so he, he, he's on the phone. <laughs> and he he says he says Rob uh, Rob this is a very funny movie, but I'm not going to do it. And I, I'm like, and Mark Altman's on the phone too. And I, we're like, what? He, he goes, you you've written me like I'm God, like I know everything, like I'm the coolest, I'm the coolest person in the world. And he's like, I'm if I made this movie, I'd be laughed out of Hollywood. <laughs> and I, I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself. We wrote him as like the coolest motherfucker in the universe. Mm-hmm. And cuz he is. And he's like I can't do this. I'd be embarrassed to make this movie. And Mark and I are like we're casting this movie. We have the money to make an independent movie and we're going to lose we actually had this is way before Galaxy Quest. We had an alternative version of the script called Solar Quest where we were going to make it a fictional show, fictitious show. Oh wow. And we were going to get Malcolm McDowell to play cuz I knew somebody who knew him. To, to play the Shatner role. Oh, I love shit. Malcolm. Yeah, so we had that ready oh to go. Oh, my God. But we didn't, nobody, our, our, our investor didn't necessarily want to do that. So Shatner's about to hang up, and we're like, well, wait a minute. Is there anything that we could do 
to this script that would make you reconsider being in the movie. And he thought about it and he says, well, he goes, look, man, I got problems. And we're like, what? He goes, well, I have, I have daughters. I've got ex-wives. I mean, I'm a fucked up guy. And I, I got women problems, money problems. I'm like anybody else. If you were to rewrite the script and make me a fucked up guy, I'm not going to say I'm going to do your movie, but I'll reread the script. And this is right before Christmas. And, and, we're like, and then he said, I'll rewrite, and that was it. I was like, that's enough. We let him go. Merry Christmas, Mr. Shatner. And um, we we then rewrote this crazy script where he wants to do a one-man. It started out as a one-man Titus Andronicus, <laughs> and then we changed it to Julius Caesar. And it was so crazy that, that when we rewrote the whole thing. Now, it, the problem with it was we didn't really integrate the romance and the Shatner story very well i'll be honest it's a weakness of the movie but um we only had like a week to do it because we are supposed to start shooting in january and this was we were pushing we were casting this movie and spending money we just assumed that it's like in a shakespeare in love well how is this going to happen and jeffrey wright's like i don't know it's a mystery <laughs> that's kind of what our, our our this whole thing was we we were just we had the money to make the movie. And I, I, once you get the money to make the movie, it doesn't matter. Anything can happen. It's getting the money to make the movie that's the hard part. We had the money to make the movie. And we're casting. I already got great actors. Now we just had to get Shatner. And then after the first of the year, we this was the great thing. Whoa. Hang he, on. Uh, wait, I have, I, have, I have something to say. Wait, is it this? Okay. Since you guys are asking, this, this is the letter I got after he read our new draft of the script. This is actually a great Hollywood letter. It came with this picture. Get, get to go full screen on this, Rob. Uh, you you know on. what I probably do. Here, I'm going to go full screen. Yeah, come on. Okay, here's the picture it came with. Now, I am... G that Shatner... It was a very dapper Shatner. Here's the letter he wrote me. Uh, now that I'm telling a story. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go full screen when I read this letter. So here's a letter I got from William Shatner on January 9th, 1998. Dear Mark and Rob, thanks for sending me your rewritten script. It seems to me you have a very funny movie, but I still feel the same way can't bring myself to play myself in a movie it's just too much it has nothing to do with the quality of your script it has to do with the concept of Shatner on Shatner I appreciate your efforts and I hope that the future will offer us another opportunity sincerely William Shatner so that's the letter we got and uh we're like, and and by the way, we had written him tear-stained letters and all this, so <laughs> so we're like, we our investors like, well, what are we gonna? We were so far down the line with this, and our investor, we just said, look, Shatner's a businessman. We just have to pay him more money, <laughs> and um, um, so we we re rejiggered the budget. You know, we only had what we had. And it's funny, our investor's like, he wanted to be like, I'll give him a million dollars. And I'm like, you can't, I, I was like, you can't, we can't do that because that's, that's too, there's no way. Then the movie wouldn't make money and I'd be fucked. I'd never have a career. It turns out I'd never had a career anyway, so it doesn't matter. But <laughs> um, so, 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 so anyway, <sighs> we called up and, and we made him an offer. We came up with what Mark and I said, he'll go for this. And it was it was very funny because our our investor said, "Well, I'll go up to this amount of money," and I'm like, "Okay, as long as we'll go up to the we've set a number that we're gonna give to him, and we're gonna be like this, but we'll go we'll go a hundred thousand dollars less." And and so this is so funny. We told Shatner we were gonna fax him an offer, and we expected to hear from him, and we made a time for him to call. <laughs> So, so it was so funny. We faxed him the offer, and he calls me. He's supposed to call, and there's like eight of us in the room, the production, all the production people. And Shatner goes, this is a very generous offer. I want 
this amount of money, which was a hundred thousand dollars more, because he knew it was he knew it was a negotiation. Mm-hmm. And we're like, we're like, fine, great, done. He's like, great, let's make a movie. <laughs> That's how I got William Shatner to be wow. in Free Enterprise. Beautiful. And um, yeah, and 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 what? But what was really interesting? I'll tell you what was really interesting. After that process happened, we started writing the script, and we got his notes from him. And it turned out that he was very astute in terms of of his own character and the things that he wanted to do. And he had some really great uh, notes. And and in the original script, because we, re- we rewrote it so quickly, we had this, this idea that he was going to perform this one-man uh, Julius Caesar musical. And originally, I had written it, because I'm a huge Prince fan, I wanted him to sing Prince's Sexy Motherfucker at the end of the movie. <laughs> Sexy enough. I'm not kidding. Oh, my I'm God. Not, I'm not kidding. Oh. And so, so Shatner's like, he, he said, and he was right. He goes, you know, this doesn't really fit in with the, with the, um, with the, with the idea of doing this one man, uh, musical of Julius Caesar. He goes, you know, I think, by the way, this is a true story. He goes, I think what, if you were to do the end of the movie, what if Shatner rapped? What if he did a rap song? And Mark and I are looking at him going, what the fuck? He goes, well, yeah. I mean, he, he, Shatner goes, you know, rap is like the poetry of the streets now. And and rappers are great artists. And, and I think if Shakespeare was alive today, he might be a rapper. He might be rapping in iambic pentameter. And we're looking at Shatner like, at first, and then we're, we're like, he's fucking crazy. And then we, Mark and I are like, that's a genius idea. <laughs> And it just so happened that our offices were below or above a recording studio. And there was a rapper named Rated R who was part of Tupac. Oh, he's in the movie. Yeah, and he's part of Tupac's posse Thug Life. And I would oh see Oh my god. The, so I'd see these rappers and stuff and like going in and I, you know, cracker white boy that I am. I'm, I was always like, "Hey guys, how's your recording session today?" <laughs> and so they just happened to be there. So one day you know, I walk in and they, they use a lot of uh, pot was not legal. Weed, you, c- you couldn't get the dank nugs in California legally at that time. Then. You, you, unless you wanted to go. In, I mean, to even even be close to that recording studio was to get a contact high. So one day I go down there and I was like, uh, hey, guys. Um, and they're, they're, they're recording tracks. Freddie Roan was the producer. Radar was there. I said, listen, um, we're making this movie and... Uh, how would you guys like to work with William Shatner doing a rap song? Oh my God! And I mean, these guys are like they got gats in their pockets. They're strapped. They're they're, <laughs> I mean, they're legit. And I'm like white boy guy that I am, and and I'm asking them like we could do like what do you, what do you think about doing a rap song? And um, well, it's funny because Rated looked at me and he thought about it. He goes, well, you know, if we vibe with him. Because he said he said vibe. If we could vibe with him, maybe, you know, maybe. But he'd have to come here, like, because Raider was really serious about his record. He's like, I'm not going to just rap some. He didn't want to do some gimmicky rap tune. So I called up <coughs> Shatner, and by this time he wanted to call him to call. He wanted us to call him Bill. And I told him, I said, uh, Hey, uh, I think your idea is good. We got a rap group. Would you like to come down and uh, meet Raider R? He's part of Tupac's Posse Thug Life. Chad was like, "What a, what a, that would be extraordinary," <laughs> you know. And I, I, and so he, we, we, he comes down and he like had a brand new green Jaguar, convertible Jaguar. He rolls up and he's like, he's blaring N.W.A. out of his car. I mean, I don't. <laughs> oh I, I mean, I was just like, oh, like fucked up. It was not fuck the police, but um, straight it was just conference. straight. Yeah, straight. It was that album, and um. Uh, it was it was so insane that he he does this and he gets out and he's like oh Rob Mark you know I'm really excited and Mark and I went in there there was no we weren't filming it we go in and there's like eight rated R and like eight dudes like these guys were hardcore and they're all sitting respectfully you know they're all <laughs> sitting on chairs and they've got like hands folded they all look like schoolboys and Mark and I are watching what's happening. 
you know, and Shatner walks in and everyone, they're all, they can't believe, it, there was a little bit of, they, they can't believe it's William Shatner, like this old white Jewish dude coming in to talk to them about doing a rap song. And, and Shatner's like, you know, boys, uh, we're going to do this Shakespeare number. It's going to be about my one man musical show. And he goes, you know, it's about Julius Caesar and Julius Caesar is like Martin Luther King. And Mark and I are Jesus like, Christ. what the fuck? <laughs> and I'm like, we're, 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 we're standing back and we're like, where is this going? <laughs> That's what we were saying. Like, oh my God. And of course they were like, suddenly they're perked up like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar was a man of the people. This is Shatter. Julius Caesar was a man of the people. You know, he had, he had the, he had the people to support him behind him the man on the street the woman on the street they supported julius caesar just like martin luther king martin luther king was fighting for the people the every man and i'm like fuck yeah dude and 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 shatner's like he's he's saying and you know what happened because Julius Caesar was the way he was, he threatened the real power brokers. Oh, he shit. threatened the powers that be, and they oh, had no. to kill him, just like oh, Martin Jesus. Luther King established. Oh, my God. Threatened the, no, no, and, and, and they killed Martin Luther King for the same reason they killed Julius Caesar. And I'm, like, watching this, and Rated R jumps up and goes, that's what happens in the hood. You get too powerful and someone busts a cap in your ass. And then he goes, I feel you will. And then he jumped up and he put his hands around Shatner and hugged him. And Shatner said, I kid you not. Now let's lay down some fat beats. <laughs> oh, God. oh, what a badass. And that was the, and then we recorded No Tears for Caesar. Have you told oh the God. story on, on stream before? <laughs> Pro, I have told the story. I've told the story okay, so many okay, times, but, but I've never heard it, and it's like okay, I've I'm never heard it before. My, yeah, my save list. I'm right. sorry, Rob. I'm just like <laughs> I'm just loving hearing this right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm yeah. just so happy hearing this I'm, story. I mean, and and that was by the way. Um, this is a, a tenth Adams vision is clear sends in a tip. I didn't get this one. Rob, the current iterations comedies of comic book movies have run its course. They need to go in a serious direction now. The Batman of 2022 and the early DCEU. We have yet to have a massive shared cinematic universe of this iteration. The MCU comedy iterations are stale now. Um, I wanted to read that because I hadn't. That that could very well be be true. Listen, I hope. Um, with Free Enterprise, I hope our, our executive producer who paid for the movie has not let us have access to the film. And it's the what? only movie. I, yeah. And, and what I want to do is hopefully in 2024 for the 25th anniversary, I would like to do a 4K version and a restoration. I've done a bit of a recut of the movie. There's things I'd like to do to it to make it better because it's kind of a forgotten film. Um, and, you know, you saw that version that I showed you, that clip, I, I, uh, it's 239 to 1, so I changed the aspect ratio a bit. Mm -hmm. And I can do that. And I, that's what I originally wanted to do. That. So hopefully I'll be able to get it out. I mean, there's a couple of jokes that will get me canceled in that movie. Yeah. Some really – Some awesome really – a lot of jokes that will get you canceled. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Of, but I'm not going to change, though, you know, Rob, because legitim – Rob, legitimately – Free Enterprise is one of my favorite movies. I it, well, thank you it, very much. It like struck my ner my ner my nerd nerve um, when they go, "Where are we going?" T R U, and they had that whole conversation about Prince Zizor. I literally had a similar conversation with children about R two D two. Yeah, it, well, it, what the funny thing about it's just it, so weird. I mean, the funny thing about it's, Free Enterprise is like, you know, Edgar Wright did Spaced in the UK. Yeah. The TV series. Yeah. And, and then, of course, everyone told me Big Bang Theory. It was really, I'll tell you another funny story, a cautionary tale. So after Free Enterprise came out, um, it won a lot of awards. And for, uh, I went to a lot of meetings. And I, I've told this story before on streaming, but this this will this will because people have always said to me, what's really what what's really funny to me is, like, uh, for me, Free Enterprise, which I directed twenty five years ago, 
making a movie for my childhood idol was a dream come true. Like, I mean, that was it. And I, I was too much of a fanboy to concentrate. Like, I got to, I had, I've had so much fun in my career, whether it was going to work on Lord of the Rings in New Zealand or Chronicles of Narnia or the X Men movies with Brian and. And I've had so much fun that I have absolutely no regrets. Would I have liked to have made 10 movies? Sure. But this one movie allowed me to, it was, it was, I couldn't have imagined. My dad's in Free Enterprise. He plays a bartender with, does a scene with Shatner. And my father, to hear my father, my father wrote me a letter after he was there all day. We were in a club for 15 hours and shot this scene and my dad's in the movie. And he said, I could not he said to me i could not be I, I think i'm the most proud father in the world to see not only that you made this happen with your because he'd watched me watch william shatner since mm-hmm. i was five he goes the way you treated the crew the way you ran the set you know he was like you're so humble and you were having so much fun and everybody was laughing and you know you had to set the tone and there was a hundred extras because we we're in a club and uh he's like i couldn't believe it and my, because my dad, when I told him, "Hey, come to L.A. and be in this movie," he thought I was going to shoot some Super Eight thing like I did when I was a little kid. I go, "This is a little different than that, Dad." And for that alone, for, to have my father there, you know, who had taken me to see Phantasm and Dawn of the Dead and lied to get me into R-rated movies and all this stuff, to have him there, that that to me, what people have never understood was that was enough. You know, it was a, a an incredible. Um, it was an incredible experience. And to have my dad in a scene, I'll never forget this. I have this amazing picture when my father, because we, we cast him as this old bartender in a Hollywood club, which made no sense at all, but I thought it was hilarious that we did that. And he always had cigars, and he was always, my dad always smoked a cigar, always. He always had a cigar on his lower lip his entire life. I don't think he slept with a cigar. I mean, he probably did. I don't know. <laughs> but he would go he would go to the store, and he'd smoke his cigars, and he'd put his cigars inside the window, the the uh, uh, windshield wipers on his car. He would just sit it there and let it burn on the windshield wiper of his car and jam it in there. And then when he'd come back from whatever store he was in, he'd keep smoking. And that was my dad. And he was smoking in the movie. I said, Dad, you have to smoke in the movie. And it was still when you could smoke in L.A. And my, and Shatter goes, hey, my dad's name was Richard Dick. Shatter's like, Dick, uh, you got three cigars there. Can I can I smoke one of your cigars? My dad, my dad's like Mr. Shatner. Oh, Bill, 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 Bill. Of course you can. My dad gave William Shatner one of his cigars, and I have a photograph, a big that was taken by our still photographer, a huge photograph of my dad lighting William Shatner's cigar. Oh my god! And it is nice. I, when I was standing there watching this, I'm like, you, cool. you know what? If if nothing else happened to me in my life. That singular moment, watching my father give one of his cigars to William Shatner. And by the way, in the movie, in the scene in the movie, you can see it on, on I think it's on YouTube, he's smoking my dad's cigars. Like, like mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't going to, because smoking in a movie is a nightmare because every time you do a yeah. take, it burns, <clears throat> and so it's a nightmare. The, the smoke's all over the place. It messes up the shots. Yeah, and continuity with how people, and I said, I don't fucking care. I'll figure it out. I'm the editor of the movie too, so I'll figure it out. And and Shatner, we didn't leave it lit the whole time, but Shatner was it was amazing. I mean, the whole the whole thing so so what was really funny was there's been a contentment. There's one section in my life where I can say like if I never I produced movies, but I haven't directed again and I've edited movies. Um but that that whole experience was a joyous one. And it was it was in. It was so insane. The whole experience was so insane. I can't even even getting him in the movie. Like I told you, it was so crazy that I I sit there and I tell people, I'm like, look, man, you can think up anything. I've tried to tell this to people. You can think up anything in the world. I don't care what it is. It isn't too crazy. If if, if like we had to have enough. Like I'd worked in Hollywood for ten years, so there has to be a bit of plausibility to it. But like we just thought that well William Shatner is going to be in our movie. Our childhood idol is going to be in our movie just cuz we thought he was cool. Uh but we did have at least enough modicum of talent to write a script. I mean there a lot of people think I've written the greatest script in the world. You still have to have an industry experience to understand the, whether you the, the script is is touching to 
well, as as a nerd guy, it's touching to me in certain senses. Um, but I, I really do think like it's it's just a flat out good story. Well, it, you it's, know, it's, it's a rom com, and it's a nerd com. It, it uh, it's funny because here's here's another tragedy about the movie is that New Line wanted to buy it, and this it would have come out. A couple of can you imagine to be in business with New Line and then a couple of years later they had Lord of the Rings come out? I would have had a great career. So you 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 have to take it where you you never know you never know where well, you, you you I've been well, cul de sacked for a long time. <laughs> well, well then, Rob, when you say you you could have a great career, but at the same time, I'm seeing you now. Yeah, and the thing is, I've I've had a great career. <laughs> And, and you, in my opinion, you have a great career. You made yeah. a movie which, for me, is like uh, is one of my favorite movies, and I I appreciate the hell out of that movie. And then I get to see you every week. <laughs> I get to watch you, and and I, now I I'm like that. talking to you, and and you're like a truck nerd, and I hear you talk, <laughs> and and yeah, well, you, even, you could have had this. Uh, uh, let me finish. This oh, sorry, because I want to. I'm gonna praise. Oh, well, praise. Thank you. And I know you. Yeah, I know you're humble, but I'm gonna praise. So, yeah, you could have had this great career, but you have a career now where I can see you, and I can see that you are totally happy where you are. And that's where I think is what makes what you're doing now so damn great. Well, that you know because what. I see what you do every week. I, I hear your passion, and this is you. This is yeah, what yeah. people like us want to hear from people like you. You have been in the industry, and you're like, this is what I love. When, when, when like, as an old Star Trek guy, Star Trek ended for me in 2005, and then we had a nice little resurgence when Picard 3 came out. And then I saw you. And I'm like, I'm living it again. I'm like, oh my God, Rob is speaking to me. I, well, I'm feeling it. Listen, and, I, and that's what I appreciate about you. I very much appreciate that. And, and th thank you for the kind words. I, uh, that means a lot. And it, I, I will say that I think that one of the byproducts of all of this, like all, everybody here, you know, right now, what YouTube has afforded fandom. Um, the communication we, you know, it used to be like you'd, you'd yell on AOL forums, uh, like when AOL mm -hmm. was big in the nineties, you know, Ron Moore, uh, who co-creator for all mankind, Battlestar Galactica, Outlander, obviously Star Trek, he began, DS9. um, uh, yeah, DS9, he, he, you have creators, the communities here and what we have, uh, with YouTube is a way to connect. I mean, we have a gentleman here who's sitting here who's on the the, the slope of Mount Vesuvius in Italy. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a guy in Hollywood, old man in Hawaii, who 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 is here. I got Scott Bartholomew. I got Jeff. You know, I got you. You're in Florida. With the technology that we completely take for granted, we're literally connected the world over instantaneously live. It's insane the amount yeah. of technology that we have available at our fingertips. And the thing is, we, it, 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 by design, I think, we have been programmed. And I, I really, I'm not some tinfoil conspiracy theorist. I'm just like, we have been programmed to hate. We have been programmed to. And I, when I say programmed, I'm, I mean analytics. It's not like the parallax view or something like that. But but these tools are being used by bad actors to manipulate society to push uh, people in the way uh, push people in the way they these people want them to go. And it's it's unfortunate it's because engineering. The, yeah, it is. And at the end of the day, it's only mm -hmm. about it's only about money. You know, when it comes down to it, it's yeah. only about money. Which what what does money bring you? Luxury. That's it. I mean, we could be going to the stars, and any Star Trek fan, any imagination connoisseur, what I think that anybody who watches this channel or who likes these things, if we were given an opportunity to go to Mars, 
Like in For All Mankind, you know, you have Dev. He's like, I want to go to Mars. You know, he's a rich guy, of course, but he 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 wants to go to Mars because it's a new planet and there's nothing more mm-hmm. significant than he can do than to go be king of Mars or whatever. Whatever he wants to do. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We'll see. But, um, you know, you, you want to do these things. We want to progress. And I think we have been taken back our, our America especially we have been uh dismantled by i think foreign bad actors they have fomented hatred between uh people that should normally uh like each other i'll tell you a, a, a funny thing this this past year one of the things that happened to me in 2023 was my car i have a prius and uh the it doesn't have a, a spare tire and so my tire blew out because there was some nail in the road close to my house. So I'm just sitting there calling roadside assistance. F- like five people stopped in my neighborhood. So I said, hey, man, you need some help? They were men, women, old, young, different colors. F- different people stopped, and all of them were very sincere. What can I do for you? Can I help you? Do you need some help? I'm like, no, no, I got roadside assistance. I, w- I didn't have my blinkers on. Just five people randomly, maybe six people, randomly stopped and asked if I needed help. That's America. Mm -hmm. That's America. America, the America that I believe in and the America that all imagination connoisseurs want to know exists. And I think it does exist. You You can't blow us up. You can't defeat us militarily. We have two, uh, two oceans on either side. What you can do is foment dissent distrust and hatred within our culture but at the end of the day i really believe that the average american if you walk down the street and you see your neighbors hanging a a gutter or painting the house you walk by most people will be like hey man you need help you need a hand i honestly believe that about americans because that has been my experience for the last 56 years if you're walking down the street and you see the like a woman in front of you suddenly fall to the ground. What do you do? Do you help them up? I think most people would. That's that's what I'm saying. For I sure, I think that's what Rob's saying. You help people. Yeah, and and I think yeah, I, mean, I think that we don't go. Oh, I'm sorry. Who did you vote for? Before I help you? No, no. You go. Do you need help? That's what we are. Yeah. That, that's and, and and honestly, I'm gonna go. I'm going to go truck. Um, that's what truck is. Well, now, okay. I, no, go, w- can I, can I, I, <laughs> I must go drain the main vein. Okay. Can, can <laughs> I, can I lead you guys? I'm going to, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give the floor. Us unsupervised. I'm going to leave you unsupervised. Please don't do anything to get me demonetized. We I'm will gonna, not say any naughty words. Okay. Okay. You promise? Don't. Uh, yeah, I, I won't. I, I won't grab my I, tissue box either. Don't George okay. Carlin me. <laughs> we, we are not I, Jeffrey Tubin. Oh, we will not what Jeffrey Tubin this. I think that's the default setting for most people. Yeah. As long as their needs are taken care of, what happens today, and this is true of a lot of situations, basically over history, is you get larger forces basically convincing people that other people are less than human. You treat them yeah. as others, okay? It's yeah. the, the moment you start to you feast to see somebody else just just like you, that's when the problem starts. When you see them as, I'm, I guess the word is othering now. Yeah, exactly, that's that um, the exact word, othering, othering, as opposed to like, like or somebody you can't yeah. talk to like this, okay? Like, so I don't know how old everyone is here. Um, I'm going to guess. What's that? I just turned 64. Okay. Jeff? I, I just you turned 37. So I said I was okay. like like 13, 14 years younger than you. Okay. So, um, Scott, no offense. I'm going to think you're about 60. 59. Good, good 59? guess. 59? Okay. Close. <laughs> Bix, how old are you? No offense. Around about? Uh, Elder Gen Z. Well into 56 chapters uh, of this lifetime. Okay. I will be 51 in two weeks. So um, I think generally we have a Gen X population in the stream right now. 
Um, Jeff is a little younger. Um, I'm millennial. Yeah, you're millennial, but um, you haven't called us any names yet. You haven't said uh, my pronouns demand them. So uh, I'm thinking you're okay right now. Um, or I'm I, I really so tired. Think, I could care less what people's pronouns are right now. <laughs> no one, honestly, no one cares what people's pronouns are. It, you know what? If you have to name people's pronouns, that means you have to wear something on your chest. And guess what? That was not a good thing back in the 1930s. Yeah. We don't I, do that. We don't, don't do that. Problem. I don't have a problem with pronouns. I just think that there's so much more important stuff for the people who basically want to be addressed a certain way. It's like you still got as much progress yep. that we've made. You've got you know, really important things about how LGBT, LG, LGBTQ people plus people are actually I, still I just treated. go alphabet community okay. it's yeah, easier alphabet, okay. for me yeah, to yeah. say alphabet community yeah, it's like we've so got serious inequality problems with those folks and how you yeah know, how they're treated. And, and you know what i i completely agree there well, are definitely like some inequality bad. issues definitely some inequality issues but like if someone i know <laughs> is uh oh i'm is, back are, am i in trouble now no no i Not just yet. uh no i just rubbed one out but uh, you, oh no! Oh. And we mentioned and with we, a bunch of we, dudes. We cannot believe how many uh, no, times I don't judge the N word. It was so weird. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> it was so I'm awkward. To keep myself awake here. You were talking nincompoop, right? <laughs> no, but 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 you know what I find so strange is the the acrimony that people have. On every level. And what I see it is, is a fundamental lack of respect for other yes. people. And I think yes. it begins, like, when I was in school, like you guys, we would never talk back to a teacher. Oh, my God, no. You would never. Oh, you no, would no, no. Never say. Nowadays, you have teachers wanting to quit uh, the profession of teaching because they are so, I mean, they're victims of violence. They're victims of like my teachers were sacrosanct. Yes. I never said anything bad to a teacher. And, and and you know what? I never knew anything about my teacher. I thought like the Nothing. teachers lived in the schools. I had no idea the teachers had a life outside. So why would I care about whoever my teacher was married to? I don't need to know that. No, I just it, need my teacher to teach me math, teach me reading, teach me French, whatever. That's all I need to know from my teacher. Yeah, it, well, well, it's it's that's another thing that I think a weird, you know, th this idea that everybody wants to inject themselves now into it's the same. We're seeing it from a storytelling perspective, but but I think like I I feel the the same way. Like I had a I had a teacher, um, a great teacher that I had both in my school system went from two junior high schools to a middle school and then everybody went up to um the high school and and i had a teacher in the ninth grade because i was the last ninth grade class later was my i was terrible in math and later in my um senior see i had him for a senior math teacher like algebra and trigonometry and stuff and 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 i finally got a math tutor and figured it all out so i math became easy to me and that teacher and i became great friends he and i became great friends my senior year in high school and he was like he would say to me you know i'm i'm so proud of you um you've come so far since ninth grade you know you've really and and i had a over a hundred percent average because i always ask uh, uh, answer the bonus questions and he loved horse racing and my dad loved horse racing and and my uh brother edited a horse racing magazine so horse racing was like religion in my family along with golf i did not know that this teacher was gay he died of AIDS. Oh, I got the same story. Go, go, go. And and it never it never came up. He it never occurred to me. But he was a teacher that I wanted to please, and that he was so encouraging, seeing how much I had progressed in math. And and my senior year, um, his name was Mr. Cullen, by the way. And he was a wonderful guy. And him and my dad kind of became friends on the horse racing tip and my dad uh he he went to the kentucky derby and got my dad a kentucky derby poster 
that my dad loved and, and framed and hung on his wall. And um, he was a, a teacher that was very smart, very kind, very nice to me. I didn't know fuck all about his personal life. I found out yeah. later. You know, it I wasn't... I had a similar, one, similar thing in high it... school. I had a teacher, uh, Mr. Saito, who was an English teacher. And I'm pretty sure he was gay. And I didn't care uh, because he was the person who introduced me to poetry. Because wow, he would okay. have us, he said, you want, you want to do poetry this quarter. What you do is you bring in lyrics to pop songs and we will analyze them. Wow. Oh. And so we went over Great Seal and I Am a Rock and somebody bought it, Lady Marmalade, of course, you know, stuff like that. And it was awesome. <laughs> okay. He basically, you know, he could really connect with the students that way and get them interested in what was going on. So uh, I want to jump in real quick with uh, the same same theme. Um my, the most influential teacher to me was my junior year, senior year high school history teacher, who uh, was name was Mary Lou Brewer, and she's passed. Um, and uh, at the time, I said, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. Well, like most people who say they're going to be a doctor, they end up being lawyers. Um and she would say to me, she was like, you don't know it. You're going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and and what I loved about her was, and she was very liberal. She was very liberal. And I was always a right-wing guy. I was a very conservative type guy. And she didn't care. She goes, just argue your points. Just argue it. Just just say it. And, and like, I'm talking now. I'm talking now. When I was a kid, I didn't talk. I was a quiet kid. I was shy. Like, come on. No, look. no one believes that. Come on. No, no when I was a kid, I didn't talk shit. I'm a lawyer who's tried over 50 cases to, to jury verdict. I've convicted um, P people um, to prison for life. I'm very proud of doing that. Um, I never thought I would do that. Um, but she goes, you don't know it. You're going to be a lawyer. And when in, in college, I'd go back home and I'd go back and see her. And I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. And she goes, I'm so happy. Well, that, I'm so yeah, happy. I, I have and, to say, and she knew who I was. She saw it. She saw it in me. I didn't see it. She did. Yeah. And, you know, and, but those, those teachers now, I mean, the teachers we had, I watched teachers on TikTok or social media talking about themselves. Yeah. I'm making my class from this and all that. And I'm like, what the fuck? No. Like, and it was because the the teachers that, that what you're saying, the the distance that teachers kept between the students allowed them. I mean, I, I thought of all of my teachers as fucking Gandalf. You know, they were all like the Astari. Mm -hmm. They were all wizards that had great knowledge to impart. And, and I didn't, want like uh, you know what was freaked me out when i was a kid i don't know if this is the same with you guys there were times there was one time um when you live in seattle you like vacation people go to hawaii because it's close you can't like i never went to new york when i was a kid i was wanting to go to new york but hawaii was it's it seems like a it's not a flex to say that but um i i ran into my first grade teacher when i was in the third grade in Hawaii over Christmas break. Hmm. And it was so freaky. And it was so bizarre. I'm like, you have a life outside of school. How do you live yes. outside of school? Like, this is, what are you doing here? You know, it was such a weird, and as I, a kid, I, and I, I'm like, I never, to see I, a teacher I, outside of school was like wrong. I, it was. I, you know, looking back, I, I knew that that teacher who pushed me to to realize what I was going to be a lawyer, I now look and I'm like, oh, she was gay. I but she never did any of that. She didn't say. She well, didn't it doesn't, it doesn't like, really. Just me and my partner. She's like, I'm here to teach you. It, it was her saying, I want to, I want to try to well because, make you be, think differently. Because the thing is, that has no bearing on whether she's a good teacher. Absolutely. And and I think Absolutely. one of the weird things that I've noticed about like people want to inject themselves, they want. It's very weird yes. to me, and it's it's younger people. 
You know, it's it's a it's a young. I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I think that it's weird that we're seeing teachers on social media saying, "I did this in my classroom today," and I'm like, "Why are? I mean, you haven't. Why are? But, and, and why but, is why are why is American education? Why are we look? Our national defense should be predicated on an intelligent, healthy population. That should be the number one thing. We need to have the smartest and healthiest people on the planet. America should. We don't. All all I want to know about my defense is how to kill the bad guys, not what um, do you think your pronouns are. I can't remember who said it. Somebody said something on the effect. It was one of the founding fathers about the, the, the baseline or whatever of a, a functioning democracy is a well-informed electorate. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, but, but here, like here's the thing. I think that everybody, I'm a big fan of treating people the way they want to be treated. Respectfully. Yeah, of course. But here's the Respect. thing. Why is it that we now live in a world where, like when I was a kid, my dad would tell me that the world, his the whole thing was, he'd say, Bobby, the world's going to beat your ass, beat you up. He would never, my dad said not a bad word to say about anybody. But he would say that the world is a tough place and you can never expect the world to treat you well. The world is going to treat you badly. And you need to be strong when you go out into the world. Now, everybody expects the world to bend to their will, their whims. Yes. Like you, and, yeah. and, and I'm like, that's a weird, it's such a weird, it's an inversion of what I was taught. Well, I'm just an old middle-aged white man. And now I'm, a, I'm Jewish too, so I'm doubly awful. And it's, um, especially since in the last three months. But it's a weird, yeah. what, I, what I don't understand is, as an imagination connoisseur, People are, are, should be sacred, all human beings. The cosmic infinitude of the universe. I've always said this on the show. Not in this day and time, Rob. I, I know. But every single human being, what Alan Moore wrote in The Watchmen, the reason Dr. Oh. Manhattan decided to save the world was he said, mm -hmm. the thermodynamic miracle of life. Every single human being is a unique happenstance, a confluence of unbelievable uh, the, the the fate in terms, so every single human being should absolutely be treated with amazement. What is what is the what is the greatest? What is the product of Earth? What is the thing that this planet, where it exists in the Goldilocks zone, what is the greatest export of Earth? The most precious, not minerals, us. It's us. And we don't recognize that. We don't um, recognize that human beings are the most precious resource in the universe. And uh, we are so quick to want to destroy one another. And it's, I mean, I guess that's the paradox. Yeah. Um, I, I was, I remember talking to one of my buddies on a stream, actually, it was after the stream. And we're talking about, like, you know, God and everything. And I'm like, do you guys realize that, like, um, anytime we create something, we're being godly? Yeah, there's uh, that, it, uh, that. The, the whole idea that we can create something. There's something in everyone that creates something that's that's unique and magical. And you, you, can, you can say, I don't, dis I don't agree with it. But respect that someone created something from themselves. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that's what I would hope for the new. Year. Let me ask you guys. Let me start with you, Bix, being in Italy. Uh, let me ask you from a from a an expat perspective. What would you like to see happen in twenty twenty four? If 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 if, if, if it, maybe something personal. Something on a grander scale, but but if you could have something happen, a positive thing, what would you like to see happen in the new year? Wow, that's a big question. I know. I'm sorry. I'm putting uh, on this. I'm putting on the spot. Okay. But you're a man in Italy now. That's okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Maybe it's something this? in your own community. First contact. No, I'm talking on a global scale. You and I. First contact. 
which gives which gives all of humanity a bit of humility that it really needs. My God, uh, here, here, sir. I can't say uh, I, I I can't agree with you more. Um, Jeff, I would ask you the same thing. I haven't read your script yet. But beyond that, um, if if something had happened in the new year, what would be something that you would like to see occur? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 No. I. I you know. It, it was. Could it be like a pipe dream or something? It can, yeah. It can be any. It doesn't matter. Yeah. There's no wrong answers. By the way, yeah. Wolverine snicked became a member of the channel. Uh, oh, Wolverine came in. Wolverine snicked. Yeah, Wolverine's here. Oh, yeah, I know him. He's a good dude. Okay, he's here. Uh, I, I'm gonna. By the way, I'm gonna repost this link to get into the stream. I don't know. I think only eight people can get in. I. I. To be honest, I don't know. I haven't had this many people for this long. So here's the link. You got there nine. it is. You got nine right now. Oh no! I'm sorry. That's duplicate. Never mind. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. Oh, are you seeing? Yeah, you're seeing duplicate. You're seeing yeah, the four, uh, four yeah. On the bottom here. So, by the way, Five. I just posted the link. This is kind of fun having randos. It's good. You guys are great. So, so Jeff, there's no wrong answers. Just anything off the top of your head, like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I guess you know. Get my script actually made into a movie. You know, with, you know. With me retaining some semblance of control, not just, not just sell it off. I mean, I guess. I mean, I'm not in a position to even sell a script, but even then, I don't just want to <laughs> sell it off. No, that uh, that's a good thing. I mean, you've you've put the work in. You know, you've done something. Why not? Yeah. Um, I, I like that. So then, I would take it. Uh, I would take it to you, Scott. I would like to. Um hear news or an announcement that they're going to make a movie adaptation of the Marvel comic Kill Raven oh, dude. in the 70s. Oh, I would love to see Kill Raven made into a comic. Warrior of the world. I loved Kill Raven. Yeah, I was a badass. Kill Raven, Deathlock. Um, you know, I loved... A kill but you know what killed it? I don't know if they could incorporate. I don't know how they would incorporate that in the MCU. But that's a great, it's a great thing. Now, some old guy in Hollywood. What about yep. you? Uh, uh, I see. I keep saying Hollywood. It's, it's Hawaii. Fine. It's fine. No, no. Uh, so last year, last year, I finally finished an adapted screenplay I've been working on for way too long. So I have another one I want to do. It's actually original. I want to try and get that done this year. But in, this, in the meantime. I have been writing like crazy the last two and a half months. I want to start self-publishing. Well done. To start, so. By the way, can I just say that one of the great things about the world we live in is you can do that. You can do that now, yeah. You can do that. You have a worldwide audience. Now, I'm not saying you still have to promote it. You have to get it out there. There's a lot of work involved in promoting your own work. But, you know, everybody wants to suddenly be a New York Times bestseller author. But even the people that are New York Times bestseller authors don't get... No one knows who they are, you know. I'm doing research. There's, you know, how you do things on Kindle, desktop publishing, and yeah, picking stuff out and getting the right niche and, and understanding the keywords and all that kind of stuff and formatting and all that kind of you know, stuff. So, Hundred yeah. percent. I think that's a great. So, so what else? I mean, is that it? I got a ton of other stuff, but that's pipe dream stuff in terms of. Come on, like, what's what know, are your pipe dreams? Well, what's going on in the Middle East, which I could really get into, but I don't want to. <laughs> um, yeah, it's Actually, terrible. Getting this, getting this country back on its feet because I have some very specific ideas about how the budget and the debt and the economy works, and we could, I believe, we could fix everything if we understood how it actually worked. But most people don't. Um, oh God, I don't know. I appreciate that, Ooh. Jeff. Up, yeah. Well, I, I guess I just want to kind of like. Uh, so it, you kind of uh, some old guy, whatever your real name is, kind of give me an idea. I want to find some inspiration to. Perhaps... Oh shit! You brought in Wolverine. Yeah. Okay, guys, we got we got Cyan and uh, Wolverine. I knew Wolverine. Snick. Yeah. But keep going. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. I have yeah, to no, I have to fine. rejigger our our panel, which is getting bigger. 
I might. Oh, yeah, I, honestly, I <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna be able to hold on for much longer. That's no worries, uh, but, but I, have no, I have no excuse because Brad's two hours ahead of me. No, no, you can't. There's no, there's no, there's no, yeah, there, yeah. you can't. Don't think of it that way. We're happy to have you. You know, it's yeah. all good. But yeah, I, I, I feel like I kind of want to, you know, find inspiration to perhaps write more than just the one thing I've done so far. I love that. Yeah. Well, mine was kind of accidental. I'm not going to go into it. It's just that certain things happen with my mental health and whatnot. When I made some adjustments, all of a sudden it's like the floodgates open. Well, yeah, so that, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. hopefully, yeah. I have. You got to find. You got to find what it is that drives you. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, the, the inspiration comes along like it did for this one thing. So. Well, that's amazing. I mean, uh, yeah. I I think creativity is. Um, is really the currency, not just authenticity, but it's the currency of our modern age. If you can make, especially with AI, if you can create something that's uniquely yours, uh, that's going to be something that is definitely going to be valued. Hey, Rob. Yes. Um, I'm going to cut out of here so I can make room for uh, somebody else to join in, but I had a couple of questions just real quick. Uh, Are you sure you want to cut out? Because I, I, I got room. No, I'm good. I'm good. Um, one question for Brad. Uh, what part of Carolina are you from, man? Oh, I am not from Carolina. I uh, was born in Pittsburgh. I grew okay. up in Massachusetts, but I graduated from Duke University. Okay, We won't gotcha. hold that against you, though. No, oh, I'm sorry. I got, I'm I'm our, we got five national championships behind us, <laughs> and I was there for two of them. Uh but uh, at one point, I was a very smart person, and then I became a lawyer. Um, okay. And then I became not so smart because I became a lawyer. Um, <laughs> and now I'm a Floridian because oh, gotcha. uh, the weather is much better down here than Massachusetts when I was 16 and shoveling a driveway at 5 a.m. <laughs> uh, I hear so, you. I hear you. The so reason I ask because of your handle there. Duke uh, Devil. Oh right, right. So Scott, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, I'm going to cut out of here. And no one worries. More question, As one am more I. I have, Rob. I. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, Bix, um, just hearing that you're from Naples just brought back stories because uh, 30 years ago my submarine pulled into Naples for a port visit, and I remember getting the walking sticks and walking up Mount Vesuvius to the beer cart at the top of the summit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my vacation next year. Beer. Oh, it was great. It was great. It was South like a Italy. two and a half, three hour hike up to the top. Southern Italy is my vacation next year for my wife's 50th birthday. Oh, nice. You'll love it. So Jeff, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go, right? Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, I'm I'm ready to crash. All right, thank Jeff, you, I'll let guys. you go. Thank you so much. And Love Scott, talking to you all. Thanks for being here. Now, who wants to? Who wants to go? Who, thank so you. I appreciate it. All right, man. So now we've got new people. Uh, I want to bring on. Is it Cyan? Do I get S S Cyan? Cyan and Wolverine Snicked join us. So, gentlemen, welcome to the show. There's a troublemaker, Wolverine Snick. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I hope not. Uh, welcome, welcome to uh, Rob Observations, episode number nine hundred and fifteen. Love to be here. What's going on, y'all? I'm honored. This is awesome. So, uh, let me, let me, let me, uh, Wolverine. Let me make you a little bigger. Uh, uh, Cyan, uh, you look good. Let me ask you this: Where are you guys coming from, Cyan? Where are you coming from? Southern California, Los Angeles. Oh, so we're we're in the same neck of the woods. Yep, exactly. We uh, are. and Wolverine Snicked, where do you hail from, sir? You know, I don't just want you to reveal. Of, uh, yeah, just a shy of uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, nice. Okay, very cool. Very cool, uh, gentlemen. I would ask of you. Uh, since this, I have to ask about uh, comic book movies and things. We talked about Marvel. Let me let me start with Wolverine, because you know you have a movie coming out in twenty twenty four. Wolves, come on, Logan. Um, first of all, let me ask you: How do you feel about the state of comic book films? Shit. <laughs> 
Well, could that be shit that I've Damn. asked you that question? Or are you speaking <laughs> no. to the actual quality of the comic book cinema? Yes. Well, it could yes. be good. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but it's not good because the majority of us we've seen who's behind pushing these movies are shit. Well, they, now, don't hey- care, they don't care about the quality. They don't care about who's consuming the quality. Uh, well, they don't. Basically, it's like this. Let me, let me put it like this. I know this might be gone. From, all right, so I have no. a comic book store who I go to routinely, and I actually sell toys at this comic book store. And we routinely will see parents coming in, buying s- stuff for their children, comic books, and going, hey, are these comic books safe? Ah. And we'll look, we'll look at these comic books and we're going, oh, which ones? We'll look at them. Yes, that's good. That's good. Oh no, 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 no. That's not good because they're they're going to push some stuff on you, you know. So yeah, it's it, dude. It's it's so fucked up. Excuse my French. I apologize. No, no, you can say that. No, Sai and I would ask you the same question. Um, yeah. I, knowing knowing other than you live in Southern California, how do you feel? Are you a comic book movie fan? Are you an imagination connoisseur? What what's your jam? And how do you feel about the state of comic book cinema? Definitely a comic book movie fan. Definitely imagination connoisseur. Um, sci-fi is probably like my jam for sure. But nice. I would say, I mean, I kind of feel the same as Wolverine over here. It's not. I don't feel great. I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore and like kind of hard to not see all the hate that's going around for a lot of these movies. It's unfortunate, you know, because I, I obviously miss the times of like Infinity War, Endgame, like when we're all just hyped to see a new movie. Dude, I mean, I, 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 I trailer. I, I, I got to tell you, mm-hmm. I mean, I, when I saw Infinity War, I, I honestly believe, and, and I, I'm an easy lay when it comes to these movies, but I think Infinity War and Endgame, and I don't want to hear the nitpicks, the, the scope and breadth of those two films and the way they were, they paid off what was led up. Mm-hmm. I was so satisfied. I love watching those two movies. I sit down and they're so well done. There's, they are so wild. Even if you're like oh, I don't like the way Professor Hulk is. Okay, I, okay, I get it. You might have different little Fair. nitpicks, but those two movies are so fucking wildly entertaining. When you get to the end of Infinity War, and 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 when the snap happens. Even though I've seen that movie like 25 fucking times, I'm like, maybe this time he's not going to snap. Maybe this time Thor's going to get the headshot. I mean, that nope. that the, it was so um, well done. It was so well right done. Right there with you. And, so, and when you so, see them in the theater with a with a with a crowd, oh it's my god, amazing. So, dude, oh wait, wait, let me just. I was sitting next to John Schnapp. And when they go to Vormir for the first time, oh, God. and when you hear, I know it's not Hugo Weaving's voice, but it's a great sound like, yeah, John yeah. Schnepp and I, were, we, when we heard Red Skull, he and I looked at each other, we, I, I almost wanted to embrace my brother. Like, we were looking at each other, oh my fucking God! <laughs> like, ah, what's going on? It was like the greatest, and Amy Dallin was there, and she's like, what's going on with you guys? But it was so, it was like... I can't tell you how wildly and well, yeah, you know, because you were too. That movie fucking ruled. So, so when I saw Infinity War, and I, I I'm pretty certain Wolverine has heard me say this before because we we streamed together. Um, um, I saw Infinity War, and it was coming out um, the day before I had to be in Miami. For mediation, I'm a lawyer, um, so I had to be in Miami for mediation at 9 a.m. So that meant, because I'm driving from the Tampa Bay area down to Miami, I had to go down the night before. I booked a hotel next to a theater (laughs) where Infinity War was going to play. So I I got my ticket. I went to... uh, like Brio or uh, Olive Garden, whatever the hell was near, and I had a nice little appetizer dinner. I saw Infinity War, and I'm like, 
oh my fucking god, what the hell was that? And I'm walking out, and oh shit, um, these twenty year old kids. Oh my god, I can't believe we have to wait a year to to see what happens. <laughs> and I looked at them, and mind you, I'm a fit. I'm now a fifty year old man, right? I'm fifty years old. You know what that means? I saw Star Wars in 77. Okay? Oh, I know. So, so I looked at them and I go, you fucking motherfuckers. I had to wait three years to find out. That's why they hate the lawyers now, though. Just so you know. Was Darth Vader. And I'm like, go fuck yourselves. No, I'm but. Like, I'm sorry. I'm like. You had no idea it was like waiting three years to find out if Luke's father was actually Darth Vader. And now you have to wait a year? Go to hell. What the hell? Oh, but it was, I mean, it was, I mean, oh, man. Uh, but no, but the, Stark. the experience of the movie, the experience of the movie was majestic. Because here's the thing. Everyone walked out and like, oh, my God, what happened? When and that was like the Empire feeling. Like, I was 10 years old. And I walked out of Empire. I go, what the hell was that? What's going on? Well, and also, what yeah, was man. it was earned? That was the twenty. That was the twenty first yes. movie of the Infinity Saga. So you and, had, and, and it was all Rob, everyone was earned. It was all Rob, earned. That's 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 what's missing now. This stuff is not earned. No, well, nothing. This is uh, not uh, earned. No. Uh, well, that requires. I mean, and and uh, Marcus and McFeely, who wrote, <laughs> I want to believe they wrote. Uh, Winter Soldier, Civil War, uh, Infinity War, and Endgame. They also wrote uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, that I worked on. You know, it was a that was another. That's a whole other Hollywood story that went <laughs> south for me. But for the most part, you know, I, I I we spent my team spent fourteen months in country in in New Zealand after working on Lord of the Rings on on uh, Chronicles of Narnia, and Marcus wow. and Mafili wrote those four films and they're they're terrific i i just don't understand I'm like where are they where are marcus and mcfeely like you guys wrote four movies why you know like look uh, let me point out i just want to say before i say this i do not dislike doomcock doomcock is a fictional character and when i was mad he's at fun yeah, he, uh, totally fun, and and the funny thing is, I I, I I don't think I did a good job selling my like people were like, you're gonna dox Doomcock, and I'd say like I don't know, he lives in the center of the world, I don't know even where to get <laughs> get to him, and and and, and it, I, I thought people were getting my deadpan humor of like Doomcock's a fictional character. Yeah, I'm not gonna like dox. I don't know where he lives. I don't know who who Doomcock is, and people just. When I was mad at Doomcock for not watching Picard season three, I'm like, do I think Picard season three is? I love Picard season three. I love it. I do I, too. You and know, I, and and I, I think I cried. Bob, yeah, I dude, cried multiple times. Episode five when Ro Laren. I mean, look, there's so much the, good uh, when the when the sh when the Enterprise D showed up. I fucking cried, dude. How about yeah. the fact I right now? Over how about that? the fact that you have, have you no know, problem? Talk about uh, 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 representation. You had two bad bitches. You had the Borg Queen wronged by the Federation. You had Vatic, who was the changeling who was tortured by the Federation. This utopian, I and because look, the, the Federation had no choice. The Federation didn't like want to deal with the Dominion War. There was so much. So who's back to DS Nine? This was, is this uh, there, is why DS Nine is the. There was my, so yeah, much good DS9 stuff. DS Nine is the best Star Trek ever. I uh, will argue anyone. Uh, uh, DS Nine is uh, the best Star Trek. Wait a minute! I have my finger on the button. <laughs> Best Star Trek ever. You be careful, son. You better answer this. I have a funny story. You cannot oh. say ever because there's only one Star Trek. Everything else no, is derivative. My, my, my funny okay, story. Okay. Is about, fair about point. How fair point. Cock, fair my fair funny point. story is about fair how point. Cock brought wait, me wait. to all of you guys. Fair point. Fair. Okay. We're so going to get to no, Cyan no, I next. Have, I have to say this, though, because you brought yeah. Doomcock. No. So I was Let I was deployed in Africa, and we had very little 
internet in stern lockdown. So it's March 2020. Where in Africa so, were you? Were you stationed? Uh, Camp, Camp Lemonade. So where, where was that? Uh, can you say? Camp Lemonade. Oh, uh, Camp Lemonade is the Horn of Africa. Oh, oh okay, right, right, okay, right, right. Djibouti, like in Djibouti, not, not in your booty, but in Djibouti. <laughs> so I, we're, we've both I'm are okay. Like, so I'm losing my mind. Can't I don't have access to anything. And so I'm like, well, fuck. Let me get on YouTube. I find this guy Doomcock, and I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm just following through videos on YouTube, and I find this guy Gary on Nerdrotic. I'm like, okay, cool, cool. And my my retarded brain, apologize. Back then, three years ago, I thought they were the same guy. Don't ask. <laughs> okay, I understand. No, it's okay. I'm going through a lot of shit because, anyway, it's a job. So I'm following. So I'm getting connected. You know, YouTube how it works. So it's sending me out to who's connected to to Dormcock, who's to connect to Nadrotic, and I'm getting like awakened to a lot of shit I didn't <laughs> fucking realize because <laughs> I've never been on YouTube. And I'm like, it's like being oh. part of QAnon, but about superheroes. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> then that that's the end. All we can say, we can stop it right there. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm here to serve. Woo. <laughs> but so so, okay, Cyan. Let me ask you. I'll ask the same question to you. Um, I don't even know what the question is anymore. <laughs> I think you do because you followed me. I no, 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 not you. I was just saying that, that like, the whole idea about YouTube, s s uh, comic book films and all that, um, where do you stand on it all? Like, we, we, I don't know anything about you. I don't know who you are, what you do, but, but like, let, let's begin with Infinity got, War. I, I, so there you go. I got you. So I absolutely agree with you about YouTube and how much it's given us because I can tell you right now, I am someone that became a fan of like movies and Marvel movies in general or comic mm. book movies in general through YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff because I actually you guys are gonna be like think I'm crazy for this but I actually didn't get to see Infinity War or any of the movies from Iron Man all the way to Infinity War in theaters because to be honest I wasn't like into movies at that time of course and, and by, the, by, by the way don't ever apologize for that you well, know, I, you know, I didn't because mean to apologize, but more so. No, like, no but what I'm saying is, but but but, but, but there's a lot of people. I mean, I think that what's really cool about what you just said is we just assume that every. I mean, I went to school with a lot of people in the '80s that weren't into movies at all. That would I was the only kid with a VCR, and I bring them over. I'm like, they're like, I, yeah, I'm a sports guy, so so. Not everybody is in the movie, so don't apologize for that. I, I can add more context to that because I, I had it's not like in game or because the, the first MCU movie I saw in theaters outside of Iron Man one and two was Endgame. I, I started getting back into it at Endgame. I, I grew up. Wow. So I'm, I'm 26 or 25. I'm about to turn 26 in a couple weeks. Oh my I God. grew up with the Tobey Maguire movies. Those are the movies that I grew up with. Yeah, I don't, so those are great movies. For me, for me I grew up like. I, I watched Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 2 and absolutely loved those. And then around high school, I kind of just dozed off and didn't really keep up with MCU at that point. It wasn't until Endgame came out where I realized, holy crap, like all that stuff was connected. They kept on going with Iron Man and like they made Avengers and all that. Holy crap. Right. And then before Endgame coming out, catching up with all the MCU, that's when I did my MCU catch up. And for me, experiencing Endgame was absolutely amazing. Like I loved that. But for me, it's really sad because I keep on wanting to get back to the hype of Infinity War so I can live that with y'all because so, I've always so, heard stories of that. So, Cyan, let me ask you this question. Yeah. Um, and, and this is what I think personally right now. Having seen... Now, you're coming in late. Mm -hmm. you're, you're 25, 26 years old. You're half my age. Um, like... I'm one of the older people right now. Um, I've seen it all since the 90s and 80s. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, would you be okay if you did not see any other MCU movies from this? If Hell would no. you be okay? Would you be okay if Endgame was the final chapter of the Hell MCU? No, I would not be okay. Hell really? No. 
And okay. Maybe that's not what you thought I was going to say, but... No, no, I, 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 game, like I, said, I have no expectations. I want to hear what you say. So, like I said, I, I grew up with the prequels and loved those. I saw the Tobey Maguire movies, loved those. I even saw the, the OG Fantastic Four movies um, with, like, Jessica Alba. I loved those. Yeah. Like, I grew, that's, like I said, that was my childhood. But getting into Endgame was when I really became the fan I am today because of YouTube and things like that. And what I'm trying to say is the reason I say hell no is because when Endgame came out, that's when the nerd brain started getting activated and, like, having all these theories and okay. Like, what's next? And all that. And have I, you read the know. comics? Wait, can I wait? Have you read in the comics? I've gotten into comics because of this. I wait. read them a little okay. bit when I was younger, but I've gotten back into it because of this. I I have okay. to can, let me just stop you and say I'm not going to say anything. No, what you ju- but what you just said I think is the most important thing that people forget to realize mm-hmm. is that everybody comes to this stuff at different times, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what we. What we are missing, like, for instance, for me, uh, I'll give you an example. James Bond. I was about to say exactly that. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I grew up, I mean, uh, my, my favorite things in life were Planet of the Apes, Star Trek, and James Bond. Because mm-hmm. I was a kid, Star Wars didn't exist yet. And, and I loved all that stuff, and, and there was no, I had no context other than what I was seeing. So one of the things that I think that a lot of fandom, especially on YouTube, forgets is that there's an entirely, every single day, there's a new person, a new brain being unlocked to nerddom you think? that is being unlocked mm-hmm. by whatever thing that they found. And you just, you just said it you very eloquently. It's 100% true. 100% and, true. And, and, a lot of us, especially older people that have YouTube channels, and we forget that, and I learned this with James Bond, everyone has, they came to James Bond, for, I'm like, how can you not like Sean Connery? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if you were born in 1990, and you're the first James Bond movie you saw when you were 11 in 2001, was Goldfinger? You'd be like, "What is this old fart? Mm-hmm. What the fuck is this bullshit? I hate this shit. I hate it because it's all part of it." Like Doctor Who. I mean, oh, my yeah. God, uh, Doctor Who's uh, perfect example, Rob. Perfect. Perfect. I, I mean, perfect. Cr- it, 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 what's interesting is like Doctor Who in America. First of all, nobody. I shouldn't say nobody. Nobody gave a fuck about Doctor Who in America. <clears throat> In 2005, True. when Christopher Eccleston, the ninth, the ninth Doctor, suddenly yes. uh, it, it was nobody cared when Paul McGann was the eighth Doctor and, no and the Master and Robert, uh, 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 you know, um, Eric Roberts was the Master. Nobody cared. Yeah, and, nobody cared. And they didn't even know who Doctor Who was, and and so what what was really interesting and and you look at all the the. Doctor Who's a really interesting because it's so quick. It's 2005 to 2023, and you've seen all the different uh, like iterations. And, and it's amazing to watch Russell T. Davies be a hero and a villain. And, yeah. And, and, oh, my God. Wow. And I'll, t- I'll tell you something. Russell T. Davies wrote, I think, one of the finest five hours of science fiction that I've seen in the, in the 21st century is, is Torchwood children of earth now oh my god i yes i had yes i had never oh watched my god i hadn't seen i'd seen captain jack i mean i'm straight but i'd fuck captain jack i mean i'm like come on uh <laughs> i i children I, of earth was <laughs> oh my god that was haunting oh uh, so some people told me wow. this so i bought the blu-ray set when it came out I go home. I was. I think I want to say I was working on the Star Trek doc, the Next Generation documentaries, and I. I'm like, okay, it was like twelve thirty or one. I put on uh, the first. I, I wanted to, like sample it. Like, what? How, what is it like? I don't know. I'd never seen. I'd seen yeah. Captain Jack on Doctor Who, but I hadn't seen Torchwood at all. So I put in the first episode. And it was like a fucking Tom Clancy political thriller. And I'm like, this yeah. shit is. I watched all five episodes till six in the morning, and like the last you, episode, you I the was Cyberwoman episode. I, I was fucking shattered, man. I mean, when torture, I got to when I got to end of torture, I, I I was like, this is one of the mo- first of all, it was devastating. 
It was it was and, and so it, good. And Russell T. And by the way, Euros Lynn, the director of that, the British yes. director. <laughs> where the fuck is he? Why isn't he directing uh, comic book movies? John Barrowman was fucking amazing. Oh my god! So for those people, even if you don't know Doctor Who, you don't know. They will tell you, Torchwood, Children of Earth, fucking rules. By the way, it, it by is, the way, it I, is honestly one of the most hard hitting. Doctor Who's. I love Doctor Who. I just want to apologize. I, I, I don't usually I, I, drink on these streams. You can kind of tell. That's fine. I'm, I, I'm totally drinking. No problem. Dude, you're good. Uh, We're all Tenet, old. Who gives a fuck? Tenet is but, my doctor. David so, Tennant's my doctor. But John but, Barrowman, when he played Captain Jack in Children of Earth, oh my god. Yeah, I mean well, that uh, man it, it, hit great. it out of the park. So it was amazing. So wait, wait. Now oh I'm, God. but now I'm curious about Cyan. So you came Walked to away. this. You came to this uh, relatively new. Very new. So, so w w what I would ask you, I'm always curious about this. So, what you entered into was a world full. There's a, an amazing mm -hmm. array yeah. of stuff that already existed. That you get to like go sample for the first time, all this deliciousness. Hundred percent. That's what I've been doing these past three years. But continue. What you were gonna say? Sorry. Oh no, I was just gonna say, what was that like for you, dude? Like, it was life changing. Let me tell you, it was life changing. Like, if you, I'll probably come. Like, maybe I'll be on a stream in the future again. But you, you, if you get to know me, I've been someone that like the growing up was really into sports, and it, like these past four years. Because of Endgame, because of movies that have come out since then, I've much more been into movies and movie making and just that industry as a whole. And it's been life changing. To answer your question directly, yeah. what has it been like? It's been life changing. It's literally changed the path of the course of my life. And so, and uh, okay, but can I, I, can I, I ask you, can, when you say it's changed the course of your life, why has it? What was it about this stuff that made your life change? It's a great question. And I, by the way, I, I ask it not, there's no wrong or right answer. I'm actually mm -hmm. genuinely curious because I see it as I call my audience imagination connoisseurs. I think when the imagination is sparked, when the yes. flame is ignited, it it, 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 it it makes a person see the possibility. So I'm curious. Now, so, uh, please. Here you go. I'll tell you. You might think I'm just saying this because I'm on the show. All right. No, but no, not at all. The, there's a there was a transition of me watching Endgame and having that nerd brain and like theorizing what's gonna happen in the future, No Way Home, oh my God, Toby's coming back, all this like crazy stuff. There was a transition from that to wait a minute, I think I like filmmaking as a whole, and it was honestly right. you and the John Campia show that made me to have that transition. Come on, just, I'm not kidding. I'm not just saying that because I'm on the show. No, no, I understand, but are the ones that really have made me realize, okay, you know what? Like, I think it's actually. The genre of filmmaking as a whole that I really am interested in. So, and you know what? If I'm being honest, I don't know exactly what it was that made that tide turn because I can't like pinpoint what movie it was. But you know what it really is is when I watched Endgame and then I had that realization of you know what I kind of want to watch more movies and like I've gotten much more interested in that. I've rewatched movies that I watched in high school that I liked but I wasn't like too appreciative of. Them. Like sure. Inside. So I remember I watched so, that in 2014 when it came out and I was like. That's cool. But I was in high school. Like, I had things in high school to worry about. I wasn't really tripping so, about movies. Like, that's cool. So, but I don't so, care. I got homework, too. You know, like. So, you Cyan. Right. I'm sorry. Um, hey, how, how old are you again? 25. Oh, Jesus I Christ. In two weeks. <laughs> okay. Freaking hell. Okay. So, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm an old guy. Don't be <laughs> sorry. Um, so no, but this is. Uh, this is uh, sorry. sorry no, no, this this is good because this is where. The old guys want to impart the wisdom to the younger generation. So, so when you're talking about watching Endgame, it, and it, it opens your mind to other shows, other movies. Beyond Endgame, what else are you interested in? Have you watched science fiction? Have you watched yeah. anything well, else that says, yeah, yeah, I want good, to watch beyond that? That's important context to add. Before you go, Rob, is, is yes. Like, I know I just said Marvel movies as a whole. No, but, but yeah, don't but, get me wrong. I grew up watching movies like Home Alone. Adam Sandler was one of my favorite actors growing up. Chris Farley and, like, Black Sheep. Movies like that. I, I love movies growing up. But like I said, there was that gap in high school where I just 
kind of tuned out and sports was my life, you know? So it wasn't until Endgame, and I'm saying Endgame was the movie that made me say, okay, you know what? Holy crap, those movies I watched in middle school growing up with like Iron Man and all that, now that they're all connecting, I'm gonna watch all of those. And then from there, I was like, wait a minute, I kind of want to watch Interstellar. Oh, wait a minute, I kind of want to watch Casino Royale because I remember that was really hype when it came out. And then that okay. made me realize, okay, wait, I like movies as a whole. But, but just like you said, I, Rob, Mar- Marvel isn't even like my favorite thing anymore. I love just movies in general. Marvel now, is just one of them now. This is what I like to hear. And I think that mm-hmm. th- this is something people that like you that started this too. Not to sound corny, but no, know. but I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and this is what I I think is very important to be mindful of. Um, I've always said that pop culture has a half life of twenty years, but pop culture is also generational. And what's really important, uh, and I I I my, I was adopted, and I have a, a significantly older half brother, and I'll never forget. When I was talking to him, it was the first time I heard the doors. And he he's a lot older than me and and he was young when the doors were new. And I explained to him, I'm like, oh my God, you know, it was because of Apocalypse Now and the end is playing at the beginning of Apocalypse Now. And I, I was so transfixed and so like, oh my God. And I I went out and, and he laughed at me. Not 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 in a mocking way. Because he had already gone through the experience of listening to the doors and and understanding what it meant. But he was also delighted by the fact that the doors had an effect on me a decade and a half later. Actually, not quite a day. Then it had, but that it still meant something. So he could look at me and, and suddenly we could bond over the doors the end which was the last track on their first album um and and so when i hear you talk about this the fact that you love sports and you this is what i think is is kind of forgotten about especially on the in the youtube space is you never know every single moment of every single day you might discover a movie that changes your life you might discover, you might read a book that changes, a book that might be 40 years old, 80 years old, 100, you might read a quote from Marcus Aurelius and be like, who is Marcus Aurelius? And be like, uh, I don't know, but oh wait, there's I, Claudius, there's Gladiator, there's all this stuff. What we have to do as a community, and I think that Doomcock, Gary, myself, Chris Gore, Critical Drinker, what we always have to allow for the moment of creation when a person first comes to this material and they don't know what they don't know. And, and we have to allow, we have to allow for people to discover this material on their own. And even though we might hate something that somebody says, I love that, we can't, we can't deny them that discovery. It's really, Rob, really important. Rob, do you think? Do, do you think that today there's more of a re- reticence to going back and looking at what was? Like no, no, you know, I no, I think it's more than ever before. Look at the reaction I, 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 videos. It's important yeah, exactly. to do it. Yeah, yeah. I get so much. But I feel from like there's more of a from. Well, and no offense on you, Cyan, but um, I feel like younger people do not so much want to go back and look at what wait, was. Wait. Like uh, again, I'm a 50 year old dude. Wait, and- I got. I, I I gotta say, man, I gotta yeah. say that I wait. wait let me just, first of all, let old guy in Holly, Hawaii, <laughs> you were about to say. Yeah, I said basically, I, one yeah, of my yeah. greatest joys at being this old is I watch a whole bunch of reaction video channels. That they all do music and movies, and so I get to basically vicariously relive my enjoyment of those things through yeah. other people who are seeing it for the first time, and they're all ages. Oh my God! So I, people are discovering it. It's out there. I gotta say, there. It, it, it's weird. It's funny because I have to like the fact that I even have to say this. There's there's a a channel uh, called I think her name is Bunny Tales Reviews. And she's watching classic Star Trek. 
She's working. Oh God. She's working her way up through the first season of Star Trek. Somebody sent me her thing and, and said, uh, "My friend Darren Doctorman and I, like every time she posts a review, oh. I'm like, oh my God, what's she gonna say now?" Not because I'm some weird like like old man like lusting over some young girl. It's not that. I'm curious what a virgin brain who's never seen classic Star Trek who has nothing and what she has to say about classic Star Trek is fascinating to call I, your face. I, Rob, I've actually joined a stream where they were only next generation fans and going back and watching original Trek. And it's so interesting. I'm like, these guys never watched original Trek. They just saw Next Generation. Yeah, like, well, original it's Trek. It's so interesting to see it. Yeah, I'll, that's exactly why. And I'll tell you something. Original all entertainment stands on its own. You, yes. you, you can't, you don't make caveats about it. You just let it play. And what, what I love about Bunny Tail's reviews I mean, I don't know how old she is. She might be 19. She might be 30. I have no idea. Uh, but what's really interesting to me is I don't watch her reacting to the shows as they're happening. I go to the end when she does her summations. Mm -hmm. And it, it's fascinating to watch because she's a smart, inquisitive human being. And and even though like she calls the sexism on it you know yes. and and no but 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 no no it's it's great it's great because no. you know it, it and there's there's a couple of of like youtube is not a female space it yes. is fair it, 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 it really isn't and i i'm not saying this as a it's not about sexism or anything my audience is 96 percent men yeah i can see the youtube fair analytics point. i can you know, and and that's fine, but like, two of my favorite YouTubers, one of them actually, and people say like maybe because she looks like, like my ex-wife. Um, there's a YouTuber named Impression Blend out of Chicago. Yeah, she's amazing. She's she's fucking whip. <laughs> she's whip smart, but she reviews books. She reads books. She watches horror films. Her taste is impeccable. I, and and what's funny, and here's the funny thing about YouTube, because I know what it's like when people think they're my friend. I watch Impression Blend. I'm like, oh, I wish we were friends. I wish I could go to movies with you and have the conversations that we would have over coffee, which is silly. But that's what happens on YouTube. But, but when I think about what this uh, community has is the the commentary and like what Cyan was saying – he came to this at a different place mm -hmm. in life than other. He didn't grow up with it. You know, mm -hmm. like five years old, he's not playing with, you know, I, I got the Avengers Tower and Lego and all that. Mm -hmm. and, 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 have, and what he did what, not have the Secret Wars figures that we no, had. It's kind no. of interesting to think, too, that most people, like, like Brad was saying, a lot of people think that's when it should have all ended, too, right? Yeah, and, and the right? thing yeah. is, the thing is about we forget, like, all of us bitching on YouTube, Cyan, are forgetting about you. That's what I'm saying. And you know, for me, like like your guys' Infinity War, I know this movie isn't cinema. It's not the best movie ever. It, no, like, but it kind of is. Me, uh, was, Infinity uh, War, no, hang on. Infinity War kind no, no. of is. So, so let me, I, Rob's I got, no, Rob's got point. He's got a good point. So let me, I might have misspoke. What I was trying to say is you guys got to experience Infinity War theaters, and that was awesome. What I'm trying to say is for me as someone that came into end, like after Endgame, I'm saying my Infinity War experience in theaters was No Way Home. That's the movie I was just talking about. I'm saying that. Okay. Sure, some people don't think that's cinema. Some people think that movie is cameo porn, whatever you want to call it. No, but but, but here's the my thing. Point being is what you're saying, Rob. Like, they don't, people do forget about the people like me. Like, yeah, and I'm saying I'm saying worse. Like, we still want to hope that it's going to be better. In the future. Dude, dude, you, my friend, are the quintessential imagination connoisseur. If anybody sparks their Thank shuttlecraft you. in. My shell made it, it's you because what we have forgotten is that every single day somebody is discovering something new. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you weren't listening, you weren't there because you were involved in sports or whatever. And, and one of the things about fandom that I think we've forgotten is that you're a newly minted fan, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you're somebody. And and we, it's up to us. We're the ones that are be like, come on, Cyan, come in here. It's great to have you. Let's go drink some beers. And what, what what's your favorite thing? Tell us what you want to know. And mm-hmm. let's share them. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, your your enthusiasm is what's supposed to restoke our love in all of this. And, and yeah, honestly, that, that, that is what has done it. Because, look, we admit, there's a lot of toxicity out there. Right? Needless, by the way. Well, Needless. I, but I'll look, I, I, will, I will criticize something that I have loved if it is going off the, tra- the ra- trails. Like, I watch Indiana Jones 5, and I'm like, I hated it. Because... I saw Raiders in the theaters, and this is not what I wanted to see. So that's why I criticize it. But at the same time, if someone comes in and science says, oh, my God, I just watched Raiders. What an amazing movie. Yes, tell me. Let's talk about it. Let's, well, let's experience it. Let's, let's enjoy yes. what so, is good. And if you don't like it, tell me why. And let's talk about it. Well, here's the here's, thing. Oh, go ahead, Cyan. I was just going to say, I, what I can say on a positive note is me being someone that is 25, like I can say, I do feel like there are a lot more people like me who are kind of voicing their opinion. And there are a lot of people like me who love movies and are becoming new fans as of recently. And there is, I feel like there's a lot to be appreciative of too. Like last, even this last year, the two best movies were what Oppenheimer and Barbie and not even like comic book movies. So, I don't know. I feel like there is a lot to be appreciative of, too, going forward. Well, here's here's just you saying that. That's hope for me for the future. Because, I, I mean, I, I mean, here's, here's the thing. At the end of the day, I like a lot of movies that I know aren't great. But there's things about them that I like. And I, and, and, and. I would be questioning people like, oh, well, Rob, if you like that film, uh, your opinions are uh, negated. But there's reasons why we can like things. And and we should never, ever, ever have to explain our preferences to other people. We yeah, shouldn't. I feel that. No. What, we should, well, well, what we should have wait, to do, wait, though. Wait, no, Rob, I, I, I think you can say this. I think you can say, I can say why I like this thing that I saw and say, okay, I appreciate you saying that and let's talk about it. Well, if, well, if someone disagrees, if, if oh. I see a movie that I think is shit and they say, this is why I like it, I go, let's talk about it. Well, yeah. I just respect them talking about it. But but here's the thing. I I, I think that that you, you, you should never... If somebody likes something, whatever it is, like preferences in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, I'm not going to disrespect them liking no. it. Uh, but I'm talk about it. Uh, but sure, of course. But I do think that if somebody likes something, we have to respect the fact that our go to position is like, like if somebody likes Ghostbusters 2016, <laughs> that might be, oh, that gosh. might be, that I know, I know. That might be the first Ghostbusters movie they ever saw. Yeah, they they they, they had never encountered what Ghostbusters even was. The concept okay. now now Fair now point. now Fair. now Fair. yeah and now and now Ghostbusters came out in nineteen eighty four. Yeah, Ghostbusters twenty sixteen came out. Hands up! Who saw it in theaters? Who saw it in theaters? It, but it was thirty two years later. <laughs> There's going to be many people in the audience. Their first experience with the even concept of Ghostbusters is going to be in 2016. Now, I personally, not a fan, but there. you ha- you have to respect that there are going to be people. It's just like when people talk to me about James Bond. You know, mm-hmm. there's been multiple James Bonds. I never judge people based on their favorite Bond because Bond is based on when you first saw it. Exactly. Yes, yeah, fair. You know? yeah, yeah. Totally fair. Totally and, fair. And, and what I think our community, I think what our community needs to do better is we need to invite people in by allowing them, allowing them to have the preferences that they have based on 
on what they saw. I mean, my God, I would never want to take away the awe and what if somebody saw Star Trek for the very first time. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, and people are going to oh, clip Jesus this out. Christ. I know. I'm oh, going to say it. Dude. I, I know. If somebody saw any episode of Star Trek Discovery, which I personally find a god awful affront to the entire franchise, I'm with you, brother. However, Mostly. if if somebody saw it, and that was their very first experience with, with Star Trek, that could be me, and it it could be you. I would never want to take that away from them. Yeah. I would never. I would never want to what? tell. I would never want to tell that person. Fuck if, you! You don't know what you're no, talking about. No, I, I would if, never say if, that to someone. If that's their uh, first say, experience. Yeah, then you go great. You should go watch this. If you that's like that, exactly right. Go see this. What what I, I we have to, to do them. is invite them in and go. Hey, that, that's what's missing. That's what's missing. The conversation, the engagement. Like, oh my god, I love the Lost Jedi. Hi, let's talk about Star Wars. <laughs> but 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 here's the, here's but here's the thing. If somebody tells you that they, they love the last Jedi, you have to accept that. You I, cannot you cannot sit there and go, "Well, I appreciate you like the last Jedi, but let me tell you I and by the way, I'm going to I'll admit this. If someone tells me they love the last Jedi, I'm thinking in my head, you're fucking wrong. I, 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 I mean, I, 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 but here's the thing. Here's the thing. If they love that and that's their first Star, Star Wars film, we are, we, we're, we're the, we're the problem if we're the ones going, fuck you. You don't know what the fuck no, you're you talking can, about. And they're like, that, that, why are you mad at me? The worst thing to say as a lawyer, as someone who <laughs> argues professionally, as someone who tries to settle cases, you never go to the other side and go, fuck you. You never do that. I know. If I'm in a mediation, you work it out. So you get to the point where you have a common ground. So if someone says, The Last Jedi is the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life, is the best Star Wars ever, okay, let's talk about this. Right, but, but here's the thing. Don't talk about it thinking you're going to, you're, yeah. I know. I, I, I may you're not go, convince you, them. I know, but you, you shouldn't even. But, but, but you shouldn't try. You should enjoy their love. You should enjoy oh, their I, love. And no, what you no, should do is gently the nudge them in some yeah. world. Like, hey, yeah, look I, at this. Look. I like the the one thing. The fact that one thing. This person who's thing. never seen Star Wars before. Hey, says, like, Wolverine. Wolverine. Like, like, like Wolverine. Uh, Wolverine's gonna go fucking nuts because I know Wolverine. Wait, before I have to. I have to piss again. I've been drinking what water. And... Head. Hang on a second. I get to piss like a racehorse, and I'm going to go drain the main vein. I'm how right we, back. How about we do both, okay? <laughs> Let's do... Vix is having the most fun based on his expression. He's uh, I mean, cause, he's because he's in Europe, and you know what I always say about Europeans? They've been human beings longer than Americans have, so they're much more go. mature than we are. <laughs> For God's sake. For Not God's sake. Native Americans. Even Europeans are older. Uh, Native Americans had to crumb over the the, the yeah, for true. the Africa. Uh, I mean, come on now. They had to, they are had you to... just my sister in law? Shut the hell up, brother. <laughs> Fucking... <laughs> this is the greatest observation, long term experience I've ever had. Love it's it. fantastic. By the it's way, it's almost I... four a.m. Uh, I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> oh, it's well. almost four a.m. Fuck okay. it. Yeah, but this is what we do. It's the new I'm year. Much I mean, in the past. Yeah. True that. almost killed a bottle right. of scotch. In a world, oh my god! I'm just trying to like change this so I can actually. Um, yeah, if you gotta go to the uh, bathroom, go for it. Uh, move, I do, but I, 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 I would I'm like just to like right now that I am fucking loving this conversation. I'm loving that I'm literally just chatting with RMB. I'll be right back. Who is directed one of my favorite movies ever? So. I appreciate that, but I yeah, must dope. feel my don't urethra piss, coursing with don't liquid. Piss it. I'll be right back. Turn, so just turn off your microphone. Haven't you, you don't seen, hear that. Diane? You said what, what, haven't, what, what haven't, haven't you seen that you want to see? Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's yeah. a good question. That's a good question. Um, I feel like ever since 2019, I've kind of just been playing a long game of catch up. So I will say Star Trek as a series, Rob, Rob, We'll be shocked to say this, but, or to hear this, but I have not seen any Star Trek, so that's something. Okay. I that's fa get. Okay. that's fine. Star uh, Trek, honestly, is very niche. 
it's honestly yeah, very yeah. niche. And here's the thing that I think is important for some people to know, like maybe if you're not in the same age group as I am, is sometimes when these new movies come out and there's like so many you have to watch beforehand, it feels like homework, you know? Like one movie, and yeah. I'd be interested to hear what Rob has to say about this, but one movie that I wanted to see in theaters this year so fucking bad that I didn't see it because there was too many movies I had to watch beforehand. I'm sorry, actually, there was two of them. It was Indiana Jones and Mission Impossible. I wanted to see both those in theaters so damn bad. But it okay, felt like so you don't have to see. Have to you don't have to see anything before you either of those. Yeah. And honestly, look, Cyan, there are only three Indiana Jones movies in the world. No, yeah, you're right. And, and I got to the first one. But Temple of Doom and on. Last Crusade. There, yeah. there are no other Indiana Jones movies on this planet. Point of order. Ever. Because people are gonna, people are gonna dispute. Okay, Temple of Doom was a huge disappointment, and I actually like Crystal Skull. So <laughs> here you go. But Crystal, oh, Last Jesus Crusade is better than all of them. I've only seen the first. Last one, Crusade. Say, Last the Crusade first, first was the awesome. perfect. Yeah. Ending perfect. for trilogy. That's true. Perfect ending for perfect. trilogy. Yeah. Yes. Sean Connery looking at Heroes from Her going, let it go. Yeah. Let it yeah. go. And then Frozen came that, along and ruined it. Okay. <laughs> there is no better trilogy than Indiana Jones. Uh, Raiders Lost Ark, Temple of Doom. <laughs> Temple of Doom is. Let's just uh, say. I hope oh, I'm not demonetized, guys. When we saw it in What's the theater, that? and I agree because when I when I came back to the states, and I I saw um, the Last Crusade in Europe, and I came back to the states in '91, and they started showing the, or maybe it had already been running, but they started showing the Indiana Jones TV show, and I was just like, nah, the, Indiana, oh, the Indiana, Indiana Jones, Jones Crusade, a TV show was amazing. I'm sure it was good, but for me, it was like I I was just like. Nah, I had mixed bags about the. TV Honestly, show. The, the the TV show was great. I never it really was. Well, it was up and down. I liked parts, but I didn't. But I was just well, like, there, it, I mean, it made no sense. The jazz episode, episode yeah. the World War I'm One. I'm a 16 episode. year old kid back in 1991, and I'm like, meh. That's all. The kid <laughs> stuff was dumb, but uh, who was it? Sean Patrick Scott. Sean, Sean Patrick Flattery. Flattery. The dude Sean from. Uh, uh, um, Powder. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. he was good. He was good. He's it was, was good, good stuff. By the it way, can I can I just say that there's 411 people watching, or 410 now watching oh, the yeah. stream. And I I, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and watching the stream. I know there's a lot of uh, new members because I've been putting up shorts on Instagram and uh, YouTube from Free Enterprise. I want to thank everybody who might be new to this channel. Going who the f are these people what's going on <laughs> i want to thank you all for being here i want to wish everyone uh a happy new year i mean we're now into the last day of yeah, the man. year crazy and you know you you can't you can't have a youtube channel without thanking the audience and and That's i want true. to thank everybody with us right now i mean it's one thing to just invite ra uh, on this channel we have a long tradition of of, of inviting what I call randos, random people. <laughs> this is not a disparaging comment. I'm the it, rando. It, you you know, rando you're, 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 it, it, to have people Brown come on rando. live. I mean, I we've got some old guy in Hawaii. We've got Brad Burnett or Burnette. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I know Burnett. Uh, we we've got Bix on 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 the the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. We've got Cyan, and we've got Wolverine Snicked here. I want to thank all of you fine people for joining me on this live stream. And by the way, there's a certain amount of courage. Like, if you're going to come on uh, some live channel on YouTube that's going to be sure. archived, I mean, you, you, you have to have a certain amount of courage. I want to yeah. thank all of you. I mean, some of you have watched this channel for a long time. Um some of you have have uh, are new. Certainly, Wolverine uh, and uh, and also Mr. Burnett here. I can't believe I'm saying Mr. Burnett. Uh, I don't know you guys, Cyan. It's great to have you here as well, Bix. Thank you for having me. All the me. way, great, great to have you all the way from Italy. I mean, this is what I love about the internet. 
And I want to thank everybody for being here. And this is why I do YouTube. This is why I love it. Because my God, people from all over the world, it's pretty cool. And um, you got to love it. Couldn't have said it better. Couldn't have said it better. I totally agree with you. This is why the internet is around. Ten years ago, who could have imagined this happening? I, I couldn't. I, no, I, uh, no I, I could not. Well... You know, April will be my nine. A, April will be my nine-year anniversary on YouTube, and that was the first time I was aware of. Oh my God, people talk live on YouTube. Yeah. So yeah, I, I started exactly. YouTube February last year, and yeah. I've been streaming every Thursday with a bunch of buddies. We do a Thursday show at eight thirty. Every Thursday. I want to start a channel. I just haven't. And it's to fun. It yet. By the way, I just want to say uh, Peter sent in a tip. Saying all the best, Robin Grew, a twenty dollar tip. Thank you, Peter. Scott Bartholomew says <laughs> says I'm looking forward to seeing the historical drama Zone of Interest by Jonathan Glazer. Oh, it'll blow you away. By the way, if you haven't seen, so Jonathan Glazer has o only made four films in his life, um, and Jesus and one of them was Birth with Nicole Kidman. One of them was um, a, a, an adaptation of Jonathan Faber's. Um, science fiction novel that starts Scarlett Johansson as an alien. Oh, and, dude, uh, that, uh, that movie was awesome. It, it's totally awesome, and his new movie, Zone of Interest, is really chilling, based on loosely based on a book by British author Mar Martin Amis. Um, under, uh, by the way, the the movie is called Under the Skin. If you haven't seen yeah. it, and yeah. uh, you like Scarlett Johansson, you should watch it. <laughs> Um, that's all I'm going to say, but it, it's a crazy film, and uh, I want to say that uh, Scott, um, really, really interesting. Scott me, goes on to say, Free Enterprise will be accepted more today than when it was released. I don't know about that. I mean, we make <laughs> Mia Farrow jokes that are not going to fly with oh, today's... Yeah, uh, they, 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 uh, uh, by the way, we were right, they were wrong, just so you know. And I'll defend uh, those. People have said, Rob, if you're going to do a new version of Free Enterprise, you should cut out some jokes. I'm like, here's my answer to that. No. <laughs> no. Did you see the Super Chat? What's that? Oh, Did my God. That's what I was talking about. Wow. Not Duke Devil <laughs> just sent in what, $100 oh, oh. Super Chat. I, Duke, Damn, Duke. Duke. Devil that, 95. Just dropping, me, just dropping yeah. this here. My God. And the thing is, Duke Devil, I, I feel like we should, for that, we should pontificate for at least a half an hour. But he's that, just dropping just it here. dropping money because I'm a partner in my law firm. Thank you, Duke so. Devil. That, by the way, that is, that is, Congrats, very, that is very nice of you. Thank you so much. And you know what I would say? I would like to believe it's because of this whole esteemed panel. You know, you bring on, you bring on people. We, we, we've got Bix from Italy. You know, we, we've got Brad from Florida. We've got Hawaii represented by old man in Hawaii. We've got Cyan here, here in, 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 in my neck of the woods. And Wolverine is, of course, from the Weapon X facility in <laughs> Canada. <laughs> Alabama. No, it's hey, Canada. Okay, Alabama. Well, originally, well, originally, yeah, I am. Or, from, or uh -huh. as, as as Wolverine knows, he's from the the place that the Crimson Tide is from, Go Bama, Little Ducks. There's trouble in Russia. If you're a genius, people are like, what are you talking about? If, it's a <laughs> Crimson go, Tide thing. Go, it's all go, good. Go check Wolverine on eBay. He's got stuff up for sale, probably. Yeah, I've so, got I a good eBay store going on. A great cool. crisis, and um, I've uh, I've been grabbing stuff since 2009 from comic cons so if you look for something vintage go to my ebay store look for wolverine schnicked you'll find something you probably were looking for there you go yeah, well, wolverine and i have streamed together before uh he's seen me at my worst when i got really drunk and just <laughs> pontificated <laughs> on star trek for an hour wait a minute did not really, not in real did, you, really did you not you didn't defecate online like on the no, live stream, but he has oh, no, a really no. cool ass like Dungeons and Dragons uh, Star Trek uh, game. So it's, no, it's just well, like. By the way, I, I go, you're I get, role playing I, Star I, Trek I, game. I can't wait to see. It. I'm dying. To see. It. Oh, dude, I, it, Rob. If I tell you the totality of the campaign I ran, 
You would fucking cry. I'm how all good about this it, dude. Was. I'm all about you. You know, I I have to say that 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 one of the things. By the way, a, a fan sent me uh, this this uh, X. Uh, uh, this is King Kong from Godzilla versus Kong. Oh which yeah, is very cool. Um, but cool. one of the things that happened this year that I love, I have to say, one of the things I love because we is okay. This. This box set came out from Paramount this year. Uh, it is the Picard Legacy box set. And, uh, you know, I'll go full frame on it. It I haven't opened it. Um, it is, wait, hang on. Just hold on. Let me just get here. So this is the Picard Legacy. It is a very chonky Blu-ray box set. It's got swag in it. Now, I hated Picard seasons uh, one and two. Like they made me, so. they made me want to put a uh, a bullet in my brain, <laughs> um, and I, I'm not even suicidal. I'm just saying. <laughs> However, no, I hear you, man. Terry Metalis's, uh Picard season three made me change my mind. But what's great about this Picard box set is it has all the episodes of Next Generation and the movies. So it has all. I spent three years from 2012 to 2014 making star trek the next generation documentaries nice. and i'm so proud of that work and i watched them it was re-released in this box set and uh this year and uh it made me you know not that i would ever claim i would never claim that i had uh, had anything to do with what terry metallis and his incredible writing staff did with picard season three but the fact that they released my documentaries in a box set with the work he did on Picard season three, I can be like, "Yeah, we worked together. Crazy. What's up? It's all good." <laughs> Even though we didn't, but it was it was it's a great box set, and um, you know, I, I, I'm very, I feel very privileged that the documentaries I worked on for three years have been re-released ten years after the fact. So it's uh, pretty exciting. I, I've seen them on the Blu-ray editions. Mm. They were very well done, very respectful, and um, are true to Star Trek. Yeah, I'm very proud of those. I mean, you know, I got to sit down with a crew in season two, Dude. which is on this. I, I, I sat down oh with the crew, God. the entire crew, and interviewed the crew. It's fucking awesome. Damn. And it's uh, just like, I'm looking at it, I'm like, Oh my god! Because I know who you are, Rob. Oh. And like, dude is like, I I legitimately don't like how you contain yourself because like I'm I'm when I <laughs> well. went to do meeting with Shatner, I'm like, I gotta keep it together. I can't nerd out. I'm like, I just gotta be boys, getting photograph Shatner, and like you're talking to the fucking crew. Well, I have to, yeah. So I'm like, I'll, I'll tell Jesus. you funny. You know my favorite, my favorite story. So over the the three years, first of all, I got to give a shout out. There was a a uh, a an executive, and he was a home video executive that ran CBS Home Entertainment. And if it, it without him. Uh, the next generation uh, special features never would have happened, and wow. I, you know, I said that Mort Salkind was the, the Tony Soprano of. Mm -hmm. So, so this guy, this man, this gentleman, he was already a hero of mine, mm. and uh, he was he was a guy that um, he started working in home video in the late seventies for Jesus. a. And uh, he, he started work. So uh, uh, first of all, let me tell you a story. For all of you who want to know another story about Hollywood, it's not my story. But there was one man named Andre Blay who in the mid to late, mid to like 76, 77, went to the motion picture studios and said, hey, there's this new technology, uh, 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 VCRs. And I, I, I would like to license. He went to 20th Century Fox, and he said, "I would like to license 50 of your movies, 
and put them on videotape. And they were like, why? <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, 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 it, it, you know, I, I think so. Long story short, he licensed 50 movies from Fox and he started his own company, Magnetic Video. And so 20th Century Fox, like, he got the French Connection and Patton and all this. And he started the first video store in the United States called Video Station. And it was on Wilshire Boulevard in uh, L.A. So. Man, I would have have been around during those times. Oh, my God. So cut to 1981. Um, 20th Century Fox had to pay him millions of dollars to buy back their own movies that he had licensed <laughs> for home video. So, oh, my God. Yeah, and Magnetic Video had, by the way, acquired rights to, like, Avco Embassy. They were putting out The Fog and Phantasm, and 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 they had already, you know, all that jazz was 20th Century Fox movie. So they made Andre Blay the president of 20th Century Fox, or at the time, yeah, 20th Century Fox home video. And he went on to produce movies like John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. Nice. And, uh, you know, he was a... Uh, 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 but that was a guy that just just thought, just thought it up, man. He's like, huh, I think people want to watch movies in their homes whenever they want. Yeah. Maybe on video cassette we could... I mean... This guy and the th- studios are like, what the fuck? Who cares? Okay, we're, we're showing movies on TV. Why do we have to l- videotapes? What are they? I mean, it's I'm just so, saying. It's so weird to think about now. Yeah. We're like, I mean, it's like, be kind, rewind. Yeah, Who- and, and he's, I mean, and you think about that. He, he. He's actually one of my heroes, and one of my—I'll tell you one—one one of my dreams in life is, I want to make a movie about the history of home video because I started working at a video store when I was thirteen. I worked at the second video store in the United States in Seattle called Video Space, founded by a man named Weston Nishimura, who became the founder of the video software. He was the guy that became the head of the lobbyist group for video <laughs> movies on home video. <laughs> There, th- somewhere in that story is a legit comedy. Somewhere <laughs> well, there well, is. Well, no, it was. I it think was the a comedy is between Beta and VHS. <laughs> oh my God, Beta well, VHS. Well, well, but, but what? what <laughs> that's a. The reason that be- first of all, Beta was a better system. Yes, but 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 I but I what, have it. but what happened was what happened was Sony would not license out their <laughs> technology. Whereas Matsushita, who mm-hmm. created VHS, yep. said, hey, we'll give it to everybody. Sony was like, gave it to Sanyo or whatever. I was in, it was, it was funny, I was in Korea in 2018, and I was in Seoul, and I went to a museum, and they had their very first beta video recorder. <laughs> I was, I, in the museum, I'm like, oh my god. I was like, I, it could have been the Ark of the Covenant. I'm like, bro, oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> I mean, it was it was it was hilarious, and and people are like, why are you? It's just a VCR. I'm like, no, it's not. This is amazing. Sony licensed out beta technology. To, I mean, it was, yeah. It, it's so amazing how like VHS and Blu-ray took over because of manipulations in the market. Well, it's, also uh, Sony. I mean. You know, Sony learned their lesson, and it was. But here's the thing: everybody wants to license new technology. So now, if yeah. you want to make a Blu-ray or, oh, I, I, I don't begrudge. Capitalism is a great thing; it really is. The problem with capitalism is when people pervert it and try and turn it into something that it's not. And every, we're human beings; we're we're greedy fucks. The problem is when yeah. when the government takes over capitalism as opposed to private companies. Well, of course. That's but, where. But but even, like, look at Elon Musk in space. Whether you like Elon Musk or not, 
What SpaceX has done for space exploration in the last 10 years is unbelievable. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying whether or not Elon Musk is a good guy or not. I'm just saying that what he did with SpaceX is astonishing. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell point. you from Mike, because I, I work in a similar environment. He's rich, I'm not. He puts rockets in the sky, and I take rockets out of the sky. So, Well, as you what should. He, what, what he's done is, is phenomenal. It's making government look stupid as fuck. Yeah, we are. We're dumb as fuck. Well, because we can't. Here's like you know, having worked in the that governmental sector, yep. no one can move fast, and yep. and Elon Musk can move fast. He's launching rockets yep. that land, yeah. and 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 our 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 partisan politics is crippling this country to the point where it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or cons- uh, Democratic. Okay. We need, left right. Well, it that doesn't matter. What yeah. matters is we need America. Could be, uh, let me tell you a story. I got a story. I got another story. I got a story. I have a Hollywood story for everything. So I was in Bulgaria the summer of 2008, and I was producing a Warner Brothers movie called The Hills Run Red, horror film, direct to video. I had a girlfriend that said it's not really a studio movie. I'm like, well, it, no, it's. It's Warner Brothers all around. Joel Silver, the, the the producer of Lethal Weapon and Die Hard, was our executive producer. So I was in Bulgaria. I'd never been there. Soviet satellite state. And, and yeah, so I'm staying at a hotel called the Kempinski. And the Kempinski had two different bars, the normal bar, and then they had the piano bar that was open late. From midnight to six in the morning, it was a brothel essentially, but you know, run by run by the Mutra, Mutra which is what the that's what the Bulgarian. It was just Russians that had come to Bulgaria. Who are these people in this movie? Who are these people? Well, William Sadler, Bill Sadler, who was in. Uh, okay, uh, that's the Renaissance. only name I recognize. Honest Robinson, only name I recognize. Yeah, well, well, yeah, it, it, it's a low budget horror film. Yeah, but so here was the thing. So in this bar, in the, the around the piano bar, was this incredibly beautiful girl, and she was very smart, very uh, amazing. And uh, I, I made sure she went to the cast parties and all this. Her and her boyfriend, and I became friends with them. And I and I we were out one day, and I said, "Hey, um, like, what do you guys want to do?" And she said, "I, I'd love to open a cafe." And I said, that's amazing. You should. You you run the piano bar. It's so great. You you should do that. And she looks at me, and, and, and she was all taken aback. She's like, nobody would say that to me. And I, I was like, why not? You're great. And her, her and her boyfriend are looking at me. And I'm like, if you guys want to open a cafe, you should. And she said, you, you Americans, you don't understand. Here in Bulgaria... You can't dream that way. You know, you can't just decide to do what you want to do. Everyone will tell you no. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, uh, because, you know, we walk around thinking "Eh, it's a democracy. People don't know what democracy is. They don't know. And and, and we're like, Rob, don't say democracy. Well, the, the, but but people have never had it. They don't. They don't even know what it's like it, to have it, 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 they, freedom. Freedom. But 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 they don't. That, they, they don't know what that is. They, they, don't, they, they is. don't know what true freedom is. To to be able to say, I want to open a store. They don't know. And, Dude, they don't know. And, and not and, not only not only do they not know what that is, everybody around them tells them you can't do that. And and she looked at me. I mean, this girl. By the way, this girl was hot as fuck, and her boyfriend really handsome dude. And they were a handsome couple. And she was so good. She had no idea how good she was at business. She was so good at running that bar for the fucking Mutra, the mafia. She, that girl, she could be trusted within an inch of her life. She had no idea how trustworthy she was. She had no idea. And here's the thing. It's amazing that, and and this is where 
I think. Well, this is where Americans the, don't get it. Americans yeah, don't understand. Exactly. You they got don't it. Get it. You so got it, dude. when I said to her, I said, <laughs> and she's like, nobody here would ever tell me that. They wouldn't. And the, the funny thing is, is like, we Americans, we want to export democracy to the world. Do you know what the world no. doesn't know? They don't know what democracy is. So we go uh, no, into these countries Rob, and we're trying Rob, to explain Rob, to them. Uh, we don't want to in- export democracy. We want to export freedom. Okay, but but here's the thing. But 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 here but, but, they don't but, get it. No no no, it. no no no. They do. But you have to understand that freedom is incremental. Freedom is on a sidewalk. Freedom is like freedom is a concept that no one understands. You know what people want? People want self determination. They want. They want and like that, either, that's freedom. That's freedom. No, but but they, freedom is an all encompassing weird thing that people don't know. These two people, all they wanted to do was open a cafe. Now here's the thing: when you open a cafe, you need water, power. Mm-hmm. You need places. Yep. You need a sidewalk. You need places for your customers to park. You need okay. laundry to wash the napkins you need garbage pickup to put away the waste so all of these things that are needed to just open a cafe now imagine if you have a street with a cafe and a hardware store and a bakery and you have 10 different business owners they're all going to be like hey we all need waste disposal we need water we need a sidewalk we need parking Sure then you point. have a group then you have a group of people that are like how do we get this now they don't know anything about democracy they know that they have their own individual businesses that have needs now what happens is when their needs coincide like having a sidewalk and parking that's when they decide oh well we need to go to the city council and ask them for this that's how democracy begins. That's how that, self-determination, that, that's how freedom that, begins because every person wants to be able to do what they want to do. And by the way, we do not know how to export that. We should be the first people to be boots on the ground and say, hey, the problem I, I, is, like our friend here, uh, uh, Wolverine, he's seen this. He's watched this. He's watched the failure of our, like, we want to believe because we just want to go in and do the shorthand. And I, the, the, I don't think it's democracy. I think it's representation. No, well, no, no. Democracy comes out of representation. The it, problem, the problem this is, is where the, this is where words and language become convoluted. Um, I just want to add one thing. Please. There's many elements that were missing, and by the way, I was being I'm, very I, simplistic. And, I, and I'm just, and that's, yeah, and that's why very I also simplistic. simplistically will say this: I'm a very smooth brain ape. And when I was overseas, for the many years I spent overseas, there's many elements that play into all of these things. And when guys like here, guys like us, mm. who aren't as connected or maybe less connected i can't go into specifics is when you stray out of your lane right you get fucking destroyed and that's all i fucking say but why do why do you think that is because you intervene in somebody's greed yeah isn't that that okay that to me by the way that's the truest thing I've, by the way, that should be on a t-shirt. Don't intervene in someone's greed. They will fuck you up. That is exactly, dude, Wolverine, that is the truest shit ever. Look, I've I've, I've chatted with Wolverine several times. I know do who he is. But it woke me up. It it woke me up in in an unfortunate way, in, in a very fortunate way that kept me still changing oxygen into co2 but let, so, let okay let me ask you something yeah. seeing what you've seen yeah uh, and seeing the dark side of it all 
Do you have any optimism? I do. But it takes people like me and more just individuals. It takes people walking away and people speaking up. Okay. Because when, Wh- what, because when, what? When, when you're just one of, say, of like, say, if you're just the minority, say you're 25% and 75% are just like, they're going to go on with the line, you're dead. But what can we do? I mean, if you could offer advice to the masses. Stop what? supporting wars. Stop supporting wars. I, how do, I, how do I, we, I, but yeah, how do we do under, that? Would, would, how do we do yeah, that? Do you, do you, we need to Locally, understand first, why first the local, US does first, what it does. Wait, hang on. Let, let hang on. Uh, sorry, Wolverine. Let Pass, them talk. Pass, Pass, let old, let old, Pass, let old men in Hawaii Pass, just ask. start locally. The the, the general Anyways. idea is that we the America is about exporting freedom, but if you look at what we've yeah. actually done over the years, most of the time there are we've larger no, money we're, grubbing we're corporate interests that are actually pushing things. We don't. You know, it's like if we were that big about Wolverine saying we're exporting, we're exporting the war of the military. Yeah. That's why I don't want yeah. to go into this. Because this yeah. is not what this stream was but, about. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. no, I mean, no, like, no, no, no. We, we we talk about you know we're gonna we're gonna go in and, and help this particular group because they're being oppressed and they yeah. need you know. We've never been about that. So it's all lies. It's but at all the same lies. time, well, yeah, it's all lies. Let, West with North let me Korea. just say this: as as someone who's who streamed with Woofy before, I respect what he's yeah. done. I've lost. My I father. know what he is. My brother's brain and, damaged. I've uh, PTSD uh, for the rest of my life. I've lost friends to war and PTSD, suicide related stuff. And it's all look, facade. It's all Wolverine, about making well, money for the military. Wolver- Wolverine, you, you know, brother, you know, you know, I respect you. You know, I respect everything you've done. And I support everything you say. Because you're a good dude. Well, and I absolutely respect everything you say. And um, I wish everyone could do better because well, what well, you're saying is absolutely fucking true. Hundred percent. Let me ask you, Wolverine. So, a lot of our society is based on on fiction. And, uh, you know, obviously we're talking about your name. Your name is taken from a fictional character. Do you see a correlation between Flights of Fancy or fiction like our comic book characters? I mean, Wolverine is a fucking great character. Yep. Do you think that our fiction... I've always believed that great fiction can help people. That great characters, great fiction, and great storytelling can help people understand. Yes. Do you think that's true? I believe it's true because of what guided me into doing the right thing. So when I was in the Kunduz province of Afghanistan between the years of 2010 to 2013, I was given the... Uh, so I worked in electronics warfare and my job because there wasn't a military what we call a billet there wasn't mm. a military job yet created for soldiers to do what I did so I was sent forward trained forward to go into country to train soldiers to do what I did which was basically to make vehicles compliant to jamming um, RCIDs, which is remote controlled um, bombs. You, your, those vehicles can go into country for route clearance and destroy those bombs. So I did that for, for three straight years. But into the point of after we did the push and we did a lot of stuff in the middle of 2012, it was like, hey, the administration was like, we're done. I'm like, I'm like, okay, not really. Then they were like, okay, so everybody's pay gets cut in half and we're firing all of you right off the bat. 
So I resigned immediately. I was mm-hmm. like, um, yeah, I can go back to States and make this money easily. Same pay if you're cutting me in half and you're firing everybody. So when the falling month was what we saw, I know I'm just jumping, but what no, we saw keep going in Benghazi. And, um, and of course, six months prior to that, we saw what happened with Extortion 17, where 31 members of SEAL Team 6, of course, <clears throat> SEAL Team 6 name being publicly put out by right. Biden. And we're sitting there going, oh, they just gave those guys up. And they had the improper, um, the Extortion 17 was, if you research Extortion 17, they had the most horribly uh, mission set up available to anybody. So those dudes were just set up to fucking die. And then what won't be re- re- really revealed by a lot of people is that when they did the investigation on the ground where they found the remains of Extortion 17, was there was a huge firefight. Those guys didn't die in the sky. The majority of them died on the fucking ground, and they were shot down to pieces by the Taliban. or probably elements of some members of um, the Iran. Um, anyways. So, we move forward, and I'm still in Afghanistan, and I'm working, I'm working this, like, new program. You know, a lot of us, a lot of us guys who've been out there for a long time are realizing, okay, this is bullshit, and we're getting new guys just coming off the green. You know, we're getting elements of, like, uh, anyways, and, and we were, like, fighting each other. Like, like we're, 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 guys have been seniored. We're seeing shit that's going on. New guys who just just don't realize that they've been lied to from day one. And I just left. I fucking left. And, like, I, I went back. I don't know. I'm just going off. But I went no, back it's to okay. States. And then I, 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 I kind of wanted. I did. I tried. I tried to leave this government shit. Then I went to Orlando. I started my own comic book shop, um, cause I had a lot of money from contract, you know. Yeah. And then I just uh, life got involved, and uh, I walked away. And then, dude, Donald Trump he took office, and I got a call, bro. I got a call from one of the uh, 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 senior chiefs I used to work for Neo D. He was like, "My name's what the fuck you work for?" I just, <laughs> just fucking. I just said my last name. He's like, uh, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm fucking off. I'm working for the trucking company. You know, because I had left the comic shop I worked for. I took all my shit and put it in storage. And he's like, you want for, where do you want to work for the FBI? I was like, sure. Why not? What do you want me to do? He's like, what do you think? Oh, it's like, well, I'm working on IDs. I was like, all right, cool. So I went to Quantico. This is 2017. Right at the start of Trump's... Uh, administration and uh i found it very strange i walk into it's 2017 so lectures are over i walk into quantico after being hired got my my ts my top screen clearance be verified my sci and i walk into the crime lab at quantico and what do i see i see uh president obama vice president fucking uh biden and who are the fuck was speaker house at the time still on the wall and I'm like, ain't that fucking wrong? Because whenever I was at a fucking military base, we had the proper POTUS, the proper vice president, and the proper house speaker on the fucking wall. No. And it stayed that way for six straight more fucking months when I was still fucking there. And then finally, because my job there was to help the crime lab to move here where I'm now now, fucking uh, Huntsville, Alabama. And, uh, oh, it got fucking worse. It got way fucking worse. Uh, I start, you know, I'm still processing, you know, uh, terrorist fucking uh, cases for IEDs and shit. There for TDAC there in fucking uh, Huntsville. And uh, they're all like up my ass. Strep up my ass. And, I, and I'm just going to keep saying what I'm saying because this is what happened. And so, like... Probably about less than six months prior to me leaving, which was uh, 
At this point, it was about two weeks before Bannon, before Bannon resigned from Donald Trump's res, uh, yeah, Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon's shit landed on our fucking printers. Like, a fish thick shit. We all had to sign NDAs. And they were like, yeah, you didn't see that shit. And we're all like, yeah, okay. <laughs> what the fuck? So, um, yeah, I, I started looking for another job overseas again in Afghanistan about uh, pronto. And left within, I was probably out of there within four weeks. Went back to El Paso for a processing. Went back to Afghanistan. So I want to get the fuck away from that shit. That was crazy as fuck, dude. And um, yeah, everybody I worked with is no longer there. They all resigned. They all got the fuck away from there, dude. And and this is no why. Why did they do that? Scared. We were all scared. Fucking scared, dude. Fuck these fucks. They, they, dude. I met guys who used to work for Peter Stroke. And they were all like, that guy is like, devil. Like, nobody wanted to fucking deal with that guy. It was just like, so much nutso shit at the FBI. And and then, then fast forward to when I worked for a forensic lab at Camp Lemonade in Africa. So, we, our job in Africa was to relay, to, you know, Information and 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 evidence for for you know criminal shit and 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 I'm sorry I'm getting all oh, no no so <clears throat> so we my point is we it didn't end there and it hasn't ended for everybody who's dealing with shit and counterterrorism FBI should be dealing with states United States. Not going into the battlefield, taking evidence off the battlefield, and fucking over the DOD. And DOD is so compromised, they don't give a fuck. Because they, they, they all do all these handshakes in the Pentagon. Well, let me ask you, Wolverine. Obviously, I mean, you've, you've seen from the inside how is America so corrupt that we're lost? Or is there hope? There is hope, but it comes from people. That's it. I mean, you got to take the hits. I took the hit. I've taken the hit twice. Um, I had to do bankruptcy, bankruptcy in 2014 because of what I learned of when I was in Afghanistan in 2012, 2013. Um, when I found out the corruption between, uh, uh, I won't name the names of the companies, but um, I was thrown out of the country within less than 40 hours. I was home. I literally, the guy that administrated my kick out of the country in Afghanistan in 2013, I flew on the same flight with him through Dubai. And he was like, when he saw me flying out with him in Kuwait, he got scared as fuck because he was, he knew I already knew he administrated it. I just looked at him and go, bro, I'm done. I'm going to find a job. I did. And I was legit. I was like, I went back. To, I, I I went back states. I took my shit. I went to Orlando. I, I fucking started up my own. I uh, got my own place. Started my own shop. You know, started my own comic books and, and toys. I was selling my life. How, how are How are you doing now? Um, close to barely getting by. Um, and eventually I'm going to. Uh, after taxes, I'll be fine. Okay. So yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Uh, what is there anything you can tell people? I mean, going to twenty twenty four to protect themselves or anything? Any advice you have for? Uh, Pretty much keep your circle close and communicate, and uh, not to be a super. Uh, uh, um, my brain is not working right because it's, it's all so good. Late. I'm drinking. It's all good. But not be a super prepper, but just have the 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 necessary means for like. Uh, at least a month, maybe a month and a half to to right. live off of, because um, shit happens in life. Hell, fucking my my battery died in my truck 
just today and and i have a cert i have a um a uh anyways i jump started it because i have a kit you know only took like five minutes uh that's simple shit um so uh, that's my advice is, is is just to have food and prep for six weeks and keep it All constant. Right. Don't let it run dry. Keep it constant. Yeah. You know? A good advice. I mean, absolutely. Six weeks is good. Water, food. I, yep. I'm right there with you. Well, listen, man. Uh, to finish off, uh, I would ask you, Wolverine is going to be in uh, Deadpool 3. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, not to change it up. I just want to bring it back home. Bro, I hope he kills the I hope he kills the Marvel universe and just annihilates them. <laughs> it just I mean, I, I think hope- it's pretty dope to be honest that we're getting like the yellow suited Wolverine. I mean, I I'm a big Deadpool Finally. fan. I mean, it's dope as hell. I mean, I saw like the hints when we, I mean, the the deleted um, uh, scene from the 2013 movie. I was like, why did they delete that? I was like, dude, it's like, why did you keep that from us? It's like you should have had him uniformed up, like from the get go, man. I know, right, dude? So, so let me ask you this. Yeah. Are you excited about Deadpool three? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, bro. That's all I want at the end of the day. <laughs> I wanted to bring it home. I want to make it exciting. I, I, it's, good. it's the one Marvel movie that isn't really. It's a. It's a Fox movie. Marvel, mm-hmm. uh, oh, Disney. Where's Patton on 4K? Where's the five Planet of the Apes movies? They got Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. They haven't done fuck all. They've only done Cameron stuff. I'm like, where? What? Where's 20th Century Fox? Well, apparently. <laughs> Uh, they're all about Wolverine. They're all about Deadpool. Deadpool three. I I think that I think we're gonna get some cool shit. I do. Yeah. I can't wait. I can't freaking wait. It's gonna be awesome. Dude, Cyan, you and I park our shuttle crafts in the same shuttle bay. I yeah. goddamn. Hey, hey, we gotta talk about that movie when it comes out. Well, we will. Let, let's uh, let me just because I have to end this this stream because it's yeah. been going on for a long time. Uh, a long time. So let me ask you this, Wolverine. Can I let you go? Absolutely. All right. I want to thank you for being here. It was great to meet you. Thank you so yeah. much. No, I, I thank you so much because I've been watching you for a while, man. This is such an honor. I appreciate it. Oh, my God. Well, thank you. Uh, listen, it was a, it was a, it, you know what? It was my honor. I'm not going to be, I'm, you know what? I'm not going to say thank you for your service. I hate people that say that shit. I hate that. We don't like it either. So, yeah. I'm straight up with that. I'm just gonna say that uh, I I work with special operations. Uh, I've been doing a medical lecture series with a special forces group uh, for the last six years. Cool man. And uh, yes, and let me just say that our the operators that we have working in America are the greatest in the world. Yep, and I want to thank are. you for uh, your talents and uh, everything you've done. So, hoorah! A hoorah! Uh, I, I don't know. I, that's Marines, right? I, I don't know. Marines, but it, well, it's, it's, everybody says it's, Marines, but Navy actually says it too. It's okay, Army. good. I want to just thank you for. Hoorah is uh, Army and Hoorah is uh, Navy and Marines. Well, cheers to that. I want to have you back here soon and we will talk again. Oh, yeah. Booyah. <laughs> So, gentlemen, I mean, now, uh, I, th- what, what, what? This is a uh, a crazy show. Um, I'm like, uh, I, I, this was, this was not what I expected when we started tonight. <laughs> Just so you know, I, that's I don't what this know. Is all about right. That's the best part. That's uh, the best I, part. what I did. I did say randos. I honestly did. So, you know, before I get rid of all of you, I, I look. I could press the button. I can be like you're all gone, like just. Oh wait, hang on. No, no. I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Hang on. Oh wait, I haven't done anything yet. I don't have to press that button. So here's the thing. I'm just gonna leave that question mark up there because that could be you. So okay. I would ask all of you. Let's let's start with Bix. Bix, uh, the floor is yours. 
and I appreciate everyone's you still hear patience. Me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Twenty twenty four. I mean, it, it, where where you, you're at? We can hear you now. Let me ask you this: you you are going to be in the new year in uh, what? Well, ten hours, twenty hours. What? Might have lost him. I don't hear him. Well, it's ten thirty a.m. where I'm at. Oh, it's only ten thirty a.m. So you got the whole day. So what are you going to do? How are you going to celebrate New Year's Eve on the on uh, at Mount Vesuvius? How do you do that? Well, there's going to be a fireworks display that I can see where I'm at, and uh, there's going to be uh, the streets. But uh, I'm not big into the nightlife anymore, you know. A little old for that, I think. So I'm going to hang out till midnight, and I'm going to make a round of video chats to my family back in the states. Mm, that's pretty much it. <laughs> All right, I love that. Low key, you don't have to make it a big deal, but I love that you, sir, are going to be having a New Year's Eve on the slopes of Mount Vesuvius. That's pretty great. Okay, so now let's go back to old man in Hawaii. Hawaii. So you're you're ahead of us. Where are you at now? Wh wh what hour are you at? It's eleven thirty-five. So I got twenty-four and a half hours. So, so it's eleven thirty-five uh, 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 p.m. It's still on. It's still Saturday here. Still Saturday. So what are you gonna do, bro? What are you gonna do? I'm gonna do what I normally do, which is basically hang out with mom and make sure that the neighbors and their illegal fireworks don't burn the house down. And then watch movies and stuff, and just hang out. What are you, what are you gonna watch? Uh, I don't know. I've uh, I've got a bunch of st I got a list of stuff I have to watch. What was on my list? I can't remember. So can can I ask you where are you in Hawaii? Uh, I'm on Oahu. I'm in Wahiwa, which is like halfway between the North Shore and Pearl Harbor. You know where Schofield Barracks? And oh, I, I, I'm, I, I love Oahu. I, I've been okay. there. I'm right smack there in the middle. I'm the little town you go through when you head to the North Shore. Yeah, yeah, where the Halle bras are. Yeah. I know. No, yeah. I learned how to surf on the North Shore. I didn't do well as. Then you, you, well, that you do better than me. I don't surf. I, I stand up paddleboard, but yeah, I haven't. Yeah, dude. No, no. Well, well, well. Ele do you know Electric Beach? Yes. Yeah, I, I, that's where I learned that's to scuba how, that's, dive. That's why I side. That's why I side by the uh, yeah. the, the power plant, which is yeah, the, yes, the power plant yeah. with the. So that's for those of you don't know, Electric Beach is a beach where you can go learn to scuba dive. They then they like fifty yards out. Uh, they have a, 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 a they they put hot water coming from the power yeah, hot plant. Hot water from the uh, power plant, which is closed down now, but the beach is still there. Oh, really? So they're the the well, they the close the power plant down because they don't oh, need it. So. That sucks. Which is good. That's good. Oh. Is no, it good? good. <laughs> okay, that's good. All yeah, right, look at right. you know, oil fired. You know. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. by the way, this is twenty five years ago. So what do I know? So so I would ask uh, Cyan. What's New Year's Eve going to do for you? Where, where are you at? What's going on? Yeah, nothing crazy. Probably just going to have a couple of drinks with the friends, watch a movie. Nothing crazy. I got work Monday, so nothing crazy. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to be on John Campy's show Monday. He's like, oh, can we do a show Monday? I'm like, really, dude? Come on. Hey, if that's the case, I'm watching. There you go. Well, there you go. So let me ask you this. I mean, you're going to hang out, but whatever. It's good. It's good. Yeah, but yeah. What, it, it, what movie are you going to watch? Um, off top, maybe Oppenheimer again. I'll tell you this. You'll be happy to hear this. I, this is the first hard copy movie I've bought in, like, my adult life ever. I recently... God what, when that came you, out, sir. When that came out, I was like, yeah, I need to get the hard copy for this. And I fucking love it, too. It's fucking badass. Dude. It's such it, a great movie. Oh, my God. It's so, for, it's so badass. I mean, I've watched that disc. It's such a good movie. So good. And the disc streamy, is it? amazing. So I don't know if it's streaming, but don't yeah. fuck well, it. I could I probably just run out the Best Buy tomorrow. That's not, I haven't seen that yet. Still. Oh my God! Get uh, the 4K. Well, you have to have the. Yeah, get the 4K. Look, you. Like, the but but when I say good. that, you would need to. F the, 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 here's the problem with people. I, I always tell them, I'm like, <laughs> to enjoy physical media the way you want, you have to spend a lot of money. You have to have a 4K TV. You have to have a 4K player. Yeah. 
You have to have an amplifier. You have yep. to have Dolby. I mean, in my mind, to minimum, you have to have Dolby 7.1, which means you you have to have a subwoofer. You you have to have 5.1, and you have to have. Uh, so it, it, I mean, it's a big deal. And yeah, and well, I'm it, right there it, with you. yeah, it's like a twenty thousand dollar proposition to be to do it right. It really is. Do it right. And I, I feel bad that I like I don't want to espouse that. Look, I, I it bothers me. It bothers me like well, to be cool, you have to spend twenty thousand dollars on physical media. That's not that's not that that's not the truth. I mean, I'm like. I won't harp on this for too long, but let me say this. Please. Something that you, I think you can maybe learn to appreciate in this sense. It, maybe if you're feeling guilty for saying that you feel like you can only appreciate these movies with $20,000. I do. I do year. feature that. <laughs> so let me just say this. Something you should just at least appreciate. Maybe, and you probably already do. But the cool thing is like nowadays there's just way more alleyways into being able to get into movies. Like the fact of the matter is. God bless you, sir. Point, the fact of the matter is, and you've probably seen these channels, some of these people on Instagram, they're like the most popular Instagram movie reviewers, they just record videos of them watching movies on their laptop, and you even see the keyboard right there, and you're Bruh. like, okay, I mean, the movie definitely wasn't made to, like, there's even that meme going around of, I saw a meme today of someone watching Oppenheimer on a PSP, and they were like, just how Christopher <laughs> Nolan intended, and I'm like, I mean, it's obviously a joke, but the fact is, even if you don't have all that gear, some people, Rob, and I, I, I hate to say this, some people just don't appreciate that shit. Like no, but, like but, but right now, a lot of my friends don't care about that. The no, I, I, and, 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 and they're getting into it. And we well, can at least love that. We can at least love it for that, right? Well, here's the thing. You're, you, you, you've brought up a great point. I mean, and I, I would never say, and, and, uh, you know, it's funny when you say this. I have to stop and think and be like, okay, but, <laughs> but no, 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 no. But here's, what's really important. Um, the experience of cinema, um, is, in, I, I think, uh, it's not just the images you see here. Here's what I, I've, um, been very upset about the, is that it, it, it is that cinema, the experience of cinema is sitting in a, 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 a room that's entirely black and you're sitting in a giant box where, where the people that made the movies are spending a lot of time creating a sound field for you to have an experience. And what I, what I disagree with is, yeah, you can watch a movie on a phone. But what you're depriving yourself of is the experience of that, and, and the filmmakers have, have have tried, have tried, not tried. They've done. It. They're not trying. They already succeeded. They are making. They're giving you a sound field experience, a physical like like music and and sound effects penetrate your body. They make you feel something. And, mm -hmm. and and this is something that is designed, and they spend weeks doing this. Weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I mean, I mean, kid, by the way, it comes down to a lack of respect. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I hate to say this, but young people have no respect for anything. And, I agree with that. And, uh, and, yeah. and, well, and, and at the end of the day, they think that they know everything. They don't know... And here's the here's the real problem. They don't know fuck all. And and what's sad is that it's not a bad thing. It, it, everything is adversarial. It, it's like, look, the more you know, the cooler you are. And why is that not part of the world we live in? Like, um, uh, the more we figure out, the bet the, we're we're more awesome than we would be if we didn't know this. And I don't, I don't get why that's not the case. Like knowledge now today, it, it, people are like, yeah, I don't want to know that. That fuck that. Uh, like, 
Okay, you guys can't even change a fucking tire. Mm-hmm. Like, like, give me a break. And I, and and for me, I look around. I'm like, um, uh, you guys are fucking moronic. And if the apocalypse happens, happens, what's great is when the bombs fall and the apocalypse happens, I can just bust a cap into everyone and kill everybody and just live in my own enclave. I'm kidding, of course. But it's like, Jesus Christ, guys, can you can you can you expend just a little uh, information trying to figure out like why not learn, learn something, learn anything. Learn one one drop of, of knowledge that would let you live in a post-apocalyptic civilization. Civilization, can we just not make something great? Like, can't we? I cannot emphasize that I, more than I agree with you in that sense. What I was saying, what I was saying, I guess I was just trying to talk about people in my age group because I think it's just a fact of the matter. Like, I, I agree with you. I do think we need to cherish the experience of like trying to go to these movies the way that the directors and the people that made these movies want you to go and see it. You know what the problem is? A lot of people don't even realize what the credits really are. Like a lot of people, even though we see credits in every single movie, I think a lot of people would still be shocked. A lot of people in my age group would be shocked at how many people are involved in making a movie. Like you said before I even joined the stream, everyone thinks they can make a movie but it's really hard to make a movie. Yes, I it totally is. I totally agree with you, and I couldn't agree with you more. Like, my generation, I don't think, really appreciates, and I see this with my friends, like, <clears> appreciates <throat> the experience of going to the movies. It's like, oh, it's going to be on streaming? It, it doesn't help the fact that these people that make the movies, or not make them, I should say, the people that budget their, uh, fund these movies are making it much easier to watch them at home, even if these people don't have the technology I, to emulate the experience. You know what I mean? I like, agree. That, no. Not, one thing I'll say, though, real quick, too, is I, one positive side. For someone like me, I had never heard about something like IMAX 70 millimeter until this year. And at least we are heading in that direction where people like Christopher Nolan are still pushing. Right. That. Like, hey, physical media and IMAX 70 millimeter. He, he was pushing, hey, you should see this movie in IMAX 70 millimeter. I, I, I don't know the numbers, but I'm willing to bet it was probably the most money made on an IMAX yeah, 70 it, millimeter it was. Movie in a while. What? I didn't have I see because I but, feel like it's because that director was pushing for that. And but let me really let me ask you l- let me ask you this. I mean, mm-hmm. by the way, you you are an inspiration to me because I, be, dude, I would no, love to talk to you more about this stuff. Really? Because, well, well, because you're a seeker, you're looking out. You're 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 looking out to find greatness. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I I would ask you. Um, do you feel that the experience of of going to IMAX and all that, do you feel that changes the experience of just watching something on uh, TV? Hell yes. Wait, I think I heard the question. You're saying, does the experience of seeing an IMAX? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, going to. A, Did I hear that correct? Yeah, and that's exactly yeah. right. And 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 by 100%. the way, there's no wrong answer. I I just. You well, seem to be yes. I I do think the answer no would be wrong. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, no way the same experience at home is the same as a movie theater. But continue, unless you have like a home theater. But continue. No, man. But but uh, but what what I've loved talking to you tonight. What's what I love the most is that mm-hmm. you are a newly minted geek. Mm-hmm. You know very much. And and. It doesn't feel like it, but I am. In the grand scheme, I am. You're right. Yeah, but here's the thing. That's the best. You're the best geek. Because Thank you. you came to it as somebody new. You 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 You're honest. You saw something you I loved. Am. And how great is that? I'm envious because you get to experience all this new all this stuff for the first time. Yeah, it is right, amazing. right. Is, Rob, like, I, I hear the streams. I, I know, I, I get the vibe of like how sometimes the future does not seem bright. I mean, obviously, I see the title is is the fall of comic book film inevitable. But the thing is, for someone like me, and the way I my mind works is, I can't hope for anything other than just hoping that we get to a time where we appreciate things like that more. We appreciate creators and authors more because. Fact of the matter is, like, yeah, you're right. Right now, we don't. People will just say, oh, "Fuck it, I'll watch it on my iPhone or something like that." You know, it's not. It's 
you're right. We don't appreciate the art nearly as much. Uh, he, like you say, human authenticity is going to be like a currency or something soon. Well, to hear you, you to, but 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 to, no, lines. but to hear you say what you want, man, is it makes me it, it really happy to hear it. Yeah, man. I, I just I hope we're headed in the right direction. I mean, obviously, things like AI are scary and shit, but. I mean, fuck. I just can't. I, all I can do is hope for more great things like what I like. You know, it's all I can do is just hope for it. I don't. I don't well, like talk like. But here's the thing I gotta say is nowadays on YouTube and all that. I will say the past year or so has been so much negativity. Like I, I know Marvel and everything has been bad. It has been. I get it. But I feel like that we don't talk enough about the good things too. You know. I'm a, look, look, dude. Rhythm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sounding corny. That's now. the algorithm with the, with most social media. The negatives is what drives. <gasps> click, exactly. Negative, you know, so, but things like don't, that don't let are it the root of why view. we don't appreciate movies and, yeah. and things like that. Appreciate yeah. watching movies the way they were intended. That's why we don't appreciate that there's credits and there was a million people worked on it and people would just say, "Oh, Aquaman's trash" without even seeing the movie. But there's a million people that are like, "The Marvels is trash." They haven't even seen the movie. Like they don't even realize that there's a credits of people that all had the best time of their life working on a Marvel movie for the first time, right? Yeah, I mean, 100%. And look, you're defining where we should go in the new year. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I, I thank you for that. Now, I'm going to end you. this stream because mm -hmm. I, I this stream, I, I thought it was going to be like two hours. It's like six hours or whatever. Okay. I want to thank all of you uh, for being here. I want to thank you for staying here here and uh this has been an amazing stream um it's really great now bef uh before i uh get off it i would just make sure i get everyone's uh super chats or uh, tw off. tweets i will sign off and let you finish all right well um uh hang Thank on, you for having us on seriously what were you gonna say uh well i i, I just love love to say uh um Duke Devil ninety five, you sent that hundred dollar tweet. Albert Vasquez says, "What did you guys think of Rebel, Rebel Moon?" Asking me that, what did I think of Rebel Moon? Yeah, what do you guys think? Okay, let's hear. It. So I'll talk about that real quick. Um, I actually got to see it in theaters at the Egyptian Theater in LA, and I got to see Zack Snyder talk before it too, which was really sick. I got to say, I, I am a Zack Snyder fan, so I wanted it to be really good. But I'll be honest, it did feel a little bit. Like just a lot of themes that I've already seen, but I'm not gonna lie. I didn't hate it as much as a lot of people were hating. I thought it was pretty fun. I thought it was fun. I like. I think his name's Jaiwan Hansu. I thought he would look badass yeah. in that one scene. Or you've seen it, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the the first scene you see him, I thought he looked badass. Like I like gritty movies like that. So honestly, I thought it was pretty cool. It was a fun time. Obviously, I wish it was better. And honestly, I agree with you too. Like it pisses me off how I'm getting so hyped for this movie and I keep hearing him talk about. The longer one coming out later, I'm like, well, what do you what do you want me to be hyped for? Rebel uh, yeah, I know it's it, well, it's a it's a very weird Zack thing. What is what is they like? What does Zack Snyder want me to be more pumped for? The second one or for the extended cut? Like things like that are kind of weird to me. You know, like to back to our point earlier of appreciating movies the way they're intended. I mean, shit. I kind of maybe I shouldn't even say this, but like the author themselves doesn't even want that. It seems like, right? Uh, that's a problem. It's a problem. Am I right, though? Am yeah, right? you're absolutely right. I mean, oh my god, but totally. I, saw, I went. So here's the crazy thing. I'm I'm in the minority on this. All my friends would think this is stupid, but I wanted to see Rebel Moon in theaters. Mm -hmm. Seeing it in the Egyptian theater was dope. That's a beautiful theater. I'm sure you've been there before, right? Yeah, oh, of course. And th that was they they've remodeled it after two yes. <laughs> two years. Uh, amazing. Dude, it was dope. Seeing it in theaters. Here's the thing. Seeing it in theaters made it way better. When I saw it on my <gasps> monitor. Oh, I'm with I, I'm with you 100. percent So yeah, I don't know. I guess it's kind of sad that like I can't even see it in theaters if I wanted to. You know, like I only got to see it that weekend and that was it. It was dope that Zack Snyder was there. He talked before the movie. I loved it. But yeah, I mean, overall it was a fun time. I mean, all right, you know, sign. Can I ask you? Time. Can I ask you a favor? Dude, of course you can. I have to give you three minutes. Okay, go Because I have to fucking piss like a goddamn racehorse. So you need me to hold this for three minutes? Is that yes. What yes, I okay, do. Dude, Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, don't say anything that will, like, demonetize me. 
Don't worry, man. But I, I, I would pose a question to you. The All question right, is I'll this. What makes a great comic book movie for you? Okay, I got you. Why do you love it? I got you. So, I feel like there. Here's the thing with comic book movies, it's kind of hard because you got your you got your traditional like Tobey Maguire grounded story. Hero has his powers and learns about his powers and doesn't want to deal with the consequences of it. Villain, you got your typical like that, and then you got your big scale movies that are happening more and more nowadays, right? Like Avengers and. Justice League and all these Suicide Squad, all these like kind of bigger scale two hundred million dollar movies. I don't think there's a correct formula of it has to be a small movie like the Spider Man movies or it has to be a big scale movie like Avengers. I feel like the main thing overall is just having a plan, having a good story in mind. Like like Rob always says, the what are, what are like the four best movies in the MCU? That were I guess the four best run: Winter Soldier, Civil War, Infinity War, Endgame. Those movies are dope because they, even though they didn't have a plan from the beginning, they found ways to make those connect and just good story overall. And I guess what I'm trying to say is you just have to have a plan, I feel like. And even if the plan doesn't go through, you have to have good ways to rebound from it. I didn't realize this until recently, but like Iron Man 1, there's a behind the scenes they did like a couple days ago, or not a couple days ago, it was like a, a few months ago when Iron Man had its 15 year anniversary. Now, there was that behind the scenes with John Favreau and Kevin Feige. I didn't realize how much they went through making that movie as good as it is until I saw that. Like, you would think that movie was super planned and they had everything kind of just planned perfectly for that. But it seemed like a lot of that was just last minute changes. And you wouldn't think that considering how fucking great the movie is. I even saw there's this. I think viral tweet going around where it's a, like a shot from Iron Man of just the helmet kind of going like the, like just a shot of the camera right in front of the Iron Man helmet. And a lot of people were quoting it saying how much better VFX were back then versus now. I, I have no explanation for why it's like that, but all you can do is just appreciate how, how hard people that made that movie worked on it. And the fact is they, they even though they had a plan for it, things happened and they adjusted and I guess there's no perfect formula for it, but having having some sort of plan and rebounds for that plan is definitely, I think, one of the most important things to make a good comic book movie, for sure. God damn, you're doing it well. Uh, thank you so much. Has it already been three minutes? Uh, that was about it, but you've done a fine yeah. job, sir. It's, it's uh, well okay. done. Well done. Oh, my God. So here's the thing. I I'm going back to my own shot now. Uh, it's almost two o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's Pacific time, and uh, I I I want to thank oh my God. I can't even begin to thank everybody that's been on the show. I don't even, to be honest, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't even know half the people that have been on this show. But um, I mean, let me just say thank you if you're not. Uh, this was this was so great having you here, and uh, it, it was an amazing, uh, amazing experience uh, to have you here. So thank you so much, and um, I I'm gonna let you go. L let me ask you this: like, what are you gonna do? Well, what do you want to do on the what what's gonna happen to you, uh, uh, for New Year's Eve? Well, so first off, let me just say my mic was on mute, so my bad. I was saying thank you for like having us on. It was awesome, and I hope this isn't the last time we have a conversation like this. Because hell no, really man, crazy. this is gonna be an ongoing thing. Twenty twenty four. Hell yeah. My whole thing about twenty twenty four is all about fans, all about hell yeah. people coming on. All good. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Well, anyways, um, yeah, I mean, for New Year's, dude, just trying to let, let's be the best version of ourselves, man. That's it. That's all. I, I love say. it. Yeah, that's it. Let's be respectful of everyone else too. I I can't say that's the greatest message ever. Thank you. Well, well, listen. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It was great to meet you. We're going to be streaming uh, all through 2024. Thank you okay. so much. I will I will let you go. It was great. This is amazing. Oh yeah, man. You have a good rest of your night, and hopefully talk again soon. All right. Yes, sir. Later, y'all. All right, man. Um, <laughs> I gotta say, I, you know, I, 
It's a very amazing thing to have this whole stream tonight. I mean, I know between the technical difficulties, people would say, well, Rob, you know, look. We are all imagination connoisseurs here. And I think that tonight is a great example of what America, I mean, America, America, could be going forward. I mean, if there's one thing I could say about, uh, if someone said, Rob, what do you want to see for the new year? What I would like to see is respect. Respect for each other. Respect for our fellow human beings. I'm tired of Karens. I'm tired of all the bullshit. I'm tired of people being angry with one another. That's not my experience with life. My experience with people is people are genuinely pretty great. And 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 if we reach out, like, look, yes, be ever vigilant because we live in a world where the monetization of taking advantage of people has never been. It's so frustrating. But I would dare say that one-on-one, -on -one, I, I believe in people. Call me naive. Call me what you want. But I do think that the, the strength we need to show in 2024 is, I mean, my God, if you're going to be an American citizen, all of your fellow Americans are worth are worth an effort. It doesn't matter what color, shape, size, creed, political affiliation, sexuality, it doesn't matter. What makes America great is that we love everybody. And by the way, I say that meaning uh, I don't expect you to make me demand that I, like, I believe in you as an American. Don't you dare tell me what to say or what to think. Okay? Don't. That's not that's not fair. That's not what Americans do. I will support you and and however I want, however you want to be supported, I will support you. But the moment you try and tell me what I have to say or think or do, fuck you. Because that is some bullshit, un-American, fascistic, fucked. Don't do it. Just saying, that's my, that's my, that's my, the end of this stream. We should be accepting of everyone. As long as they are accepting of us. Give to get. That's what we do. And on that note. Every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a great... <coughs> Sorry. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a great moderator. I want to thank everybody for generously supporting this channel via Super Chats and Tips. Thank you for becoming uh, members. <laughs> As everyone knows, we have bi-weekly member calls. There will be another one next Saturday. I want to thank all of you for just being here. And, and I hope, I hope, my joy for 2024 is we more than ever need cogent conversation. Even if you meet someone you fucking hate, we need to be able to speak with one another. We need to have communication. It's an election year. Please, everybody, go into this next year thinking, I hate this motherfucker. But, I'm willing to have a conversation. That's all I ask. You know, we don't have to be mean. We don't have to be angry. What we do have to do is listen. That's all I ask, man. Please, please just listen. 
It's going to be rough, I know. But anyway, thank you. Be back tomorrow, or actually later today in, uh, what? Nine hours? For Let's Get Physical Media! I know you're like, oh my god, I can't sing that. I can't even do it, but be with Dieter Bastian and I as we talk about the greatest physical media releases of the year. Oh my god, it's going to be great. And on that note, I say to all of you, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say, have a better day. And remember, I am the Duke of Dope Discourse. Oh my God.